Section 8 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola Translated by Henry Visitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder Section 8 The times were momentarily bad for speculation. Saccard was the worthy offspring of the Hôtel de Ville. Like Paris, he'd been eager for transformation, feverishly bent upon enjoyment and blindly lavish in expenditure. And at this moment, like the city itself, he found himself in the presence of a formidable deficit which it was necessary he should make good secretly, for he would not hear speak of sobriety, economy, calm and simple life. He preferred to retain the useless luxury and real misery of these new thoroughfares, whence he had derived that colossal fortune ushered each morning into being, but always swallowed up when evening came. Passing from adventure to adventure, he now only possessed the gilded facade of an absent capital. In that time of fierce madness, Paris herself did not engage her future with less self-restraint, or march more straightly towards every folly and every financial trickery. The liquidation threatened to be a terrible one. The finest speculations fell through in Saccard's hands. As he confessed, he had just experienced considerable losses on the bourse. M. Tutin Laroche had almost capsized the credit viticole by a bullying game which had suddenly turned against him. Fortunately, the government, intervening secretly, had reset the famous farmer's loan machine on its legs. Saccar, already badly shaken by this double blow, warmly rated by his brother the minister on account of a danger which had threatened the delegation bonds of the city of Paris, compromised at the same time at the Crédit Viticole, was yet even unluckier in his speculations in house property. Mignon and Charrier had altogether ceased dealing with him. If he accused them, it was because he was secretly enraged to think that he had blundered by building on his share of the land, whilst they prudently sold theirs. While they were netting a fortune, he remained hampered by his houses, which he was only able to dispose of at a loss. Among others, he sold a mansion in the Rue de Marignan, on which he still owed 380,000 francs, for three hundred thousand. He had certainly invented a dodge worthy of him, which consisted in demanding ten thousand francs for a flat worth eight thousand at the most. The frightened tenant only signed a lease when the landlord consented to make him a present of the first two years' rent. The apartment was thus brought down to its real value, but the lease enunciated the figure of ten thousand francs. And when Saccard found a purchaser and capitalized the income of the property, the valuation proved most fantastic. He could not apply the swindle on a large scale, as his houses did not let. Indeed, he had built them too soon. The clearings amid which they were so to say lost, in the mud and the winter cold, isolated them and lowered their value considerably. The affair which affected Saccard the most was the vulgar swindle of Monsieur Mignon and Charrier, who brought back from him the mansion which he'd been compelled to give up building on the boulevard Malzerbe. The contractors were at last smitten with the desire of residing on their boulevard. As they had sold their share of the building plots at a profit, and scented the embarrassed circumstances of their ex-partner, they offered to rid him of the enclosure in the center of which the mansion rose to the flooring of the first story, where the iron girders were partly placed. Only they talked of the solid foundations and cut stone as useless rubbish, saying that they would have preferred the soil to be bare so as to build upon it according to their taste. Saccard had to sell without taking the hundred and odd thousand francs which he'd already expended into account. And what exasperated him the more was that the contractors would never agree to take the ground back at the rate of 250 francs the meter, at which figure it had been valued when the plots were shared. They knocked off 25 francs per meter, like those second-hand dealers who will only give 4 francs for an object which they sold for 5 the day before. 
48 hours later, Sakart had the grief of seeing an army of masons invade the enclosure and continue building upon the so-called useless rubbish. He thus played the impecunious all the better before his wife, as his affairs were becoming more and more muddled. He was not the man to confess himself for the simple love of truth. But if you find yourself embarrassed, said René, with an air of doubt, why did you buy me that aigrette and necklace which cost you, I believe, sixty-five thousand francs? I've no use for those jewels, and I shall be obliged to ask your permission to dispose of them, so as to give worms something on account. Never do that, he exclaimed nervously. If you were not seen wearing those jewels at the ball at the ministry, tomorrow people would gossip about my position. He was good-natured that morning, so he ended by smiling and muttering with a wink. We speculators, my dear, are like pretty women. We have our little trickeries. Pray keep your regret in your necklace, for love of me. He could not tell the story, for although a very amusing one, it was in somewhat questionable taste. Saccard and Lord Dorigny had entered into an alliance one night after supper. Laura was head over heels in debt and was trying to find some nice young man who would kindly elope with her and take her to London. Saccard on his side felt the ground giving way beneath him. His failing imagination sought for an expedient which would show him to the public wallowing on a bed of gold and banknotes. The harlot and the speculator came to an understanding amid the semi-intoxication of dessert. He hit upon the idea of that sale of diamonds which attracted all Paris, and where amid a great fuss he purchased some jewels for his wife. Then, with the product of the sale, some four hundred thousand francs, he succeeded in satisfying Laura's creditors, who were owed about twice that amount. It may even be believed that he recouped a part of his sixty-five thousand francs. When he was seen liquidating Badorini's affairs, he was supposed to be her protector. People thought that he had paid her debts in full and that he was doing all sorts of foolish things for her. Every hand was stretched out to him, and his credit returned formidable. At the bourse he was joked about his passion with smiles and allusions which delighted him. Meanwhile, Laure d'Origny, brought into notoriety by all this fuss, and with whom he did not even spend a single night, pretended she was deceiving him with eight or ten fools, allured by the idea of stealing her from a man of such colossal wealth. In one month she obtained two sets of furniture and more diamonds than she had sold. Sakar had fallen into the habit of going to smoke a cigar at her place of an afternoon on leaving the bourse and he often perceived coat-tails flying off in terror through the doorways. When he and Laura were alone, they could not look at each other without laughing. He kissed her on the forehead as if she were a perverse girl whose knavery delighted him. He did not give her a copper. On the contrary, she once lent him some money to pay a gambling debt. Renée wished to insist and spoke of at least pawning the jewels, but her husband made her understand that it was not possible, that all Paris expected to see her wearing them on the morrow. Thereupon, the young woman who was greatly worried about Worm's bill tried to devise another expedient. But my Sharon affair, she suddenly exclaimed, it is progressing well, isn't it? You told me only the other day, but the profits would be superb. Perhaps Larsonneau would advance me the hundred and thirty-six thousand francs? For a minute, Saccard had forgotten the tongs between his legs. He now hastily took hold of them again, leant forward and almost disappeared into the fireplace, whence the young woman heard his voice huskily muttering, Yes, yes, Arsenal might, perhaps. She was at last coming of her own accord to the point to which he had gently tried to lead her since the outset of the conversation. For two years already he'd been preparing his masterly stroke in the direction of Charon. His wife had never consented to part with Aunt Elizabeth's property. She'd sworn to the latter that she would keep it intact to bequeath it to her children, should she become a mother. In presence of this obstinacy, 
the speculator's imagination had set to work and had ended by constructing something poetical, a design of exquisite knavery, a colossal piece of trickery by which the city of Paris, the state, his wife, and even L'Arsenault would be victimized. He no longer talked about selling the ground, only he every day deplored the folly of leaving it unproductive, of contenting oneself with an income of 2%. René, always pressed for money, had ended by entertaining the idea of a speculation. Saccard based his operation on the certainty of an approaching expropriation for the cutting of the Boulevard du Prince Eugène, the line of which was not yet clearly decided upon. And then it was that he brought forward his old accomplice Larsonneau as a partner who made an agreement with his wife on the following basis. She, on her side, brought the ground representing a value of 500,000 francs, and L'Arsenault, on his side, undertook to expend a similar sum in building upon this ground a popular music hall with a large garden where games of all kind, swings, skittles, and bowls, should be installed. The profits were naturally to be divided, just as the losses were to be equally shared. In the event of one of the partners wishing to retire, he might do so by claiming his share, according to the valuation which would be made. René seemed surprised by this high figure of 500,000 francs, when the ground was worth 300,000 at the most. But Saccard made her understand that it was a skillful plan for tying Larsenault's hands later on, for his buildings would never represent such an amount. L'Arsenault had become an elegant man about town, well-gloved with dazzling linen and astounding neckties. To go about he had a tilbury as light as a piece of clockwork, with a very high seat in which he drove himself. His offices in the Rue de Rivoli were a set of sumptuous rooms in which one never saw the least portfolio or business paper lying about. His clerks rode on tables of black and pear wood adorned with marquetry and ornaments of chased brass. He had assumed the style and title of an expropriation agent, a new calling which the works of Paris had brought into being. By his connection with the Hôtel de Ville, he was informed in advance of the cutting of any new thoroughfares. When he had induced a road inspector to show him the proposed line of route of a new boulevard, he went to offer his services to the threatened householders. And he brought forward his little plan for increasing the indemnity by acting before the decree of public utility was issued. As soon as a householder accepted his proposals, he took all the expense on himself, drew a plan of the property, brought the affair before the courts, and paid an advocate, the whole for a percentage on the difference between the offer made by the city and the indemnity awarded by the jury. To this calling, which after all might be avowed, he annexed several others. He especially practiced usury. He was not the usurer of the old school, ragged and dirty, with white expressionless eyes like five franc pieces and pale lips tightly drawn together like the strings of a purse. He smiled, gave charming glances, had himself dressed by desartois, and went to lunch at Brébant's with his victim, whom he called my dear fellow. At bottom, despite his waistcoats tightly buckled round his waist, Larsenault was a terrible fellow who, without losing aught of his amiability, would have prosecuted a debtor for payment of a bill until the unfortunate man was reduced to commit suicide. Saccard would willingly have chosen another partner. But he still entertained anxiety respecting the false inventory which Larsonneau previously preserved. So he preferred to interest him in the affair, hoping that he'd be able to profit by some circumstance to regain possession of this compromising document. Larsonneau built the music hall, an edifice in planks and plaster, surmounted by little tin belfries which he painted red and yellow. The garden and the games proved successful in the populous district of Charon. At the end of a couple of years, the speculation seemed a prosperous one, although the profits were in reality very small. 
So far, Sakar had always spoken enthusiastically to his wife concerning the prospects of such a fine idea. On seeing that her husband did not make up his mind to come out of the fireplace, where his voice was becoming more and more indistinct, Rene exclaimed, I shall go to see L'Arsenault today. It is my only resource. Thereupon he abandoned the log with which he was struggling. The errand's done, my dear, he said, smiling. Don't I forestall all your desires? I saw Larsano last night. And he promised you the hundred and thirty-six thousand francs, she asked anxiously. Between the two flaming logs he was building a mountain of live cinders, delicately taking up the smallest fragments with the tongs, and looking with a satisfied air at the elevation which he raised with infinite art. Oh, how fast you go, he muttered. A hundred and thirty-six thousand francs make a large sum. Larsenault is a good fellow, but his means are still limited. He's quite ready to oblige you. He paused, blinking his eyes and rebuilding a corner of the elevation which had fallen through. The pastime began to confuse the young woman's ideas. Despite herself, she watched the work of her husband, whose clumsiness increased. She felt inclined to give him advice. Forgetting worms, the bill, and her need of money, she ended by exclaiming, But place that large bit, there, underneath, the others will then keep up. Her husband submissively obeyed her and added, He can only find fifty thousand francs. It will always make a nice installment, only he won't mix this affair up with the Sharon one. He is but an intermediary, do you understand, my dear? The person who really lends the money demands enormous interest. He wants a note of hand for 80,000 francs at six months' date. And having crowned the height with a pointed cinder, he crossed his hands over the tongs and looked fixedly at his wife. 80,000 francs, she cried. But that's robbery. Do you advise me to do anything so foolish? No he answered plainly, but if you are in absolute need of money, I won't forbid it. He rose up as if he meant to leave the room. Rene, in a state of cruel indecision, looked at her husband and at the bill which he laid upon the mantel shelf. She ended by taking her poor head in her hands and murmuring, Oh, these business matters, my head is splitting this morning. Well, I shall sign this bill for 80,000 francs. If I didn't, I should become altogether ill. I know myself I should spend the day in frightful tortures. I prefer to be foolish at once. It will relieve me. And she spoke of ringing to have a bill stamp fetched. But he insisted upon rendering her this service in person. No doubt he had the bill stamp in his pocket for his absence scarcely lasted a couple of minutes. While she was writing at a little table, which he had drawn to the fireside, he examined her, and an astonished feeling of desire lighted up his eyes. It was very warm in the room, which was still full of the young woman's rising in the scent of her first toilet. Whilst speaking, she had let the folds of a dressing gown in which she had swathed herself fall down, and the eyes of her husband who stood in front of her glided over her bent head from amid the gold of her hair far down to the whiteness of her neck and bosom. He smiled with a singular air, this ardent fire which had burnt his face, this closed room, the heavy atmosphere of which was impregnated with a scent of love, this yellow hair and this white skin which tempted him with a kind of conjugal disdain, made him dreamy, enlarged the scope of a drama in which he had just played a scene and prompted some secret voluptuous design in his brutal jobber's flesh. When his wife held him out the bill, begging him to finish the affair for her, he took it still looking at her. "'You are bewitchingly beautiful,' he murmured. And as she leant forward to push the table aside, he roughly kissed her on the neck. She gave a little cry. Then she rose up, quivering, trying to laugh, thinking, despite of herself, of the other's kisses the night before. But he regretted having given her this cabman's kiss, 
and on leaving he simply pressed her hand in a friendly manner and promised her that she should have the fifty thousand francs that same evening. Renée dozed all day in front of the fire. At hours of crisis she experienced a creole-like languor. All her turbulent nature became lazy, chilly, benumbed. She shivered. She needed blazing fires, a suffocating heat, which brought little drops of perspiration to her forehead and tranquilized her. In this burning atmosphere, in this bath of flames, she scarcely suffered. Her pain became like a light dream, a vague oppression, the very ambiguity of which ended by becoming voluptuous. It was thus that, until the evening, she lulled her remorse of the night before, in the red glow of the hearth opposite a terrible fire, which made the furniture around her crack, and at moments deprived her of the consciousness of being. She was able to dream of Maxime as of an inflamed enjoyment, the rays of which burnt her. She had a nightmare of strange amours amid flaring logs, on beds heated white-hot. Celeste went to and fro about the room with the calm face of a servant with icy blood. She had orders not to admit anyone, and she even kept the door shut to those inseparables, Adeline Despanet and Suzanne Hafner, when they called on returning from lunching together at a villa which they had rented at Saint-Germain. However, towards the evening, when Celeste came to inform her mistress that her master's sister, Madame Sidonie, wished to see her, she received orders to show her in. As a rule, Madame Sidonie only called at dusk, and yet her brother had prevailed upon her to wear silk dresses. But no one knew how it happened, although the silk she wore came fresh from the shop. It never looked new. It was shabby, destitute of sheen, and seemed to be in tatters. She had also consented not to bring her basket to Sekar's house, but by way of compensation her pocket always overflowed with papers. She was interested in René, whom she was unable to transform into a reasonable customer, resigned to the necessities of life. She visited her regularly, wearing the discreet smile of a doctor who does not like to frighten his patient by telling her the name of her disease. She commiserated her little worries as if they'd been petty ailments which she could cure immediately if the young woman only chose. The latter, who was in one of those moments when one feels the need of being pitied, simply received her to tell her that she had intolerable pains in her head. "'Why, my beauty,' muttered Madame Sidonie as she glided through the shade of the room. "'Why, you are stifling here. Still your neuralgic pains, eh? It's worry. You take life too much to heart.' "'Yes, I have a great deal of worry,' replied René. Night was coming on. She had not allowed Celeste to light the lamp. The fire alone shed a grand red glow which fully illuminated her as she reclined in her white dressing gown, the lace of which had a pinkish tinge. At the edge of a shade one could just see an end of Madame Sironie's black dress and her two crossed hands encased in grey cotton gloves. Her soft voice emerged out of a darkness. "'Still worry about money,' she said." in a tone full of gentleness and pity, just as if she had spoken of the worries of the heart. Renée lowered her eyelids and made a gesture of avowal. "'Ah, if my brothers listen to me,' said Madame Sidonie, "'we should all be rich. "'But they shrug their shoulders whenever I speak to them "'about that debt of three milliards, you know. "'Still I have good hopes.' For the last ten years I've been wanting to make a journey to England, but I have so little time for myself. Anyhow, I recently made up my mind to write to London, and I'm waiting for the answer. And as the young woman smiled, I know you are incredulous as well. Still, you would be very pleased if I made you a present of a pretty million one of these days. Oh, the story is simple enough. It was a Paris banker who lent the money to the son of the King of England, and as the banker died without leaving any direct heirs, 
the state can nowadays claim the reimbursement of the debt with compound interest. I have calculated it. It amounts to two milliards nine hundred and forty three millions two hundred and ten thousand francs. It will come. It will come. Never fear. In the meantime, said the young woman, with a dash of irony, you ought to obtain me a hundred thousand francs. I could then pay my tailor, who's greatly worrying me. A hundred thousand francs can be found, replied Madame Sidonie quietly. It's only a question of paying for them. The fire was glowing. Renée, feeling more and more languid, stretched out her legs and showed the tips of her slippers at the edge of her dressing gown, while the woman of business resumed in her commiserating voice, "'Poor dear, you are really not reasonable. I know a great many women, but I've never seen a single one so careless about her health as you are. For instance, that little Michelin. There's one who knows how to manage. In spite of myself, I think of you when I see her so happy and well.' Do you know that Monsieur de Saffre is madly in love with her, and that he's already given her presents worth nearly ten thousand francs? I believe that her dream is to have a country house. Madame Sidonie was growing more animated, and fumbled in her pocket. I still have about me a letter from a poor young woman. If we had a light, I would let you read it. Just fancy, her husband doesn't provide for her. She had accepted some bills, and she has been obliged to borrow from a gentleman I know. It was I who rescued the promissory notes from the lawyer's clutches, and it wasn't an easy matter. The poor children, do you know they are wrong? I received them at my place as if they were my son and daughter. You know a money lender? asked Rene negligently. I know ten. Between women, one can say a number of things, can't one? And it isn't because your husband is my brother that I excuse his conduct in running after strumpets and leaving a beautiful woman like you to mope at the fireside. That Lord d'Origny costs him a fortune. It wouldn't astonish me if he had refused you money. He has refused you, hasn't he? Oh, the wretch! René listened complacently to this voice which emerged out of a shade, like the vague echo of her own dreams. With her eyelids half lowered, almost recumbent in her armchair, she no longer realized that Madame Sironi was there. She fancied she dreamt that evil thoughts had come to her and tempted her with infinite gentleness. Meanwhile, the other spoke on at length, and her voice was like a monotonous flow of lukewarm water. It was Madame de Laurence who spoilt your life, she said. You wouldn't believe me. Oh, you wouldn't be reduced to cry by your fireside if you hadn't mistrusted me. And I love you like my eyes, my beauty. You have a bewitching foot. You will no doubt laugh at me, but I must tell you my folly. When I haven't seen you for three days, I am absolutely impelled to come and admire you. Yes, I lack something. I feel the need of feasting my eyes on your beautiful hair, your face which is so white and delicate, and your slim waist. Really, I've never seen anyone else with such a figure. Renée ended by smiling. Her lovers themselves had not shown such warmth, such pious ecstasy in speaking to her of her beauty. Madame Sidonie observed her smile. Come, it's agreed, she said, rising hastily. I run on and on and forget that I make your head split. You will come tomorrow, won't you? We will talk over money matters. We will find a lender. You hear me? I'm determined that you shall be happy. The young woman, still motionless and enervated by the heat, answered after a pause, as if she had had to make a laborious effort to understand what was being said around her. Yes, yes, it's agreed, and we will have a chat, but not tomorrow. Worms will be satisfied with something on account. When he worries me again, we will see. 
Don't talk to me about all that now. Business has made my head split. Madame Sidonie seemed greatly vexed. She was on the point of sitting down again and resuming her coaxing monologue. But Renée's weary attitude decided her to defer the attack till another occasion. She drew a handful of papers out of her pocket, searched among them, and ended by finding an object enclosed in a kind of pink box. "'I came to recommend you a new soap,' she said, resuming her business voice. "'I take a great interest in the inventor, who's a charming young man. "'It is a very soft soap, very good for the skin. "'You will try it, won't you? "'And you will speak of it to your friends. "'I'll leave it there on your mantel-shelf.' She had gone to the door when she returned again, and standing upright amid the rosy glow of the fire which lighted up her waxen face, she began to praise an elastic belt, an invention intended to take the place of stays. "'It gives you a perfectly round waist, a true wasp's waist,' she said. "'I saved it from bankruptcy. When you come, you'll try the specimens, won't you? I had to run about among solicitors during a whole week.' The documents are in my pocket, and I'm now going to my lawyer to have the last attachment raised. Goodbye for the present, pretty one. Remember that I'm waiting for you, and that I want to dry your beautiful eyes. She glided away and disappeared. Renée did not even hear her close the door. She remained there before the dying fire, continuing her dream of the whole day, with her head full of dancing ciphers, while in the distance she heard the voices of Saccard and Madame Sidonie, who offered her considerable sums in the tone with which an auctioneer invites bids for a lot of furniture. She felt her husband's rough kiss on her neck, and when she turned round she fancied the other was there at her feet, with her black dress and her flabby face, making passionate speeches to her, praising her perfections, and begging for an appointment with the attitude of a lover past resignation. This made her smile. The heat became more and more stifling in the room. And the young woman's torpor, the strange dreams she made, were but a light and artificial sleep, amid which she always beheld the little private room on the boulevard, and the broad divan against which she'd fallen on her knees. She no longer suffered at all. When she raised her eyelids again, Maxime's image passed through the rosy mass of fire. At the minister's ball on the morrow, beautiful Madame Saccard looked marvelous. Worms had accepted the 50,000 francs on account, and she emerged from this pecuniary worry with the laughter of convalescence. When she crossed the reception rooms in her robe of pink file, with a long Louis XIV train, edged with deep white lace, there was a murmur, and the men shoved one another aside to see her. Her intimate friends bent low with a discreet, knowing smile, rending homage to those beautiful shoulders with which all official Paris was so well acquainted, and which were, indeed, the firm columns of the empire. She bared her bosom with such a contempt for other people's looks, she walked by so tender and so gentle in her nudity, that it was almost not indecent. Eugène Rougon, the great politician, who felt that his sister-in-law's bare bosom was even more eloquent than his speeches in the chamber, softer and more persuasive in making people appreciate the charms of the rain and converting skeptics, went to compliment her on her happy audacity in lowering her dress body a couple of finger breaths. Almost all the corps legislatif was there, and by the way that the deputies looked at the young woman, the minister made up his mind that he should have a fine success on the morrow in the delicate question of the loans of the city of Paris. People could not vote against the power which, on the hotbed of millions, reared such a flower as this Renée, so strange a flower of voluptuousness, will silken flesh and statuesque nudity, a living enjoyment that left a scent of tepid pleasure behind. But what made the whole ball whisper were the necklace and the aigrette. 
The men recognized the jewels, and the women furtively called each other's attention to them with their eyes. These diamonds were the one subject of talk throughout the evening, and in the white light of a chandelier's, the reception room stretched away, filled with a resplendent throng which looked like a jumble of stars huddled into too small a corner of space. At about one o'clock, Sakar disappeared. He had enjoyed his wife's success like a man whose claptrap succeeds. He had again consolidated his credit. A business matter required his presence at Lord Dauphiny's, so he went off, begging Maxime to take René home after the ball. Maxime spent the evening soberly beside Louise de Mereux, both of them very much occupied in saying frightful things about the women who passed by and when they had said something rather stronger than usual, they stifled their laughter in their pocket handkerchiefs. Renée had to come to ask the young fellow for his arm when she wished to leave. She was nervously gay in the carriage. She still quivered with all the intoxication of the light, the perfumes, and the noise that she had just left. She, moreover, seemed to have forgotten their nonsense of the boulevard, as Maxime called it. She only asked him in a strange tone of voice, Is that little hunchback Louise so very funny then? Oh, very funny, replied the young man, beginning to laugh again. You saw the Duchess de Sternich with the yellow bird in her hair, didn't you? Well, Louise pretends that it's an automatic bird which flaps its wings every hour and cries, Cuckoo, cuckoo to the poor Duke. This jest coming from a girl who had just left school seemed very comical to René. When they reached the house, as Maxime was about to take his leave, she said to him, "'Aren't you coming up? Celeste has no doubt prepared me something to eat.' He ascended in his usual easy manner. Upstairs, however, there was nothing to eat, and Celeste had gone to bed. René had to light the tapers in a little candelabrum. Her hands slightly trembled. "'That foolish girl,' she said, speaking of her maid. "'She must have misunderstood my orders. I shall never be able to undress myself unhelped.' She passed into the dressing-room. Maxime followed her to relate another remark of Louise's which had just recurred to his mind. He was as much at his ease as if he had stayed late at a friend's and was looking for his cigar case to light an Havana. But when René had set the candelabrum down, she turned round and fell, speechless and portentous, into the young man's arms, pressing her mouth upon his own. René's private suite of rooms was a nest of silk and lace, a marvel of coquettish luxury. A tiny boudoir preceded the bedroom. The two apartments formed but one, or rather the boudoir was scarcely more than the threshold of the bedroom, a large alcove, furnished with couches and having a pair of curtains instead of a door. The walls in both apartments were hung with flax-tinted silken stuff, embroidered with huge bouquets of roses, white lilac, and buttercups. The curtains and door hangings were of Venetian lace over a silken lining formed alternately of grey and pink bands. In the bedroom, the white marble chimney piece, a real jewel, displayed like a flower bed its incrustations of lapis lazuli and precious mosaics repeating the roses, white lilac, and buttercups of the hangings. A large grey and pink bed, the patterned and upholstered woodwork of which was not seen, and the head of which stood against the wall, filled quite one half of the room with its flow of drapery, lace, and silk, brocaded with bouquets and falling from the ceiling to the carpet. You would have taken it for a woman's dress, rounded, scalloped, decked with puffs, bows, and flounces, and the large curtain swelling out like a skirt made you dream of some tall, lovesick wench, leaning back, fainting away and almost sinking upon the pillows. Under the curtains it was quite a sanctuary, plated cambric, a snowy mass of lace, all sorts of delicate transparent things, enveloped in a church-like dimness. 
beside the bedstead this monument the devout amplitude of which suggested a chapel adorned for some festival the other articles of furniture some low seats a cheval glass six feet high and chiffonier provided with a multitude of drawers subsided into nothingness on the floor the bluish-gray carpet was studded with pale full-blown roses and on either side of the bed lay two large black bearskins edged with pink velvet having silver claws and with their heads turned towards the window gazing fixedly at the empty sky through their glass eyes soft harmony muffled silence reigned in this room no high note no metallic reflection or bright gilding broke into the dreamy scale of pink and gray even the chimney ornaments the frame of the mirror the clock the little candelabra were of old sevres and their mountings of gilt copper were barely visible these ornaments were marvels the clock especially with its circle of podgy cupids who descended and leaned around the dial like a band of naked urchins careless to the rapid flight of time this discreet luxury these colors and objects which rene's taste had chosen soft and smiling lent a crepuscular appearance to the room the dimness of an alcove with the curtains drawn it seemed as if the bed stretched afar as if the whole room indeed were one huge bed with its carpets bearskins stuffed seats and padded hangings prolonging the softness of the floor up the walls to the ceiling and as in a bed the young woman left the imprint the warmth and the perfume of her body upon all the things when one drew aside the double hanging screening the room from the boudoir it seemed as if one raised some silken counterpane and entered some vast couch still warm and moist where one found on the fine linen the adorable figure the slumber and dreams of a parisian woman of thirty an adjoining spacious apartment hung with old chintz was simply furnished all round with lofty wardrobes containing renee's army of dresses celeste who was very methodical classified the dresses according to their age ticketed them and introduced arithmetic amid all her mistress's yellow or blue caprices and kept the apartment in a state of vestry-like impressiveness and stable-like cleanliness beyond the wardrobes there was not an article of furniture and no finery was left lying about the wardrobe doors shone cold and clean like the varnished panels of a brougham the marvel of the suite however the apartment that all paris talked about was the dressing room folk said beautiful madame saccard's dressing room as one says the gallery of mirrors at versailles this apartment was situated in one of the towers of the mansion just over the little buttercup drawing room on entering it one fancied oneself in a large circular tent a fairy-like tent pitched in full fantasy by some lovesick amazon in the center of the ceiling a crown of chased silver held up the drapery of the tent which extended cupola like to the walls and then fell straight to the floor this drapery these rich hangings were formed of pink silk covered with a muslin of a very open texture which was caught in plates at intervals a band of lace separated the plates and silver fillets descended from the crown and glided along the hangings on the either side of each of these bands here the pinkish gray of the bedroom grew brighter became a pinkish white like naked flesh and in this bower of lace beneath these curtains which hid all the ceiling save a bluish cavity inside the small circle described by the crown where chaplain had painted a laughing cupid looking down and preparing his dart one could have fancied oneself at the bottom of a sweetmeat box or in some precious jewel case enlarged and made to display the nudity of a woman instead of the brilliancy of a diamond the carpet of snowy whiteness stretched around without the least flowery design a wardrobe with plate glass doors and the two panels of which were mounted with silver a couch 
two armchairs, some white satin stools, a large toilet table with a slab of pink marble, and the legs of which were screened by flounces of muslin and lace, furnished the room. The glasses, the vases, and the basin on the toilet table were of old bohemian crystal, streaked pink and white, and there was yet another table encrusted with silver like the wardrobe and on which all the implements the toilet utensils were ranged. It was like a strange surgical case, displaying a large number of little instruments, the purpose of which was not readily guessed. Back scrapers, shining brushes, files of every dimension and every shape, straight and curved scissors, every variety of pincers and pins. Each one of these objects in silver and ivory was marked with Renée's monogram. But the dressing room had one delightful corner, and to that corner especially did it owe its fame. In front of the window the folds of a tent parted, and in a kind of alcove of considerable length but limited breadth, one espied a bath, a tank of pink marble, embedded in the flooring and with its sides, chamfered like those of a large shell, rising to a level with the carpet. One descended into the bath by marble steps. Above the silver taps, shaped like swan's heads, a Venetian mirror, frameless but with curved edges and a design ground in the crystal, filled the back of the alcove. René took a bath of a few minutes' duration every morning, and this bath filled the dressing room with moisture, with a perfume of fresh, wet flesh for the whole day. At times, an open scent bottle, a piece of soap left out of its dish, lent a dash of something stronger to this rather insipid smell. The young woman liked to remain there, almost in a state of nudity, until noon. The round tent itself was also naked. The pink bath, the pink tables and basins, the muslin of the ceiling and the walls, beneath which one seemed to see pink blood coursing, acquired the roundness of flesh, the curves of bare shoulders and bosoms, and, according to the hour of the day, one would liken the apartment to the snowy skin of a child or to the warm skin of a woman. It was one vast nudity. When Renée left her bath, her fair form lent but a little more pink to all the rosy flesh of the room. It was Maxime who undressed her. He understood that kind of thing, in his nimble hands divined pins, and glided round her waist with innate science. He let down her locks, took off her diamonds, and then dressed her hair for the night. And as he mingled jokes and caresses with his duties of chambermaid and hairdresser, Renée laughed with a greasy, stifled laugh, while the silk of her dress body rustled and her petticoats were loosened one by one. When she saw herself naked, she blew out the tapers of the candelabrum, caught hold of Maxime round the body, and all but carried him into the bedroom. The ball had completed her intoxication, and in her fever she was conscious of the previous day which he had spent by the fireside, of that day of ardent torpor and vague and smiling dreams. She still heard Saccard's and Madame Sidonie's voices talking, calling out figures through their noses like lawyers. It was these people who bored her, who drove her to crime. And even now, when in the depths of the vast dark bed she sought for Maxime's lips, she still saw him amid the fire of a day before, looking at her with scorching eyes. The young fellow only went off at six o'clock in the morning. She gave him the key of a little gate of the Parc Monceau, and made him swear to come back every night. The dressing room communicated with the buttercup drawing room by a little staircase hidden in the wall and connecting all the apartments of the tower. From the buttercup room it was easy to pass into the conservatory and thence reach the park. On going out at dawn, amid a thick fog, Maxime was somewhat stupefied by his good fortune. He accepted it, however, with his usual complacence as a neutral being. 
So much the worse, thought he. It's she who wishes it, after all. She's deucedly well formed. And she was quite right. She's twice as funny in bed as Sylvia is. They had glided to incest from the day when Maxime, in his threadbare collegian's tunic, had hung on Renée's neck, creasing her garde française habit. From that time forward there had been a prolonged perversion of every minute between them. The strange education which the young woman gave the child, the familiarities which made them boon comrades, later on the smiling audacity of their confidential chats, all this perilous promiscuity had ended by linking them together with a strange bond, the joys of friendship almost becoming carnal satisfactions. They had surrendered themselves to each other for years. The brutish act was but the acute crisis of this unconscionable malady of passion. Amid the maddened society in which they lived, their crime had sprouted as upon a rich dung heap full of impure juices. It had developed itself with a strange refinement amid a particular kind of debauchery. When the roomy carriage conveyed them to the bois, and rolled them gently along the pathways, whispering smutty things into each other's ears, diving back into their childhood in search of the dirty practices of instinct. It was but a deviation, but an unconfessed mode of satisfying their desires. They felt themselves to be vaguely guilty, as if they had just slightly touched one another. And this original sin, this languor born of dirty conversation, though it wearied them with voluptuous fatigue, titillated them even more softly than plain, positive kisses. Their familiarity was thus a slow lover's march, which was fatally destined to lead them some day or other to the private room of the Café Riche and to René's large grey and pink bed. When they found themselves in each other's arms, they did not even feel the shock of sin. One would have said that they were lovers of long standing whose kisses were full of recollections, and they had spent so much time in a contact of their whole beings that despite themselves they talked of the past which was so full of their ignorant tenderness. Do you recollect the day when I came to Paris, said Maxime? You wore a funny costume, and I traced an angle on your bosom with my finger and I advised you to open your dress in a point. I felt your skin under your chemisette, and my finger embedded itself a little. It was very nice. Rene laughed, kissing him and murmuring, You were already awfully vicious. How you did amuse us at Worms, do you recollect? We used to call you our little man. I always believed that Fat Suzanne would have readily yielded to you if the Marchioness hadn't watched her with such furious eyes. Ah, yes, we had some good laughs, muttered the young fellow. The photographic album, eh? And all the rest, our rambles through Paris, our snacks at the pastry cooks on the boulevard. Those little strawberry tarts which you liked so much, you know? For myself, I shall always remember the afternoon when you related to me Adeline's adventures at the convent when she wrote letters to Suzanne, signing herself Arthur Despinay, like a man, and proposing to carry her off. The lovers again grew merry over this good story, and then Maxime continued in his coaxing voice. When you came to fetch me at the college in your carriage, we must have looked funny, both of us. I was so small that I disappeared under your skirts. Yes, yes, she stammered, quivering, and drawing the young fellow towards her. It was very nice, as you say. We loved each other without knowing it, eh? I realized it before you did. The other day, on returning from the bois, my leg rubbed against yours and I started. But you didn't notice anything, eh? You didn't think of me? Oh, yes, I did, he replied, a little embarrassed. Only I didn't know, you understand, I didn't dare. He lied. The idea of possessing Renée had never plainly occurred to him. 
He'd rubbed up against her with all his vice, without really desiring her. He was too feeble for such an effort. He accepted René because she imposed herself upon him, and he had glided to her couch without willing or foreseeing it. When he had rolled there, however, he remained there because it was warm, and because he habitually forgot himself at the bottom of all the holes into which he fell. At the outset he even tasted some satisfactions of self-love. She was the first married woman that he had possessed. He did not reflect that her husband was his father. But René brought with her in sinning all the ardor of a heart which has lost caste. She also had slided down the slope. Only she had not rolled as far as the bottom like a mass of inert flesh. Desire had been kindled within her when it was too late to resist it and when the fall had become inevitable. This fall abruptly appeared to her as one of the necessities of her boredom, as a rare extreme enjoyment which alone could rouse her tired senses, her wounded heart. It was during that autumnal promenade in the twilight, when the Bois was falling asleep, that the vague idea of incest came to her, like a titillation which lent an unknown quiver to her skin. And in the evening, in the semi-intoxication of a dinner, this idea, lashed by jealousy, became precise, rose up ardently before her amid the flames of the conservatory as she watched Maxime and Louise. At that hour she desired sin, the sin which no one commits, the sin which would fill her empty life and finally set her in that hell of which she was still afraid, just as she had been when she was a little girl. Then on the morrow, by a strange sentiment of remorse and lassitude, she no longer wished it. It seemed to her as if she'd already sinned, that it was not so nice as she had fancied, and that it would really be too dirty. The crisis was bound to be fatal, to come from herself, apart from those two beings, those comrades, who were destined to deceive each other one fine evening, and to couple themselves, thinking they were merely exchanging a handshake. However, after this stupid fall, she returned to her dream of a nameless pleasure, and then she took Maxime in her arms again, inquisitive as to the cruel delights of a love which she regarded as a crime. Her volition accepted incest, required it, decided upon tasting it to the end, even to remorse should that ever come. She was active and conscious of her doings. She loved with the fury of a great fashionable lady, with the nervous prejudices she possessed as an offspring of the middle classes, with all the struggles joys and disgusts of a woman who drowns herself in self-disdain. Maxime returned every night. He came by way of the garden at about one o'clock. René usually awaited him in the conservatory, which he had to cross to reach the little drawing room. They, moreover, displayed perfect audacity, barely concealing themselves, and forgetting the most classical precautions of adultery. It is true that this corner of the house belonged to them. Baptiste, the husband's valet, alone had a right to enter it, and Baptiste, like a serious man, took himself off as soon as his duties were over. Maxime even pretended with a laugh that he withdrew to go and write his memoirs. One night, however, when the young fellow had just arrived, René showed him Baptiste, who was solemnly crossing the drawing-room with a candlestick in his hand. The tall valet, with his minister-like figure, lighted by the yellow glow of the wax, had a more dignified and severe physiognomy than usual. As the lovers leaned forward, they saw him blow out his candle and go towards the stables, where the horses and ostlers were asleep. "'He's going his rounds,' said Maxime. René remained quivering. Baptiste usually alarmed her. It often happened to her to say that, with his coldness and his clear glances which never fell upon women's shoulders, he was the only honest man in the house. Then they evinced some prudence in seeing each other. 
They closed the doors of a little drawing room and were able to dispose of this room with the conservatory and Renée's apartments in all tranquility. It was a little world, and during the earlier months they were tasted the most refined, the most delicately sought-for delights. They promenaded their amours from a large gray and pink bed of a sleeping room to the white and rosy nudity of the dressing room and to the pale yellow symphony of a little drawing room. Each chamber, with its particular scent, its hangings, its special life, lent them a different form of tenderness and made Renée a different lover. She was delicate and pretty on her padded gray lady's couch, in the warm aristocratic bedroom where love underwent a tasteful attenuation. She showed herself a capricious, carnal female under the flesh-colored tent, amid the perfume and damp languor of the bath, on leaving which she surrendered herself to Maxime, who preferred her thus. Then downstairs, in the bright sunrise of a little drawing-room, amid the yellow aurora which gilded her hair, she became a goddess with her fair Diana-like head, her bare arms which assumed chaste postures, her beauteous form which reclined on the couches in attitudes revealing noble outlines of antique gracefulness. But there was a spot which Maxime was almost frightened of, and where Renée only led him on evil days, the days when she felt the need of more bitter intoxication. Then they loved in the conservatory. It was there that they tasted incest. One night, in an hour of anguish, the young woman had compelled her lover to go and fetch one of the black bearskins. Then they had stretched themselves on this inky fur at the edge of an ornamental basin in the large circular pathway. Out of doors it was freezing terribly amid the limpid moonlight. Maxine had arrived shivering, with frozen ears and fingers, and the conservatory was heated to such a point that he fainted on the bearskin. Coming from the dry, biting cold, he entered into so heavy a flame that he felt a smarting as if he'd been whipped with a rod. When he recovered himself, he saw René kneeling, leaning over him with fixed eyes and a brutish attitude which frightened him. With her hair down and her shoulders bare, she was resting herself on her fists with her figure stretched out and looking like a huge cat with phosphorescent eyes. Above the shoulders of this adorable, amorous animal gazing at him, the young fellow, lying on his back, perceived the marble sphinx with her glistening hips lightened by the moon. Rene had the attitude and the smile of the feminine-headed monster, and in her loosened skirts she looked like the white sister of this black deity. Maxime remained supine. The heat was suffocating. It was a dull heat which did not fall from the sky in a rain of fire, but trailed on the ground like some unhealthy exhalation, and its steam ascended like a storm-charged cloud. A warm humidity covered the lovers with a kind of dew, an ardent sweat. For a long time they remained motionless and speechless in this bath of flame. Maxime flat and inert. Rene quivering on her wrists as on supple, nervous hands. Outside, through the little panes of the conservatory, one caught glimpses of the Parc Monceau, of the clumps of trees with fine black outlines, of the grass lawns as white as frozen lakes, quite a dead landscape, the delicate light tints of which reminded one of bits of Japanese engravings. And this spot of burning soil, this inflamed couch on which the lovers were stretched boiled strangely amid the great mute cold. They passed a night of mad love. René was the man, the passionate acting will. Maxime submitted, what with his lank limbs, his graceful slimness like that of a Roman youth, this neutral, fair-haired, pretty being, stricken in his virility since childhood, became a big girl in the young woman's inquisitive arms. He seemed to have been born and to have grown up for a perversion of love. René enjoyed her domination, and with her passion she bent this creature, whose sexuality always seemed indeterminate. For her, it was a constant astonishment of desire, 
a surprise of the senses, a strange sensation of uncomfortableness and acute pleasure. She no longer knew what he was, and she thought doubtingly of his fine skin, his fleshy neck, his abandonment and fainting fits. She then enjoyed an hour of repletion. By revealing to her an unknown ecstasy, Maxime completed her foolish toilets, her prodigious luxury, her mad life. He set in her flesh the high note which he already heard singing around her. He was the lover who matched the fashions and follies of the period. This pretty young fellow whose puny figure was revealed by his attire, this man who ought to have been a girl, who strolled on the boulevard, his hair parted in the middle, with little bursts of laughter and bored smiles, became in René's hands the instrument of one of those debaucheries suited to days of decline, and which among rotten nations at certain periods use up flesh and unsettle intelligence. And it was especially in the conservatory that René was the man. That ardent night they spent there was followed by several others. The conservatory loved and burnt with them. Amid the heavy atmosphere, in the whitish moonlight, they saw the strange world of plants around them, moving confusedly and exchanging embraces. The black bearskin stretched right across the pathway. At their feet the basin steamed full of a swarming, a thick entanglement of roots, while the rosy stars of the nymphae opened on the surface of the water like virgin bodices, and the bushy tornelius drooped like the hair of languishing water nymphs. Then around them the palms and the lofty Indian bamboos rose up towards the arched roof, near which they leaned and mingled their leaves together, assuming the unsteady attitudes of tired lovers. Lower down the ferns, the terrace, the alsophilus looked like green ladies with ample skirts trimmed with symmetrical flounces, and who, mute and motionless at the edge of the pathway, awaited love. Beside them the twisted red-spotted foliage of the begonias, and the white leaves shaped like lands heads of the caladiums, furnished a vague suite of bruises and pallidities which the lovers could not explain to themselves, but amid which they at times discerned roundnesses like those of hips and knees wallowing on the ground beneath the brutality of bleeding caresses. And the bananas, bending with the weight of their bunches of fruit, spoke to them of the rich fertility of the soil, while the Abyssinian euphorbia, the prickly, deformed, tapering stems of which, covered with horrid excrescences, they could espy in the darkness, seemed to perspire with sap, with the overflowing flux of their fiery growth. But by degrees, as the lovers' glances dived into the corners of the conservatory, the darkness was filled with a more furious debauchery of leaves and stems. They could not distinguish on the stages the marantus, soft like velvet, the gloxinias with violet bells, the dracanus resembling blades of old varnished lacquer. It was a round dance of living plants pursuing each other with unquenched tenderness. At the four corners, at the point where the curtains of tropical creepers formed arbors, their carnal fancy grew madder again, and the supple shoots of the vanillas, the Indian berries, the crisqualis and the bohinius seemed to be the interminable arms of lovers who could not be seen, but who distractedly lengthened their embrace to draw all scattered delights toward them. These endless arms drooped with lassitude, locked together in a spasm of love, sought for each other, entwined together like a crowd bent on copulation. It was indeed the immense copulation of the conservatory, of this bit of virgin forest ablaze with the foliage and the flowers of the tropics. Maxime and René, with their senses perverted, felt themselves carried away amid these mighty nuptials of nature. The soil burnt their backs through the bearskin, and drops of heat fell upon them from the lofty palms. The sap which arose in the tree trunks penetrated them as well, 
and imparted to them mad desires of immediate growth, of gigantic procreation. They took part in the copulation of the conservatory. It was then, in the pale glimmer, that visions stupefied them. Nightmares amid which, during long intervals, they beheld the amours of the palms and ferns. The foliage assumed a confused, equivocal aspect, which their desires transformed into something sensual. Murmurs, whispers were wafted to them from the clumps of shrubs. Faint voices, sighs of ecstasy, stifled cries of pain, distant laughter, all that was noisy in their own kisses, and that echo sent them back. At times they thought themselves shaken by an earthquake, as if the earth itself, in a crisis of satisfied desire, had burst forth into voluptuous sobs. If they had closed their eyes, if the suffocating heat and the pale light had not imparted to them a deprivation of every sense, the aromas alone would have sufficed to throw them into an extraordinary state of nervous erethism. The basin enveloped them in a deep, pungent aroma, amid which passed the thousand perfumes of the flowers and the foliage. At times the vanilla sang with dove-like cooings, then came the rough notes of the Stanhopius, whose streaked mouths had the same strong-smelling bitter breath as a convalescent. The orchids in their baskets, secured by wire chains, also breathed like animated incense burners. But the odor that predominated, the odor in which all these vague breaths were mingled, was a human odor, an odor of love which Maxime recognized when he kissed Renée on the nape of her neck when he plunged his head into her flowing hair. And they remained intoxicated by this scent, the scent of an amorous woman, which trailed through the conservatory as in an alcove where earth might be engaged in procreation. As a rule, the lovers lay down under the Kanginia from Madagascar, under the poisoned shrub, a leaf of which the young woman once had bitten, Around them the white statues laughed, gazing at the mighty coupling of foliage. The moon, as it turned, displaced the groups and animated the drama with its changing light. They were a thousand leagues from Paris, far from the easy life of the Bois de Boulogne and official drawing rooms. In a corner of some Indian forest, of some monstrous temple, of which the black marble sphinx became the deity, they felt themselves rolling to crime, to a cursed love, to wild beast tenderness. All the pollulation which surrounded them, the swarming of the basin, the naked immodesty of the foliage, threw them fully into the Dantesque hell of passion. It was then, in the depths of this glass cage, boiling over with the flames of summer, lost amidst the clear coldness of December, that they tasted incest as though it had been the criminal fruit of some overheated soil, feeling the while a dim fear of their terrifying couch. And in the center of the black bearskin, Renée's body seemed whiter as she crouched like a huge cat with her back stretched out, and her wrists extended like supple, nervous shins. She was all swollen with voluptuousness, and the light outlines of her shoulders and loins stood out with feline angularity against the inky stain which blackened the yellow sand of the pathway with its fur. She watched Maxime, this prey extended beneath her, who abandoned himself, and whom she possessed completely. And from time to time, she abruptly leant forward and kissed him with her irritated mouth. Her lips then parted with the greedy, bleeding brilliancy of the Chinese hibiscus, the expanse of which covered the side of the mansion. She was then nothing but a burning daughter of the conservatory. Her kisses bloomed and faded like those red flowers of the gigantic mallow which last barely a few hours, and which ever spring to life again like the bruised, insatiable lips of a giant Messalina. This ends Section 8.
Section 9 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola. Translated by Henry Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Section 9. The kiss which Saccar had imprinted on his wife's neck preoccupied him. He had not availed himself of his marital rights for a long time. The rupture had come quite naturally, neither the one nor the other caring for a connection which interfered with their habits. For Saccar to think of returning to René's room, some good stroke of business must necessarily be the object of his conjugal tenderness. The Charon affair, from which he hoped to derive a fortune, was progressing favorably, though he had some anxiety as to its termination. L'Arsonneau, with his dazzling shirt-front, smiled in a manner that displeased him. The expropriation agent was a simple go-between, a man of straw, whom he intended to remunerate for his obligingness with a commission of ten percent on the ultimate profits. However, although the agent had not invested a copper in the enterprise, and although Saccar had taken every precaution, such as a deed of retrocession, letters, the dates of which had been left in blank, and receipts given in advance, he nevertheless experienced an inward fear, a presentiment of some treachery. He scented that his accomplice intended to blackmail him with the help of that false inventory which he previously preserved, and to which alone he was indebted for his share in the enterprise. However, the two accomplices shook hands vigorously. Larsenault styled Saccar his dear master. He had at the bottom of his heart a real admiration for this equilibrist, and watched his performances on the tight rope of speculation like a connoisseur. The idea of duping him titillated him like some rare and spicy voluptuousness. He caressed the plan which was still vague, however, for he did not very well know how to employ the weapon he possessed, and he feared wounding himself with it. Besides, he felt that he was at the mercy of his ex-colleague. The ground and the buildings which carefully prepared inventories already valued at nearly two millions of francs, though they were not worth a quarter of that amount, must end by being swallowed up in a colossal bankruptcy if the fairy of expropriation did not touch them with her golden wand. According to the original plans which the two confederates had been able to consult, the new boulevard opened in view of connecting the artillery depot of Vincennes with the Prince Eugène barracks, and of bringing the guns and ammunition into the heart of Paris without passing through the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, would cross a part of the ground, but it was still to be feared that only a corner of the latter might be cut off, and that the ingenious speculation of the musical would fall through by reason of its very impudence. In that case, Larsenault would remain with a delicate matter to deal with. Still, this peril did not prevent him, despite the secondary part which he played perforce, from feeling soul-sick when he thought of the paltry ten percent which he would pocket in this colossal robbery of millions. And at those moments he could not resist the furious longing he felt to extend his hand and carve out a larger share for himself. Saccar had not even allowed him to lend money to his wife. He had preferred to amuse himself with this big piece of theatrical trickery, which delighted his partiality for complicated transactions. No, no, my dear fellow, he said, with his Provençal accent, which he exaggerated whenever he wished to impart additional salt to a joke. Don't let us mix up our accounts. You are the only man in Paris to whom I have sworn never to owe a copper. Larsenault contented himself with insinuating that his colleague's wife was a gulf. He advised him not to give her another sou, so that she would then be compelled to transfer her property to them immediately. He would have preferred to have to deal with Saccard alone. He probed him at times and carried things so far as to say with the weary, indifferent air of a man about town, "'All the same, I must put my papers in a little order.' Your wife frightens me, my good fellow. I don't want justice to place the seals on certain documents at my office. Saccard was not the man to submit to such allusions patiently, 
especially as he was well acquainted with the frigid meticulous order which prevailed in the agent's offices. The whole of his cunning, active little person revolted against the terror with which this coxcomb of a usurer in yellow kid gloves tried to inspire him. The worst was that he felt himself seized with shudders when he thought of a possible scandal, and he beheld himself brutally exiled by his brother in living in Belgium by some avocation not to be acknowledged. One day he grew angry and said to Larsenault, Listen, my boy, you're a nice fellow, but it would be as well for you to return me the document you know of. You'll see that scrap of paper will end by making us quarrel. The agent feigned astonishment, pressed his dear master's hand, and assured him of his devotion. Sacard regretted his momentary hastiness. It was at this period that he began to think seriously of drawing nearer to his wife he might yet have need of her against his accomplice, and he moreover said to himself that business matters are discussed marvelously well between man and wife in bed. That kiss on his wife's neck gradually revealed to him quite a new system of tactics. Besides, he was not in a hurry. He husbanded his resources. He devoted the whole winter to ripening his plan, though worried by a hundred different affairs, each of which was more muddled than the other. It was a terrible winter for him, full of shocks, a prodigious campaign during which he had to conquer bankruptcy daily. However, far from cutting down his expenses at home, he gave fete after fete. But if he succeeded in meeting every difficulty, he had to neglect René, whom he reserved for a triumphal blow when the Charon transaction became ripe. He contented himself with preparing the finish by continuing not to give her any money save through the intermediary of Larsonneau. When he was able to dispose of a few thousand francs and she complained of her poverty, he took them to her saying that Larsonneau's people required a note of hand for double the amount. This comedy vastly amused him. The stories connected with these promissory notes delighted him by the touch of romance which they imparted to the affair. Even at the period of his clearest profits, he'd served his wife her income in the most irregular manner, at one time making her princely presence, abandoning handfuls of bank notes to her, and then leaving her in the lurch for a paltry amount during weeks together. Now that he found himself seriously embarrassed, he talked about the expenses of the household and treated her like a creditor to whom one is unwilling to confess one's ruin and whom one disposes to patience by means of cock-and-bull stories. She scarcely listened to him, however. She signed whatever he chose and only pitied herself for not being able to sign more. Already, however, there were 200,000 francs worth of promissory notes signed by her, which barely cost him 110,000. After having these bills endorsed by Lausanneau, to whose order they were made payable, he placed them in circulation in a prudent manner, intending to employ them as decisive weapons later on. He would never have been able to hold out to the end of that terrible winter, to lend his wife money usuriously and keep up his style of living, but for the sale of his ground on the boulevard Malzerbe, which Monsieur Mignon and Charrier paid him for in hard cash, retaining, however, a formidable discount. For René, this same winter was one long joy. Lack of money was her only suffering. Maxime cost her very dear, he still treated her as a stepmother and allowed her to pay everywhere. But this hidden poverty was an additional delight for her. She exercised her wits and racked her brain so that her dear child should want for nothing, and when she had prevailed upon her husband to find her a few thousand francs, she and her lover expended them in some costly folly, like two schoolboys let loose on their first escapade. When they were hot up, they remained at home and derived their enjoyment from this large building of such new and insolently stupid luxury. The father was never there. The lovers sat by the fireside more frequently than formerly. The fact was that René had filled the icy emptiness of the gilded ceilings with a warm enjoyment. 
The suspicious abode of worldly pleasure had become a chapel in which she secretly practiced a new religion. Maxime did not merely lend to her nature that high note which harmonized with her mad dresses. He was the very lover fitted to this mansion with broad windows like shop fronts and which a flood of sculpture inundated from garret to cellar. He animated all this plaster from the two potty cupids who let a stream of water flow from their shell in the courtyard to the tall naked women supporting the balconies and playing with apples and ears of corn amid the pediments. He explained the unduly ornate hall, the tiny dimensions of the garden, the dazzling rooms in which one saw too many armchairs and not one work of art. The young woman who had formerly felt bored to death in the house suddenly began to amuse herself there and availed herself of it just as she might have done with something the use of which she had not understood at first. And it was not only through her own apartments, through the buttercup drawing room and the conservatory that she promenaded her love, but through the entire mansion. She even ended by finding an enjoyment in lying on the divan of the smoking room. She forgot herself there and declared that the vague smell of tobacco pervading the apartment was very agreeable. She appointed two reception days instead of one. On Thursdays all the mere acquaintances called, but Mondays were reserved to intimate female friends. Men were not admitted. Maxime alone was present at those choice gatherings which took place in the buttercup drawing room. One evening she had the astounding idea of dressing him up as a woman and of presenting him as one of her cousins, Adeline, Suzanne, the Baroness de Meinhold, and the other friends who were there rose up and bowed, astonished by the sight of this face which they vaguely recognized. Then, when they realized the truth, they laughed a great deal and absolutely refused to let the young man go and change his clothes. They kept him with them in his skirts, teasing him and lending themselves to equivocal jokes. When he'd seen these ladies off by the main gate, he went round the park and returned into the house by way of the conservatory. Renée's dear friends never had the slightest suspicion of the truth. Indeed, the lovers could not behave together more familiarly than they had previously done when they declared themselves to be boon comrades. And if it happened that a servant saw them rather close together behind a door, he expressed no surprise at it, being used to the pleasantries of his mistress and his master's son. This complete liberty, this impunity emboldened them still more. If they slipped the bolts at night time, in the daylight they kissed each other in every room of the house. They invented a thousand little games on rainy days. But Renée's great delight was still to pile up a terrible fire and doze in front of the grate. Her linen was marvelously luxurious that winter. She wore the most costly chemises and wrappers, the cambric and inserted embroidery of which barely covered her with a white cloud. And in the red glow of the fire she looked naked, with rosy lace and skin, the heat penetrating through the thin stuff to her flesh. Maxime, squatting at her feet, kissed her knees, without even feeling the garment which had the same warmth and color as her lovely form. In the dull, cloudy weather, a kind of twilight penetrated the bedroom hung with gray silk, whilst Celeste went backwards and forwards behind them with a quiet step. She had naturally become their accomplice. One morning, when they had forgotten themselves in the bed, she found them there, and retained all the coolness of a servant with icy blood. They then ceased restraining themselves. She came in at all hours without the sound of their kisses making her turn her head. They relied upon her to warn them in the case of alarm. They did not purchase her silence. She was a very economical, very honest girl, and was not known to have a single lover. Renée, however, was not cloistered. Taking Maxime in her train like a fair-haired page in a dress coat, she frequented society, where she tasted even more acute pleasures. The season was one long triumph for her. Never had her imagination been bolder as regards toilets and headdresses. 
It was then that she risked wearing that famous bush-tinted robe, on which a complete stag hunt was embroidered with such attributes as powder flasks, hunting horns, and broad-bladed knives. It was then also that she set the fashion of wearing the hair in the antique style, Maxine having to go and sketch patterns for her at the Campana Museum, which had recently been opened. She grew younger. She was in all the plenitude of her turbulent beauty. Incest lent her a fire which glowed in the depths of her eyes and heated her laughter. Her eyeglasses looked superbly insolent on the tip of her nose, and she gazed at the other women, at the dear friends who basked in the enormity of some vice, with the air of a bragging hobbledehoy, and with a fixed smile which signified, I also have my crime. Maxime, on his side, declared that society was wearisome. It was not merely for show that he pretended to be bored in it, for he really did not amuse himself anywhere. At the Tuileries, at the minister's residences, he disappeared amid René's skirts. But he became the master again as soon as some freak was in question. René wished to see the private room on the boulevard again, and the breath of a divan made her smile. Then he took her a little bit everywhere, to Harlot's houses, to the opera ball, to the stage boxes of petty theatres, to all the equivocal places where they could elbow brutal vice and taste the delights of remaining incognito. When they furtively returned to the house, worn out with fatigue, they fell asleep in each other's arms, sleeping off the drunkenness of obscene Paris, with snatches of smutty verses still ringing in their ears. On the morrow, Maxime imitated the actors, and René, accompanying herself on the piano of a little drawing-room, tried to recall the hoarse voice and the wriggling of Blanche Muller in her part of The Belle Hélène. The music lessons she had taken at the convent now only served her to murder the verses of the new burlesques. She had a religious horror of serious airs. Maxime poked fun at German music with her, and he thought it his duty to go and hiss Tannhäuser, both by conviction and to defend his stepmother's sprightly refrains. One of their great enjoyments was skating. It was fashionable that winter, the emperor having been one of the first to try the ice on the lake in the Bois de Boulogne. René ordered a complete Polish costume, velvet and fur of worms, and insisted upon Maxime wearing high boots and a fox-skin cap. They reached the Bois in the intense cold which made their noses and lips tingle as if the wind had blown fine sand into their faces. It amused them to feel cold. The Bois was quite gray, with threads of snow like narrow lace along the branches of the trees. And under the pale sky, above the congealed and bedimmed lake, only the pines of the island still displayed on the edge of the horizon their theatrical drapery on which the snow had also sewn broad bands of lace. The lovers darted along together in the frozen air, with the rapid flight of swallows skimming just above the ground. Setting one hand behind their backs, and placing one upon each other's shoulder, they went off, erect, smiling, side by side, and revolving round the broad space marked out by thick ropes. Loungers looked at them from the roadway, from time to time they came to warm themselves at the braziers lighted at the edge of a lake, and then they started off again. They enlarged the course of their flight, with their eyes watering both with pleasure and with cold. Then when the spring came, Renée remembered her old elegiac fancy. She insisted upon Maxime strolling with her in the Parc Monceau at night time by moonlight. They went into the grotto and sat down on the grass in front of the colonnade. But when she expressed the desire to row on the little lake, they found that there were no oars in the boat, which could be seen from the house, moored at the edge of a pathway. They were evidently removed every evening. This was a disappointment. Besides, the vast shadows of the park made the lovers nervous. They would have liked to have had a Venetian fete given there with red lanterns and an orchestra. They preferred it during the daytime, 
of an afternoon, and they often stationed themselves at one of the windows of the mansion to watch the equipages following the graceful curve of the main avenue. They enjoyed themselves in gazing upon this charming corner of New Paris, this clean, smiling bit of nature, these lawns looking like stripes of velvet, dotted with flower beds and choice shrubs, and edged with magnificent white roses. Carriages passed by each other, as numerous as on the boulevard. Lady promenaders carelessly trailed their skirts as if they had not ceased treading the carpets of their drawing rooms. And athwart the foliage, René and Maxime criticized the dresses and pointed out the equipages to each other, deriving real enjoyment from the soft tints of this large garden. A scrap of gilded railing shone between two trees. A party of ducks passed over the lake. The little Renaissance bridge looked white and new amid the green stuff, whilst on either side of the main avenue, mamas seated on yellow chairs forgot in their chatter the little boys and girls who looked at one another with a pretty air and pouted like precocious children. The lovers had a great liking for new Paris. They often rambled through the city in their carriage, going out of their way so as to pass along certain boulevards for which they had a personal affection. The lofty houses adorned with large carved doors, loaded with balconies, whereon names and callings glittered in large gold letters, delighted them. While the brougham darted along, they followed with a friendly glance the gray bands of interminable footways, with their seats, their variegated columns, and their scrubby trees. This bright gap, which extended to the limits of the horizon, growing narrower and opening upon a bluey parallelogram of space, the uninterrupted double row of large shops, where shopmen smiled at female customers, the currents of the stamping, swarming crowd, filled them little by little with a feeling of absolute and complete satisfaction. They realized that they beheld the perfection of street life. They were enamored even of the jets of the watering hose, which passed like white smoke before their houses and then spread out and fell in a fine rain under the wheels of the brougham, darkening the ground and raising a slight cloud of dust. They still went on, and it seemed to them that the vehicle was rolling over carpets along the straight, endless highway, which had been pierced solely so that they might not have to pass through dark alleys. Each boulevard became some passage of their mansion. The gay sunshine smiled upon the house fronts, lit up the window panes, fell upon the verandas of the shops and cafes, and heated the asphalt under the busy tread of the crowd. And when they returned home, somewhat dazed by the bright confusion of these long bazaars, they found enjoyment in the Parc Monceau, which was like the complimentary plat band of the new Paris, which displayed its luxury amid the first warmth of spring. When the exigencies of fashionable life absolutely compelled them to leave Paris, they went to the seaside, regretfully, however, and thinking of the boulevardian sidewalks while on the shores of the ocean. Then love itself grew dull there. It was a hot house flower which needed a spacious gray and pink bed, the naked fleshy aspect of a dressing room and the gilded dawn of a little drawing room. Alone of an evening in front of the sea, they no longer found anything to say to each other. Renée tried to sing the airs she had heard at the Variety Theatre, accompanying herself on an old piano which was agonizing in a corner of her room at the hotel. But the instrument, damp with the breezes from the open, had the dreary voice of the great waters. La Belle Hélène seemed lugubrious and fantastic. To console herself, Renée astonished the people on the sands by her prodigious costumes. The whole band of fashionable women there was yawning while waiting for the advent of winter and trying despairingly to invent some bathing dress which would not make them look too ugly. René was never able to prevail upon Maxime to bathe. He had an atrocious fear of water. He turned quite pale when the tide reached his boots, and for nothing in the world would he have approached the edge of a cliff. He kept away from all pits 
and made a long circuit to avoid any steep part of the shore. Zakhar came to see the children on two or three occasions. He was overwhelmed with worry, he said. It was only about October, when they all three found themselves again in Paris, that he seriously thought of drawing nearer his wife. The Charon affair was ripening. His plan was a simple and brutal one. He relied upon capturing René by the same devices that he would have employed with a harlot. She lived on amid an increasing need of money, and out of pride she only applied to her husband at the last extremity. The latter resolved to profit by her first request to show his gallantry, and in the delight occasioned by the payment of some heavy debt, to resume relations which had so long been severed. Some terrible embarrassments awaited René and Maxime in Paris. Several of the promissory notes drawn to Larsonneau's account had fallen due, but as Saccar naturally left them slumbering at the lawyers, they did not cause the young wife much worry. She was far more alarmed by her debts as regards Worms, whose bill now amounted to nearly 200,000 francs. But Taylor demanded something on account, and threatened to suspend all credit. Renée felt sudden shudders when she thought of a scandal of a lawsuit, and especially of a quarrel with the illustrious man Milliner. Moreover, she needed pocket money. She and Maxime would feel bored to death if they did not have a few louis a day to spend. The dear boy was quite stumped since he had vainly rummaged through his father's drawers. His fidelity and exemplary behavior during the last seven or eight months were largely due to the absolute emptiness of his purse. He did not always have twenty francs in his pocket to invite some street walker to supper, and so he philosophically returned to the house. At each of their freaks, the young woman handed him her purse so that he might defray the expenses in the restaurants, the balls, and petty theaters. She continued treating him maternally, and indeed it was she who, with the tips of her gloved fingers, settled at the pastry cooks, where they stopped almost every afternoon to eat little oyster patties. Of a morning he often found in his waistcoat some louis which he had not known to be there, and which he placed there like a mother filling a schoolboy's pocket. And to think that this delightful life of snacks satisfied fancies and facile pleasure was about to end. But a yet more grievous worry came to alarm them. Sylvia's jeweler, to whom Maxime owed 10,000 francs, grew angry and talked about Clichy, the debtor's prison. Such costs had accumulated on the notes at hand which he held, and had long since protested that the debt had increased by some three or four thousand francs. Saccar plainly declared that he could do nothing in the matter. The imprisonment of a son at Clichy would increase his notoriety, and when he secured the young fellow's release, he would make a great noise over his paternal liberality. Renée was in despair. She saw her dear child in prison, in a perfect dungeon, sleeping on damp straw. One evening, she seriously proposed to him not to leave her rooms, but to live there unknown to everyone and sheltered from the bailiffs. Then she swore that she would procure the money. She never referred to the origin of a debt of that woman Sylvia who confided the secret of her affections to the mirrors of private rooms. Some 50,000 francs, that was what she needed. 15,000 for Maxime, 30,000 for Worms, and 5,000 as pocket money. They would then have a fortnight's happiness before them. She embarked on the campaign. Her first idea was to ask her husband for these 50,000 francs, but it was only with a feeling of repugnance that she decided to do so. On the last occasions that he had entered her room to bring her some money, he'd printed fresh kisses on her neck, taking hold of her hands and talking about his affection. Women have acute powers of perception which enable them to guess men's feelings. So she expected some demand on his side, some tacit bargain concluded with a smile. And indeed, when she asked him for the 50,000 francs, he cried out, declared that Larsenault would never lend such a sum, and that he himself was still too embarrassed. Then, changing his tone, 
as if conquered and seized with sudden emotion. One cannot refuse you anything, he murmured. I will run about Paris and accomplish the impossible. I want you to be pleased, my dear. And setting his lips to her ear and kissing her hair, he added in a slightly trembling voice, I will bring you the money tomorrow evening, here in your room, without any note to sign. But she hastily said that she was not in a hurry, that she did not wish to trouble him so much. He who had just set all his heart in that dangerous, without any note, which had escaped him and which he regretted, did not appear to have encountered a disagreeable refusal. He rose up, saying, Very well, I am at your disposal. I will find you the sum when the moment arrives. Larsano will be for nothing in it, you understand. It is a present which I mean to make you. He smiled with a good-natured air. She remained in a state of cruel anguish. She felt she'd lose the little equilibrium left her if she surrendered herself to her husband. It was her last pride to be married to the father and to be only the son's wife. Often, when Maxime seemed to her to be cold, she tried to make him understand the situation by very transparent allusions. It is true that the young man, whom she expected to see fall at her feet after this revelation, remained altogether indifferent, imagining, no doubt, that she merely wished to reassure him as to the possibility of a meeting between his father and himself in the grey silk room. When Saccard had left her, she hastily dressed herself and had the horses put to. While her brougham was conveying her toward the Ile Saint-Louis, she prepared the manner in which she would ask her father for the fifty thousand francs. She flung herself into this sudden idea without consenting to discuss it, feeling very cowardly at the bottom of her heart and seized with invincible fright at the thought of such a step. When she arrived, the courtyard of the Berrault mansion froze her with its mournful, cloister-like dampness, and it was with a desire to run away that she mounted the broad stone staircase on which her little high-heeled boots resounded terribly. She'd been foolish enough in her haste to choose a costume of dead-leaf tinted silk with long flounces of white lace trimmed with bows of ribbon and cut athwart by a plaited sash. This toilet, which was completed by a little hat with a large white veil, set such a singular note in the dark gloom of the staircase that she herself became conscious of how strange she looked there. She trembled as she crossed the austere suite of spacious rooms, where the personages vaguely visible on the tapestry seemed surprised to see this stream of skirts pass by in the semi-daylight of their solitude. She found her father in a drawing-room, looking on to the courtyard, where he habitually remained. He was reading a large book placed on a desk, adapted to the arms of his chair. In front of one of the windows, Aunt Elizabeth sat knitting with long wooden needles, and in the silence of the room, the tick-tack of these needles was the only sound one heard. Renée sat down, ill at ease, unable to make a movement without disturbing the severity of the lofty ceiling by a noise of rustling silk. Her laces looked crudely white against the dark background of tapestry and old furniture. Monsieur Béraud du Châtel gazed at her with hands resting on the edge of a desk. Aunt Elizabeth talked about the approaching wedding of Christine, who was to marry the son of a very rich attorney. The young girl had gone to a tradesman's with an old family servant, and the good aunt talked on alone in her placid voice, without ceasing to knit, gossiping about household affairs, and casting smiling glances at Renée from above her spectacles. But the young woman became more and more disturbed, all the silence of the house weighed upon her shoulders, and she would have given a great deal for the lace of her dress to have been black. Her father's gaze embarrassed her to such a point that she considered Worms really ridiculous to have imagined such high flounces. "'How smart you are, my girl,' suddenly said Aunt Elizabeth, who had not yet even noticed her niece's lace." 
She stopped knitting and settled her spectacles to see the better. Monsieur Béraud de Châtel gave a faint smile. It is rather white, said he. A woman must be greatly embarrassed with that on the sidewalks. But one doesn't go out on foot, father, cried René, who immediately afterwards regretted these words from her heart. The old gentleman seemed about to reply. Then he rose up, straightened his high stature, and began walking slowly without again looking at his daughter. The latter remained quite pale with emotion. Each time that she exhorted herself to take courage and that she tried to find a transition that would lead up to the request for money, she experienced a shooting pain at the heart. "'We never see you now, father,' she murmured. "'Oh,' replied her aunt, "'your father hardly ever goes out except at long intervals to stroll in the Jardin des Plantes, and I even have to get angry to make him do that.' He pretends that he loses himself in Paris, that the city is no longer made for him. Ah, you do right to scold him. My husband would be so happy to see you at our Thursdays from time to time, continued the young woman. Monsieur Béraud de Châtel took a few steps in silence. Then, in a quiet voice, You must thank your husband for me, he said. He is an active fellow, it appears, and I hope for your sake that he conducts his enterprises honestly. But we haven't the same ideas, and I feel ill at ease in your fine house in the Parc Monceau. Aunt Elizabeth seemed vexed by this reply. How wicked men are with their politics, she said. Would you like to know the truth? Your father is furious with you because you go to the Tuileries but the old gentleman shrugged his shoulders, as if to say that his dissatisfaction had far more grievous causes. He began slowly walking again with a dreamy air. René remained for a moment silent, with the request for the 50,000 francs on the tip of her tongue. But seized with even greater cowardice than before, she kissed her father and went off. Aunt Elizabeth insisted upon accompanying her to the staircase, as they crossed the suite of rooms, she continued chattering in her old woman's squeaky voice. "'You are happy, my dear child. It pleases me very much to see you looking beautiful and well. For if your marriage had turned out badly, I should have thought myself guilty. Your husband loves you. You have all you need, haven't you?' "'Of course,' replied René compelling herself to smile, though feeling sick at heart. Her aunt still detained her with her hand on the balustrade of the staircase. Do you see? I have only one fear, that you may become intoxicated with all your happiness. Be prudent, and above all, don't sell anything. If you had a child some day, you would have a little fortune all ready for him. When René was in her brougham again, she heaved a sigh of relief. She had drops of cold perspiration on her forehead. She wiped them off, thinking of the icy dampness of the Béreau mansion. Then, as the brougham rolled along amid the clear sunlight of the Quai Saint-Paul, she remembered the 50,000 francs, and all her suffering was revived again, acuter than before. She, whom people thought so bold, how cowardly she had just been. And yet it was a question of Maxime, of his liberty, of their joint delights. Amid the bitter reproaches which she addressed to herself, an idea suddenly sprung up, which brought her despair to a climax. She ought to have spoken about the 50,000 francs to Aunt Elizabeth on the stairs. What had she been thinking about? The worthy woman would perhaps have lent her the amount or at all events have helped her. She was already leaning forward to tell her coachman to drive back to the Rue Saint-Louis-en-Ile when she thought she again beheld her father slowly crossing the solemn darkness of the grand drawing-room. She would never have the courage to return at once to that room. What could she say to explain this second visit? And in the depth of her heart, 
she no longer even found the courage to speak of the affair to Aunt Elizabeth. So she told her coachman to drive her to the Rue du Faubourg Poissonniere. Madame Sidonie uttered a cry of delight when she saw her opening the discreetly curtained door of the shop. She was there by chance. She was about to hasten to the magistrate's, where she had summoned the customer. But she would not put in an appearance. She could do so some other day. She was so happy that her sister-in-law had at length had the amiability to pay her a little visit. Rene smiled with an embarrassed air. Madame Sidonie would not by any means allow her to remain downstairs. She made her go up into her room by the little staircase after removing the brass knob from the shop door. She removed and refixed this knob, which was secured by a simple nail, at least twenty times a day. There, my beauty, she said, making Rene sit down on a couch. We shall be able to chat nicely. Do you know that you come in the very nick of time? I meant to go and see you this evening. Rene, who knew the room, experienced that vague feeling of uneasiness which a promenader feels on finding that a strip of forest has been cut down in a favorite landscape. Ah, she said at last, you've changed the position of the bed, haven't you? Yes, quietly replied the lace dealer. One of my customers thought it would be much better in front of the mantelpiece. She also advised me to have red curtains. That's what I was thinking. The curtains used not to be of that color. Red is a very common color. She put on her eyeglasses and looked at this room which displayed the kind of luxury one finds in a large hotel. On the mantel shelf, she saw some long hairpins which certainly did not come from Madame Sidonie's meager chignon. The paper of that part of the wall against which the bed had formerly stood was all torn, discolored, and dirtied by the mattresses. The agent had certainly tried to hide this sore with the backs of two armchairs, but these backs were rather low, and Rene's glance remained fixed on this worn strip of paper. "'You have something to say to me?' she asked at last. "'Yes, it's quite a story,' said Madame Sidonie, joining her hands and assuming the expression of a glutton who's about to relate what he's eaten at dinner. "'Just fancy!' Monsieur de Safre is in love with the beautiful Madame Saccard. Yes, with yourself, my pretty one. Rene did not vouchsafe even a gesture of coquetry. Indeed, she remarked. But you said he was so smitten with Madame Michelin. Oh, that's finished, quite finished. I can prove it to you if you like. Don't you know then that little Michelin has pleased Baron Gouraud? It's incredible. Everyone who knows the Baron is amazed. And now she's on the way to obtaining the red ribbon for her husband. Ah, she's a woman of spirit. She isn't faint-hearted. She doesn't need anyone to steer her boat. Madame Sidonie said this with an air of some little regret mingled with admiration. But to return to Monsieur de Safre. It would seem that he met you at an actress's ball, muffled up in a domino, and he even accuses himself of having somewhat cavalierly offered you a supper. Is it true? The young woman was quite surprised. Perfectly true, murmured she. But who could have told him? Wait a bit. He pretends that he recognized you later on, when you were no longer in the room and that he remembered having seen you leave on Maxime's arm. Since then, he has been madly in love. It has grown in his heart, you understand, been a sudden fancy. He came to see me to beg me to make you his apologies. Well, tell him that I forgive him, interrupted Rene negligently. And again assailed by all her worry, she continued, Ah, my good Sidonie, I am awfully bothered. It is absolutely necessary that I should have 50,000 francs tomorrow morning. I came to speak to you about the matter. You know some money lenders, you told me. The agent, vexed by the abrupt manner in which her sister-in-law had interrupted her story, made her wait some time for an answer. 
Yes, certainly. Only I advise you, first of all, to try and obtain the money from a friend. If I were in your place, I know very well what I should do. I should simply apply to Monsieur de Safray. René smiled in a constrained manner. But it would hardly be proper, she answered, since you pretend that he is so much in love. The old woman looked at her with a fixed stare. Then her flabby face gently softened into a smile of tender pity. Poor dear, she muttered. You've been crying. Don't deny it. I can see it by your eyes. You must be strong and accept life. Come, let me arrange the little matter in question. Renée rose up, twisting her fingers and making her gloves crack. And she remained standing, quite shaken by a cruel internal struggle. She was opening her mouth to accept, perhaps, when the gentle ring at the bell resounded in the next room. Madame Sidonie hastily went out, leaving the door ajar, so that a double row of pianos could be seen. The young woman then heard a man's step, and the stifled sound of a conversation carried on in an undertone. She mechanically went to examine more closely the yellowish stain with which the mattresses had streaked the wall. This stain disturbed her, made her ill at ease. Forgetting everything, Maxime, the fifty thousand francs, and Monsieur de Safray, she stepped back to the front of the bed, reflecting. This bed had been much better placed, as it had formerly stood. Some women were really wanting in taste. Of a certainty, when one lay down, one must have a light in one's eyes. And in the depths of her memory, she vaguely saw the figure of the stranger of the Quay saint Paul rise up, her novel in two assignations, that chance amour which she'd partaken of there at that other place. The wearing away of the wallpaper was all that remained of it. Then the room filled her with uneasiness, and the hum of voices which continued in the next apartment made her feel impatient. When Madame Sidonie returned, opening and closing the door with due precaution, she made repeated signs with the tips of her fingers to recommend René to speak low. Then she whispered in her ear, You don't know. The adventure's a good one. It's Monsieur de Safray who's there. You didn't tell him, though, that I was here, asked the young woman anxiously. The agent seemed surprised and with an air of great simplicity answered, But I did. He's waiting for me to tell him to come in. Of course, I didn't speak about the 50,000 francs. Renée, who was quite pale, had drawn herself up as if she'd been struck with a whip. A great pride again rose to her heart. That creaking of boots which she heard growing louder in the next room exasperated her. I'm going, she said curtly. Come and open the door for me. Madame Sidonie tried to smile. Don't be childish, she said. I can't be left with that fellow on my hands since I've told him you are here. You really compromise me. But the young woman had already descended the little staircase. She repeated in front of the closed shop door, Open it! Open it! When the lace dealer withdrew the brass knob, she had the habit of putting it in her pocket. She wished to continue parleying. Finally seized with anger herself, and displaying in the depths of her gray eyes the tart acridity of her nature, she cried, But come, what shall I say to the man? That I'm not for sale, replied René, who already had one foot on the sidewalk. And it seemed to her that she could hear Madame Sidonie muttering as she banged the door, Eh, get off, you jade, you shall pay me for this. By heavens, thought René, as she again entered her brougham. I prefer my husband to that. She returned straight home. In the evening, she told Maxime not to come. She was poorly. She needed repose. And on the morrow, when she handed him the 15,000 francs for Sylvia's jeweler, she remained embarrassed in presence of his surprise and his questions. Her husband, she said, had done a good stroke of business. From that day forth, however, she became more capricious, 
She often changed the hour of the appointments which she gave the young fellow, and even she frequently watched for him in the conservatory to send him away. He did not worry himself much about these changes of humor. It pleased him to be an obedient thing in women's hands. What bored him a great deal more was the moral turn in which their lovers' meetings took at times. She became quite sad, and it even happened that she had big tears in her eyes, she left off singing the refrain about the handsome young man in the Belle Hélène. She played the hymn she'd learnt at school and asked her lover if he did not think that sin was always punished, sooner or later. She's decidedly growing old, he thought. It will be the utmost if she's funny for another year or two. This ends section 9. Section 10 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Section 10 The truth was that she suffered cruelly. She would now have preferred to deceive Maxime with Monsieur de Saffre. She had revolted at Madame Sidonie's. She had given way to instinctive pride, to disgust for such a low bargain. But on the following days, when she endured the anguish of adultery, everything in her foundered, and she felt herself so despicable that she would have surrendered herself to the first man who pushed open the door of the room containing the pianos. The thought of her husband had, at times, formerly passed before her, amid her incest, like a touch of voluptuous horror. But henceforth the husband, the man himself, entered into it with a brutality that transformed her most delicate sensations into intolerable sufferings. She, who had enjoyed the refinement of her sin, and had willingly dreamt of a corner of a superhuman paradise where the gods partook of their amours together, was now descending to vulgar debauchery, to being shared by two men. In vain did she try to derive enjoyment from her infamy. Her lips were still warm with Saccard's kisses when she offered them to Maxime's. Her inquisitiveness descended to the depths of these accursed pleasures. She went as far as to mingle the two affections and to seek for the son amid the father's hugs and she emerged yet more alarmed and more bruised from this journey into unknown evil, from this ardent darkness into which she confounded the person of her double lover, with a terror which was like the death-rattle of her enjoyment. She kept this drama to herself alone, and increased the suffering it occasioned by the feverishness of her imagination. She would have preferred to die rather than own the truth to Maxime, she had an inward fear that the young man might revolt and leave her. She had such an absolute belief in the monstrosity of her sin and in eternal damnation that she would have more willingly crossed the Parc Monceau naked than have confessed her shame aloud. On the other hand, she still remained the madcap who astonished Paris by her extravagant conduct. Nervous gaiety seized hold of her, prodigious caprices which the newspapers talked about, designating her by her initials. It was at this period that she seriously wished to fight a duel with pistols with the Duchess de Sternich, who had intentionally, so she said, upset a glass of punch over her dress. To calm her, it was necessary for her brother-in-law, the minister, to get angry. On another occasion, she bet with Madame de Laurence that she would make the round of a Longchamp race course in less than ten minutes, and it was only a question of costume that deterred her from doing so. Maxime himself began to feel afraid of this head, in which madness lurked, and on the pillow at night time he thought he could hear all the hubbub of a city bent on enjoying itself. One evening they went together to the Théâtre Italien. They had not even looked at the bill, they wished to see the great Italian tragedian Ristori, who then attracted all Paris, and in whom, by the command of fashion, they were bound to interest themselves. 
the play was Phaedre. Maxime remembered his classical repertory sufficiently, and René knew enough Italian to follow the performance. And indeed, they derived an especial emotion from this drama, performed in a foreign language, the sonority of which seemed to them at times to be a simple orchestral accompaniment supporting the pantomime of the actors. Hippolytus was a tall, pale fellow, a very poor actor, who whimpered in his part. What a ninny, muttered Maxime. However, Ristori, with her broad shoulders shaken by her sobs, with her tragical face and fat arms, moved René deeply. Fedra was of Pacify's blood, and she asked herself of what blood she was, the incestuous stepmother of modern times. She saw naught of the piece save this tall woman drawing the ancient crime over the stage. When Phaedra confides her criminal tenderness to Inoni in the first act, when all on fire she declares herself to Hippolytos in the second, and later on in the fourth act, when the return of Theseus overwhelms her and she curses herself in a crisis of gloomy fury, she filled the house with such a cry of savage passion, with such a yearning for superhuman voluptuousness, that the young woman felt every shudder of her desire and remorse pass through her own flesh. Wait, murmured Maxime in her ears. You're going to hear Terramain's narrative. The old fellow has a funny head. And he muttered in a hollow voice. Scarce had we passed the gates of Trezen, he on his chariot mounted. And while the old fellow spoke, René neither looked nor listened any more, and stifling heat came to her from all the pale faces stretched out towards the stage. The monologue continued interminable. She imagined herself in the conservatory under the ardent foliage, and she dreamt that her husband came in and surprised her in the arms of his son. She suffered horribly. She was losing consciousness when the death rattle of Phaedra, repentant and dying in the convulsions caused by the poison, made her open her eyes again. The curtain fell. Would she have the strength to poison herself some day? How petty and shameful her drama was beside the ancient... Epopea. And while Maxime fastened her opera cloak under her chin, she still heard, growling behind her, Ristori's rough voice to which Inone's complacent murmur replied. In the brougham, the young fellow talked on alone. He considered tragedy sickening as a rule, and preferred the pieces performed at the bouffe. However, Phaedra was spicy. He had taken an interest in it because... And he pressed René's hand to complete his meaning. Then a funny idea darted through his head, and he gave way to an impulse to say something witty. It was I, he murmured, who did right not to approach the sea at Trouville. René, lost in the depths of her painful dream, remained silent. It was necessary for him to repeat his phrase... Why? asked she, astonished and failing to understand. But the monster, and he gave vent to a little titter. This joke froze the young woman. Everything was upset in her head. Her story was no longer aught but a big puppet who tucked up her peplum and poked out her tongue to the public, like Blanche Muller in the third act of the Belle Hélène. Terramain danced the can-can, and Hippolytus ate bread and jam while stuffing his fingers into his nose. When a more galling remorse made René shudder, she evinced superb revolt. What was her crime after all? Why should she blush? Did she not every day tread upon greater infamies? Did she not elbow at the ministers, at the Tuileries? Everywhere, in fact. Wretches like herself, who had millions on their flesh, and who were adored on both knees. And she thought of the shameful friendship of Adeline d'Espanay and Suzanne Hoffner, at which one smiled at times at the Empress's Mondays. And she recalled to herself the traffic of Madame de Laurence, 
whom husband celebrated for her good conduct, her order, and her exactitude in settling her tradesmen's bills. She named Madame d'Aste, Madame Tessier, the Baroness de Meinhold, those creatures whose luxury was paid for by their lovers and who were quoted in society like shares are quoted upon change. Madame de Guende was so stupid and so well-formed that she had three superior officers for her lovers at the same time and was unable to distinguish them from each other on account of their uniforms. This made that demon of a Louise say that she first of all made them strip to their shifts so as to know which of the three she was talking to. As for the Countess Vanska, she remembered the courtyards in which she had sung, the sidewalks on which people pretended they had again seen her dressed in printed calico and prowling about like a she-wolf. Each of these women had her shame, her triumphant, displayed sore. And overtopping them all, the Duchess de Sternish rose up, ugly, old, worn out, with the glory of having passed a night in the imperial bed. She typified official vice, from which she derived the majesty of debauchery and a kind of sovereignty over this band of illustrious hussies. The incestuous stepmother accustomed herself to her sin, as to a gala robe the stiffness of which might at first have inconvenienced her. She followed the fashions of the period. She dressed and undressed herself in the style of others. She ended by believing that she lived amid a circle above common morality, in which the senses became more acute and developed, and in which one was allowed to strip oneself naked for the joy of all Olympus. Sin became a luxury, a flower set in the hair, a diamond fastened on the brow. And she again saw, like a justification and redemption, the emperor passing on the general's arm between two rows of inclined shoulders. Only one man, Baptiste, her husband's valet, continued to disturb her. Since Saccard showed himself gallant, this tall, pale, dignified valet seemed to walk around her with a solemnity of mute censure. He did not look at her. His cold glances passed higher, above her chignon, with the modesty of a beetle who refuses to defile his eyes by letting them rest on a hair of a sinner. She imagined that he knew everything, and she would have purchased his silence had she dared. Then feelings of uneasiness took possession of her. She experienced a kind of confused respect when she met Baptiste, and said to herself that all the honesty of her household had withdrawn and hidden itself under this lackey's dress coat. One day she asked Celeste, Does Baptiste joke in the servants' hall? Do you know if he has had any adventure, if he has any mistress? What a question, was all the maid replied. Come, he must have paid you some attentions. Why, he never looks at women. We barely see him. He's always in master's rooms or in the stables. He says that he's very fond of horses. Renée was irritated by this respectability, for she would have liked to be able to despise her servants. Although she had taken a liking to Celeste, she would have rejoiced to learn that she was someone's mistress. But you, Celeste, she continued, don't you think that Baptiste is a good-looking fellow? I, madame, cried the chambermaid, with the stupefied air of a person who has just heard something prodigious. Oh! I've very different ideas in my head. I don't want a man. I've my plan. You'll see later on. I'm not a fool. No. Renée could not draw anything more precise from her. Moreover, her worries were growing. Her noisy life, her mad rambles, met with numerous obstacles which she had to overcome, and against which she at times bruised herself. It was thus that Louise de Marais rose up one day between herself and Maxime. Renée was not jealous of the hunchback, as she disdainfully called her. She knew her to be condemned by the doctors and could not believe that Maxime would ever marry such an ugly chit, even at the price of a dowry of a million. In her fall, she had retained a middle-class naivete respecting the people around her. 
although she despised herself, she readily believed that they were superior and very estimable. But whilst rejecting the possibility of a marriage which would have seemed to her a piece of sinister debauchery and, and a theft, she suffered from the young folks' familiarities and friendliness. When she spoke of Louise to Maxime, he laughed with satisfaction. He repeated the child's sayings to her and said, the urchin calls me her little man, you know. And he displayed such freedom of mind that she did not dare to tell him that this urchin was seventeen, and that their playfulness with their hands and their eagerness when they met in drawing rooms to find some shady corner to poke fun at everybody grieved her and spoiled her most pleasant evenings. An incident occurred which imparted a strange character to the situation. Rene often felt the need of acting boastingly, and she had whims of brutal boldness. She dragged Maxime behind a curtain, behind a door, and kissed him at the risk of being seen. One Thursday evening, when the buttercup drawing room was full of people, she was seized with the fine idea of calling the young fellow who was talking with Louise. She advanced from the depths of the conservatory where she was to meet him, and abruptly kissed him on the mouth between two clumps of shrubbery, thinking that she was sufficiently concealed. But Louise had followed Maxime, and when the lovers raised their heads, they saw her a few paces off, looking at them with a strange smile, without the least blush or astonishment, but with the quiet, friendly air of a companion in vice, who's learned enough to understand and appreciate such a kiss. Maxime felt really frightened that day, and it was René who showed herself indifferent and almost joyful. It was all over. It was now impossible for the hunchback to take her lover from her. She thought, I ought to have done it on purpose. She now knows that her little man belongs to me. Maxime felt reassured when he again found Louise as gay and as funny as before. He considered her to be very acute and a very good-natured girl, and that was all. There was good reason, however, for René to be disturbed. For some little time past, Saccard had been thinking of his son's marriage with Mademoiselle de Mareuil. There was a dowry of a million francs to be had, which he did not wish to let escape, meaning to get his hands into this money later on. As Louise remained in bed during nearly three weeks at the beginning of the winter, he was so afraid of seeing her die before the projected union was accomplished that he decided the children should marry at once. He certainly thought them rather young, but the doctors feared the month of March for the consumptive girl. Monsieur de Marais, on his side, was in a delicate position. He had eventually succeeded in getting himself returned as a deputy at the last poll. Only the corps legislatif had just quashed his election, which had provoked a great scandal when the chamber deliberated on the validity of the returns. This election was quite a heroic comical poem on which the newspapers lived for a whole month. Monsieur Huppel de la Noue, the prefect of the department, had displayed such vigor that the other candidates had not even been able either to placard their addresses to the electors or to distribute their voting papers. At his advice, Monsieur de Marais covered the constituency with tables at which the peasants ate and drank for a week. He moreover promised a railway line, the erection of a bridge and three churches, and on the eve of the poll he forwarded to the influential electors the portraits of the emperor and empress, two large engravings covered with glass and set in gold frames. This gift met with tremendous success and the majority in Monsieur de Marais' favor was overwhelming. But when the chamber, in presence of the bursts of laughter which came from all France, found itself compelled to send Monsieur de Marais back to his electors, the minister flew into a terrible passion with the prefect and the unfortunate candidate who had really shown themselves too zealous. He even spoke of choosing someone else as the official candidate. Monsieur de Marais was terrified. He'd spent 300,000 francs in the department. He owned there some large estates where he felt bored and which he would have to sell at a loss. 
So he came to beg his dear colleague to appease his brother and to promise him in his name a most properly conducted election. It was on this occasion that Saccard again spoke of the children's marriage and that the two fathers finally decided upon it. When Maxime was sounded on the subject, he felt embarrassed. Louise amused him, and the dowry tempted him still more. He said yes. He accepted all the dates that Saccard named to avoid the worry of a discussion. But, at heart, he owned to himself that matters would unfortunately not be arranged with such charming facility. Renée would never consent. She would cry. She would upbraid him. She was capable of provoking some great scandal to astonish Paris. It was very disagreeable. She now frightened him. She watched him with alarming eyes, and she possessed him so despotically that he thought he could feel claws digging into his shoulder whenever she laid her white hand on it. Her turbulence became roughness, and there was a cracked sound in the depths of her laughter. He really feared that she would go mad one night in his arms. With her remorse, fear of being surprised, the cruel joys of adultery did not manifest themselves as with other women by tears and dejection, but by greater extravagance and a more irresistible longing for noise. And amid her growing affrightment, one began to hear a rattling, the derangement of this adorable, astonishing machine which was breaking up. Maxime passively awaited an occasion which would rid him of this troublesome mistress. He again said that they had been very stupid. If their comradeship had at first lent additional voluptuousness to their love, it now prevented him from breaking off as he would certainly have done from any other woman. He would not have returned. That was his mode of bringing his amours to a finish, so as to avoid any effort or any quarrel. But he felt himself incapable of a row, and he still even willingly forgot himself at Renée's embraces. She behaved maternally, she paid his expenses, and she would pull him out of embarrassment if any creditors became angry. Then he thought of Louise, the thought of a dowry of a million of francs returned to him and made him reflect, even amid the young woman's kisses, that it was all very charming and nice, but that it wasn't serious and must come to an end. One night, Maxime was so rapidly stumped at the house of a woman, where one often gambled till daylight, that he experienced one of those mute attacks of anger familiar to the gamester whose pockets are empty. He would have given everything in the world to have been able to fling a few more louis on the table. He took up his hat, and with the mechanical step of a man who is impelled by a fixed idea, he repaired to the Parc Monceau, opened the little gate, and found himself in the conservatory. It was past midnight. Renée had forbidden him to come that night. When she now closed the door to him, she did not even try to invent an explanation, while he merely thought of profiting of his holiday. He only clearly remembered the young woman's prohibition when he was in front of the glass door of a little drawing room which was closed. As a rule, when he was to come, Renée undid the fastening of this door in advance. Bah, said he, on seeing that the window of the dressing room was lighted up. I will whistle and she'll come down. I shan't disturb her. If she has a few louis, I'll go off at once. And he whistled gently. He indeed often employed this signal to announce his arrival. But that evening he fruitlessly whistled several times. He grew obstinate raising the key and unwilling to abandon his idea of an immediate loan. At last he saw the glass door opened with infinite precaution and without his having heard the least sound of footsteps. In the dim light of the conservatory, Renée appeared to him with her hair down and scarcely dressed, as if she were going to bed. She was barefooted. She pushed him towards one of the arbors, descending the steps and walking over the gravel of the pathways, without seeming to feel the cold or the roughness of the ground. "'It's stupid to whistle as loud as that,' she muttered, with restrained anger. "'I told you not to come. What do you want with me?' "'Eh? 
Let's go up, said Maxime, surprised by this reception. I'll tell you upstairs. You'll catch cold here. But as he stepped forward, she held him back, and he then perceived that she was horribly pale. Mute fright bent her form. Her clothes, the lace of her linen, hung down like tragic shreds upon her shuddering skin. He examined her with growing astonishment. What's the matter with you? You're ill? And instinctively he raised his eyes and looked through the glass panes of the conservatory at the window of the dressing room where he had seen a light. But there's a man in your room, he said suddenly. No, no, it isn't true, she stammered, supplicating, distracted. Pooh, my dear, I see his shadow. Then for a minute they remained there face to face, not knowing what to say to each other. Renée's teeth chattered with terror, and it seemed to her as if someone were throwing buckets full of iced water over her bare feet. Maxime experienced more irritation than he would have believed, but he still remained sufficiently possessed to reflect and say to himself that the occasion was a good one and that he would now break off the connection. "'You would make me believe that Celeste wears a coat,' he continued. If the glass panes of the conservatory were not so thick, I should perhaps recognize the gentleman. She pushed him deeper into the shadow of the foliage, saying with her hands clasped and seized with growing terror, I beg of you, Maxime. But all the young fellow's teasing faculties were aroused, a ferocious malice which sought for vengeance. He was too weak to ease himself by anger. Spite compressed his lips and instead of striking her as he had at first had the impulse of doing, he sharpened his voice and rejoined, You ought to have told me of it. I shouldn't have come to disturb you. It happens every day that one no longer cares for one another. I myself was beginning to have enough of it. Come, don't be impatient. I'll let you go up again, but not before you've told me the gentleman's name. Never, never murmured the young woman, forcing back her tears. It isn't to call him out, it's to know. The name, tell me the name, quick, and off I go. He caught hold of her wrists and he looked at her, laughing his wicked laugh. She struggled, distracted, bent upon not opening her lips again, so that the name he asked for might not escape from them. We shall make a noise, you'll be nicely placed then. Why are you frightened? Aren't we good friends? I want to know who replaces me. It's legitimate. Come, I'll help you. It's Monsieur de Moussy whose grief has touched you. She did not answer. She bowed her head beneath such an interrogatory. It isn't Monsieur de Moussy? The Duc de Rosan, then? Really? Not he either? Perhaps the Comte de Chibre? Not even he? He stopped short. He reflected. The devil! I can't think of anyone else. It can't be my father after what you told me. Rene quivered as if she'd been burnt and said huskily, No, you know very well that he no longer comes. I shouldn't accept. It would be ignoble. Then who is it? And he pressed her wrists still more tightly. The young woman struggled for a few moments longer. Oh, Maxime, if you knew, I can't, however, tell you. Then conquered, crushed, looking with a fright at the lighted window. It is Monsieur de Saffre, she stammered in a very low voice. Maxime, whom the cruel game had amused, turned extremely pale on hearing this confession, which he'd asked for so persistently. He was irritated by the unexpected pain which this man's name caused him. He violently threw back Renée's wrists, drawing near to her and saying to her full in the face and with clenched teeth, Well, do you want to know you are a... He said the word. And he was going off when she hastened to him, sobbing, taking him in her arms, murmuring tender things, requests for pardon, swearing that she still adored him and that she would explain everything to him on the morrow. 
but he disengaged himself and banged the door of the conservatory, replying, No, all's over. I've had quite enough of it. She remained crushed. She watched him crossing the garden. It seemed to her that the trees of the conservatory revolved round her. Then she slowly dragged her bare feet over the gravel of the pathways. She reascended the steps, her skin discolored by the cold and more tragical than ever amid the disorder of her lace. Upstairs she answered in reply to the questions of her husband who was waiting for her that she thought she could recollect where she dropped a little notebook she'd lost since the morning. And when she was in bed, she suddenly felt immense despair on reflecting that she ought to have told Maxime that his father, after returning home with her, had followed her into her room to talk to her about some money matter. It was on the morrow that Saccard decided to hasten the finish of the Chacon matter. His wife belonged to him, he had just felt her soft and inert in his hands, like something that surrenders itself. On the other hand, the line which the Boulevard du Prince Eugène was to follow was about to be decided upon, and it was necessary that René should be despoiled before the approaching expropriation was noised about. Saccar displayed an artist's love in all this affair. It was with devotion that he watched his plan ripen and he set his traps with the refinement of a sportsman who prides himself on capturing his game in skillful fashion. He felt the satisfaction of an expert gamester, of a man who derives a special enjoyment from stolen game. He wished to obtain the ground for a crust of bread, and then to give his wife a hundred thousand francs worth of jewelry amid the joy of the triumph. The simplest operations grew complicated, became black dramas as soon as he dealt with them. He became impassioned. He would have beaten his father for five francs. But afterwards he scattered gold in regal fashion. However, before obtaining from René the cession of her share in the property, he prudently went to probe L'Arsonneau as to the blackmailing intentions which he had scented in him. His instinct saved him on this occasion. The expropriation agent had imagined on his side that the fruit was ripe and that he could pluck it. When Saccard entered the office in the Rue de Rivoli, he found his compeer overcome and showing signs of the most violent despair. Ah, my friend, murmured Larsano, taking hold of his hands, we are lost. I was about to hasten to your place so that we might consult together and get out of this horrible scrape. While he wrung his hands and tried to sob, Saccard noticed that he'd been engaged in signing letters prior to his arrival, and that the signatures were penned with admirable precision. He accordingly looked at him quietly, saying, Bah, what has befallen us then? But the agent did not reply at once. He'd thrown himself into his armchair in front of his writing table, and there, with his elbows on the blotting pad and his brow between his hands, he furiously shook his head. Finally, in a husky voice, I have been robbed of the ledger containing the inventory, you know. And he related that one of his clerks, a scamp worthy of the galleys, had abstracted a large number of papers, among which the famous inventory figured. The worst was that the thief had realized to what use he might turn the document in question, and he wished to sell it back for a hundred thousand francs. Sakar reflected. The story seemed to him altogether too clumsy. Plainly enough, Larsonneau did not much care at heart whether he was believed or not. He sought for a simple pretext to make Sakar understand that he wanted a hundred thousand francs in the Charon affair and that he would, on this condition, return the compromising papers which were in his possession. The bargain seemed too onerous to Saccard. He would willingly have allowed his ex-colleague a share, but he was irritated by the setting of this snare, by this pretension to make a dupe of him. On the other hand, he was not without his apprehensions. He knew the person that she had to deal with. He knew that he was quite capable of taking the documents to his brother, the minister, who would certainly have paid a price for them, so as to stifle any scandal. 
The devil, he muttered, sitting down in his turn. This is a nasty story. And can one see the scamp in question? I will have him sent for, said Larsenau. He lives close by in the Rue Jean Lantier. Ten minutes had not elapsed when a little young fellow with a squint, light hair, and a face covered with freckles stepped softly into the room, taking care that the door should not make a noise. He wore an old black frock coat, too large for him and horribly threadbare. He remained standing at a respectful distance, quietly looking at Saccard out of the corner of his eye. Larsonneau, who called him Baptistin, made him undergo an interrogatory to which he replied in monosyllables, without humbling himself the least in the world. Indeed, he accepted with the utmost indifference the epithets of thief, swindler, and scoundrel, which his master thought fit to adjoin to each of his questions. Saccard admired this wretched fellow's coolness. At one moment the expropriation agent sprang from his armchair as if to strike him, and he contented himself with retreating a step, squinting with still more humility. "'That will do. Leave him alone,' said the financier." And so, sir, you demand a hundred thousand francs for the papers? Yes, a hundred thousand francs, replied the young man. And he went off. Larsenot seemed unable to calm himself. What a blaggard, eh? he stammered. Did you see his underhand looks? Fellows of that stamp have a timid air, but they'd murder a man for twenty francs. Saccard, however, interrupted him, saying, Pooh! He isn't terrible. I think one will be able to arrange matters with him. I came to see you about a much more worrying affair. You were right in mistrusting my wife, my dear friend. Just fancy, she's going to sell her share of the property to Monsieur Hoffner. She needs money, she says. Her friend Suzanne must have influenced her. The other abruptly ceased despairing. He listened rather pale, readjusting his stick-up collar, which had become bent during his fit of anger. This sale, continued Saccar, means the ruin of our hopes. If Monsieur Hoffner becomes your fellow partner, not only will our profits be compromised, but I am dreadfully afraid that we shall find ourselves in a most disagreeable position towards that overscrupulous fellow who will want to go over the accounts. The expropriation agent began walking about with an agitated step, his patent leather boots creaking on the carpet. "'You see,' muttered he, "'in what a position one puts oneself to oblige people. "'But, my dear fellow, if I were in your place, "'I should absolutely prevent my wife from doing anything so foolish. "'I'd beat her sooner.' "'Ah, my friend,' said the financier with a wily smile, I have no more power over my wife than you seem to have over that blackguard of a Baptistin. Larsano stopped short in front of Saccar, who was still smiling, and gazed at him with a profound air. Then he resumed walking up and down, but with a slow, measured step. He approached a looking glass, pulled up the bow of his necktie, and then walked on again, regaining his elegant manner. And suddenly, Baptistin, he cried. The little young fellow who squinted came in, but by another door. He no longer carried his hat, but twisted a pen between his fingers. Go and fetch the ledger, said Larsenau to him. And when the clerk was no longer there, the agent discussed the sum that was to be given him. Do it for me, he ended by plainly saying. Thereupon, Saccard consented to give 30,000 francs out of the future profits of the Chiron affair. He considered that he still escaped cheaply from the usurer's gloved hand. The latter had the promise made out in his name, prolonging the comedy to the end and stating that he would be accountable to the young man for the 30,000 francs. It was with a laugh of relief that Saccard burnt the ledger page by page at the fire flaming in the grate. Then, this operation over, he exchanged vigorous handshakes with Larsenot and left him, saying, You're going to Laurel's this evening, aren't you? 
wait for me there. I shall have arranged everything with my wife. We will decide on our final plans. Laura Dorigny, who often moved, then resided in a large apartment on the Boulevard Haussmann, in front of the expiatory chapel. She had just fixed one day a week to be at home, like a lady of real society. It was a manner of assembling on the same occasion the men who saw her one by one during the week. Aristide Saccard triumphed on Tuesday evenings. He was the acknowledged protector, and he turned his head with a vague laugh whenever the mistress of the house betrayed him between two doors by giving one of the gentlemen an appointment for the same night. When he remained there, the last of the set, he lit another cigar, talked business, and joked about the gentleman who was dancing attendance in the street. Waiting until he left, then after calling Laura his dear child and giving her a little pat on the cheek, he quietly went off by one door while the gentleman came in by another. The secret treaty of alliance which had consolidated Saccard's credit and procured the Dorigny two sets of furniture in a month still continued to amuse them. But Laura wanted a finish to the comedy. This finish, a predetermined one, was to consist in a public rupture to the profit of some fool who would pay dearly for the right of being the serious protector known as such to all Paris. The fool was found. The Duc de Rosin, tired of uselessly boring the women of the same social standing as himself, dreamt of acquiring the reputation of a debauchee so as to lend some relief to his insipid personality. He was very assiduous of a Tuesday at homes of Laura, whom he had conquered by his absolute simplicity. Unfortunately, although 35 years old, he was still dependent upon his mother, to such a point that he could at the most dispose of merely 10 louis at a time. On the evenings, when Laura deigned to take his 10 louis, pitying herself, and talking of the 100,000 francs she needed, he sighed and promised her the amount on the day when he would be the master. It was then that she had the idea of putting him on friendly terms with Larsonneau, who was one of her good friends. The two men went to lunch together at Tortoni's, and at dessert, Larsonneau, while relating his amours with the delicious Spanish beauty, pretended that he knew some money lenders. But he strongly advised Rosanne never to let himself pass into their hands. This confidential announcement inflamed the Duke, who ended by wringing from his dear friend a promise that he would occupy himself about his little affair. He occupied himself about it so well that he was to bring the money on the very evening that Saccard was to meet him at Lars. When Larsenot arrived, the Dorigny's large white and gold drawing room only contained some five or six women who took hold of his hands and clung to his neck with a furious outburst of affection. They called him That Big Lar, a caressing nickname which Laura had invented. And he, in a fluty voice, exclaimed, There, that'll do, my little kittens, you'll crush my hat. They calmed down and gathered close around him on a couch, while he told them about an attack of indigestion which had befallen Sylvia, with whom he had supped the night before. Then, drawing a sweet meat box from the pocket of his dress coat, he offered them some burnt almonds. Meanwhile, Laura came out of her bedroom, and as several gentlemen arrived, she drew Larsenault into a boudoir situated at one end of a drawing room, from which it was separated by double hangings. Have you got the money? she asked him when they were alone. Larsenault, without replying, bowed in a jocular manner and tapped the inner pocket of his coat. Oh, you big lar, murmured the delighted young woman. She took him round the waist and kissed him. Wait a bit, she said. I want the flimsies. Rosanne is in my room. I'll go and fetch him. But he detained her, and in his turn kissing her shoulders. You know what commission I asked of you. Why, yes, you big stupid, it's agreed. She came back bringing Rosanne. 
Larsen always dressed more correctly than the Duke, with better fitting gloves and a more artistic bow to his necktie. They negligently touched hands and talked about the races of two days before, at which one of their friends had had a horse beaten. Laura stamped impatiently. "'Come, never mind all that, my darling,' said she to Rosanne. "'Big Lar has the money, you know. The affair had better be settled.' Larsano pretended to remember. "'Ah, yes, it's true,' he said. "'I have the amount. "'But how much better you would have done "'had you listened to me, my dear fellow. "'To think that these rogues demanded fifty percent of me. "'However, I agreed to it all the same "'as you told me that it didn't matter.' "'Lord Dorigny had procured some bill stamps during the day, "'but when it was a question of a pen and an inkstand, she looked at the two men with an air of consternation, doubting whether these objects would be found in the place. She wanted to go and look in the kitchen when Larsenot drew from his pocket, the pocket containing the sweetmeat box, two marvels, a silver pen holder which lengthened by means of a screw, and a steel and ebony inkstand of jewel-like finish and delicacy. And as Rosanne sat down, Draw the notes to my name, the agent said. I didn't wish to compromise you, you understand? We will arrange matters together. Six notes of 25,000 francs each, eh? Laura counted the flimsies on a corner of a table. Rosanne did not even see them. When he had signed and raised his head, they had already disappeared in the young woman's pocket. However, she came to him and kissed him on both cheeks, which appeared to delight him. Larsano looked at them philosophically while folding the promissory notes and replacing the inkstand and pen holder in his pocket. The young woman still had her arms round Rosanne's neck when Aristide Saccard raised the corner of a door hanging. Well, don't disturb yourselves, he said, laughing. The Duke blushed. But Laura went to shake the financier's hand, exchanging a wink of intelligence with him. She was radiant. This ends section 10. Section 11 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola Translated by Henry Visitelli this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Section 11 It's done, my dear, said she. I warned you of it. You're not too angry with me. Sakar shrugged his shoulders with a good-natured air. He pulled back the hanging, and drawing aside to allow Laura and Maduke to pass, he cried out in an usher's yelping voice, the Duke! The Duchess! This witticism met with tremendous success. On the morrow, the newspapers repeated it, plainly naming Laura d'Origny and designating the two men by extremely transparent initials. The rupture between Aristide Saccard and Fat Laura caused even more of a stir than their pretended amours had done. Saccard had let the door curtain fall again amid the burst of gaiety which his jocularity had occasioned in the drawing-room. "'Ah, what a good girl,' said he, turning towards Larsenot. "'She's vicious. It's you, you scamp, who no doubt profits by all this. What are you to have?' But the agent protested with smiles and pulled down his shirt-cuffs, which had caught up under the sleeves of his coat. At last he went and sat down near the door, on a couch to which Saccard motioned him. "'Come here. I don't want to confess you, Dash, at all. Let us now deal with serious matters, my dear fellow. I have had a long talk with my wife this evening. Everything is decided. "'She consents to cede her share in the property?' asked Larsenau. "'Yes, but it wasn't without trouble on my part.' Women are so obstinate. My wife, you know, had promised an old aunt not to sell the ground. There was no end to her scruples. Luckily, however, I had prepared quite a decisive story. 
He rose up to light a cigar at the candelabrum which Laura had left on the table, and returning and stretching himself languidly on the couch. I told my wife, he continued, that you were completely ruined. You gambled at the bourse, spent your money with harlots, dabbled in bad speculations. In fact, you were on the point of ending by a frightful bankruptcy. I even let it be understood that I did not consider you perfectly honest. Then I explained to her that the Sharon affair would be wrecked in your fall, and that the best course would be for her to accept the proposal you had made to me to disengage her, by buying her share for a crust of bread, it's true. It isn't an able story, muttered the expropriation agent. Do you fancy your wife will believe such trash? Sakar smiled. He was in a disposition to be communicative. You are simple, my dear fellow, he resumed. The basis of the story is of little consequence. The details, gestures, and tone of voice are everything. Call Rosanne, and I bet I will persuade him that it is broad daylight. My wife has scarcely any more brains than Rosanne. I let her have a glimpse of a precipice. She hasn't the least idea of the coming expropriation. As she was astonished that in the midst of a catastrophe you could think of taking a still heavier burden on your shoulders, I told her that no doubt she hampered you in dealing some ugly blow intended for your creditors. Finally, I advised the transaction as the only means of avoiding being mixed up in interminable lawsuits and of deriving some money from the ground. Larsenau still considered the story somewhat brutal. His method was less dramatic. Each of his operations was concocted and unraveled with the elegance of a drawing-room comedy. I should have imagined something different, he said. However, everyone, his own system. So all we have to do now is to pay. It is on this point, replied Sekar, that I want to make arrangements with you. Tomorrow I will take the deed of sale to my wife, and she will simply have to send you this deed to receive the stipulated amount. I prefer to avoid any interview. He had indeed never allowed Larsenau to visit them on a footing of intimacy. He did not invite him to his entertainments, and he accompanied him to Renée's on the days when it was absolutely necessary that they should meet. This had happened on three occasions at the utmost. He almost always transacted matters with the power of attorney from his wife, not wishing to let her see too closely into his affairs. He now opened his pocketbook, adding, Here are the 200,000 francs worth of bills accepted by my wife. You will give them her in payment, and you will add to them 100,000 francs, which I will bring you tomorrow morning. I'm bleeding myself, my dear friend. This business will cost me a fortune. But that will only make 300,000 francs, remarked the expropriation agent. Will the receipt be for that amount? A receipt for 300,000 francs, rejoined Sakar, laughing. Ah, in that case, we should be nicely placed later on. According to our inventories, the property must now be estimated at 2,500,000 francs. The receipt will naturally be for half that amount. Your wife will never sign it. Yes, she will. I tell you that it is all agreed. Why, dash it all. I told her that, that was your first condition. You present a pistol at our heads with your bankruptcy, do you understand? And it was for that reason that I appeared to doubt your honesty and accused you of wanting to dupe your creditors. Do you think my wife understands anything of all that? Larsenau shook his head, muttering, No matter, you ought to have devised something simpler. But my story is simplicity itself, said Sekar, very much astonished. How the devil do you find it complicated? He was not conscious of the incredible number of devices which he tacked on to the most ordinary transaction. He derived real enjoyment from the cock-and-bull story which he just told René, and what delighted him was the 
impudence of a lie, the piling up of impossibilities, the astonishing complicacy of the plot. He would long since have had the ground if he had not imagined all this drama, but he would have experienced less enjoyment had he obtained it easily. Besides, he displayed the utmost simplicity in making the Sharon speculation quite a financial melodrama. He rose up and, taking Larsonneau's arm, walked towards the drawing room. You have perfectly understood me, eh? he said. Content yourself with following my instructions, and you will applaud me later on. Do you know, my dear fellow, you do wrong to wear yellow gloves. They quite spoil your hands. The expropriation agent contented himself with smiling and murmuring. Oh, gloves have their value, dear master. One can touch anything without dirtying oneself. As they returned into the drawing room, Saccard was surprised and somewhat alarmed to find Maxime on the other side of the door curtains. He was seated on a couch beside a fair-haired woman who was telling him, in a monotonous voice, a long story, no doubt her own. The young fellow had, in point of fact, overheard the conversation between his father and Larsenault. The two accomplices seemed to him to be a pair of sharp blades. Still vexed by René's betrayal, he tasted a cowardly enjoyment in learning the theft of which she was about to be the victim. It avenged him a little. His father came and shook his hand with a suspicious air, but Maxime, showing him the fair-haired woman, whispered in his ear, "'She isn't bad-looking, is she? I mean to have her this evening.' Thereupon Saccard attitudinized and showed himself gallant. Laura Dorigny came and joined them for a moment. She complained that Maxime scarcely paid her one visit a month, but he pretended that he'd been very much occupied, which statement made everybody laugh. He added that in future he should be here, there, and everywhere. "'I have written a tragedy,' said he, "'and I only hit on the fifth act last night. "'I now mean to rest myself at the abodes of all the pretty women in Paris.' He laughed and enjoyed his illusions, which he alone could understand. However, the only other persons now remaining in the drawing room were Rosanne and Larsenault on either corner of the mantelpiece. The Saccars rose up, as well as the fair-haired woman who lived in the house. But Dorigny then went to speak in a low tone to the Duke. He seemed surprised and vexed, seeing that he did not make up his mind to leave his armchair. No, really, not this evening, she said in an undertone. I have a headache. Tomorrow evening, I promise you. Rosanne had to obey. Laura waited till he was on the landing and then said quickly in Larsonneau's ear, Eh, Biglar, I keep my word. Shove him into his carriage. And when the fair-haired woman took leave of the gentleman to return to her rooms on the floor above, Saccard was surprised that Maxime did not follow her. Well, he asked him. Well, no, replied the young fellow. I've reflected. And he had an idea which he thought a very funny one. I abandon my rights to you, if you like. Make haste. She hasn't yet shut her door. But his father gently shrugged his shoulders, saying, Thanks, youngster. I have something better than that for the time being. The four men went down. Outside, the Duke absolutely wished to take Larsenault with him in his carriage. His mother lived in the Marais, and he would have dropped the expropriation agent at his door in the Rue de Rivoli. The latter refused, however, shut the carriage door himself, and told the coachman to drive off and he then lingered on the sidewalk of the boulevard Haussmann, talking with the two others instead of going away. "'Ah, poor Rosanne,' said Saccard, who suddenly understood the truth. Larsenot swore that it was not so, that he didn't care a fig for all that, that he was a practical man. And as the other two continued joking, and the cold was very keen, he finished by exclaiming, "'Pon my word, so much the worse!' I'm going to ring. 
You are indiscreet, gentlemen. Good night, called Maxime as the door closed again. And taking his father's arm, he went up the boulevard with him. It was one of those clear, frosty nights when it is so agreeable to walk on the hard ground in the icy atmosphere. Zakhar remarked that L'Arsenault was wrong, that it was preferable to be simply Vadorini's comrade. He started from this point to declare that the love of these women was really pernicious. He showed himself moral and hit upon sentences and advice of astonishing wisdom. "'You see,' said he to his son, "'all that only lasts for a time, my good fellow. A man loses his health at it and doesn't taste real happiness. You know that I'm not a Puritan. All the same, I've had quite enough of it. I'm going to settle down.' Maxime chuckled. He stopped his father and gazed at him by the moonlight, declaring that he had a fine head. But Sakar became still more grave. Joke as much as you like. I repeat to you, but there is nothing like married life to preserve a man and make him happy. Thereupon he spoke of Louise, and he began walking more slowly so as to settle that matter. He said, since they were talking of it, everything was fully arranged. He even informed Maxime that he and Monsieur de Marais had fixed the signing of the contract for the Sunday following the mid-Lent Thursday. On that Thursday there was to be a grand party at the mansion in the Parc Monceau, and he could profit by the occasion to make a public announcement of the marriage. Maxime considered all this to be very satisfactory. He'd rid himself of René, he saw no more obstacles, and he surrendered himself to his father, as he had surrendered himself to his stepmother. "'Well, it's understood,' said he. "'Only don't talk about it to René. Her friends would twit and tease me, and I prefer that they should know the news at the same time as everyone else.' Sakar promised him to keep silent. Then, as they approached the top of the boulevard Malzerbe, he again gave him a quantity of excellent advice. He told him how he ought to act to make his home a paradise. "'Above everything, never break off with your wife. It's folly. A wife with whom you no longer have connection costs you a fortune. In the first place, a man has to pay some harlot, hasn't he? Then the expenditure is much greater at home.' There are dresses, madame's private pleasures, her dear friends, the devil and all his train. He was in a moment of extraordinary virtue. The success of his Sharon affair had set idyllic tenderness in his heart. I, he continued, was born to live happy and ignored in the depths of some village with all my family round me. People don't know me, my little fellow. I seem to be very flighty. But in reality, not at all. I should adore remaining near my wife. I would willingly abandon my affairs for a modest income which would enable me to retire to Plassans. You are about to become rich. Make yourself a home with Louise in which you will live like two turtle doves. It's so nice. I will go to see you. It will do me good. He ended by having sobs in his voice. Meanwhile, they'd reached the iron gate of the mansion and stood talking on the curb of the sidewalk. A sharp northeast wind swept over these Parisian heights. Not a sound arose in the pale night, white with frost. Maxime, surprised by his father's sentimentality, had for a moment past had a question on his lips. But you, he said at last, it seems to me... What? As regards your wife. Sakar shrugged his shoulders. Eh, quite so. I was a fool. That's why I speak to you by experience. However, we have become husband and wife again. Oh, quite so. It happened nearly six weeks ago. I go and join her of an evening when I don't return home too late. Tonight, however, the poor ducky must dispense with me. I have to work till daylight. She has such an awfully fine figure. As Maxime held out his hand to his father, the latter detained him and added in a lower key, in a confidential tone, 
You know Blanche Muller's figure? Well, it's that, but ten times more supple. And such hips. They have a curve, a delicacy. And then he concluded by saying to the young fellow who was going off, You are like me. You have a heart. Your wife will be happy. Goodbye, youngster. When Maxime had at last rid himself of his father, he went rapidly round the park. What he had just heard surprised him so much that he experienced an irresistible desire to see René. He wished to ask her forgiveness for his brutality, to find out why she had lied to him in naming Monsieur de Saffre, and to learn the story of her husband's tenderness. He thought of all this confusedly, however, with but the one distinct wish to smoke a cigar in her room and renew their comradeship. Providing she were well disposed, he would even announce his marriage to her, so as to make her understand that their amours must remain dead and buried. When he'd opened the little door, the key of which he had fortunately retained, he ended by saying to himself that, after his father's confidential revelations, his visit was necessary and quite proper. In the conservatory, he whistled as he'd done the night before, but he did not have to wait. René came to open the glass door of a little drawing room and went upstairs before him without speaking a word. She still wore a dress of white tulle forming puffs and covered with satin bows. The tails of a satin body were edged with a broad band of white jet, while the light of a candelabra tinged with blue and pink. When Maxime looked at her upstairs, he was touched by her pallor and the deep emotion which deprived her of her voice. She could not have been expecting him. She still quivered all over at seeing him arrive as quietly as usual, with his coaxing air. Celeste returned from the wardrobe, where she'd gone to fetch a nightgown, and the lovers remained silent, deferring their explanation until the girl had withdrawn. As a rule, they did not inconvenience themselves in her presence, but the things which they felt upon their lips filled them with a kind of shame. René would have Celeste undress her in the bedroom, where there was a large fire. The chambermaid removed the pins, took off each article of finery one by one, without hurrying herself. And Maxine, feeling bored, mechanically took up the chemise which was lying on a chair beside him, and warmed it in front of the flames, leaning forward with his arms apart. It was he who used to render René this little service in happy times, and she felt moved when she saw him delicately holding the gown to the fire. Then, as Celeste showed no signs of finishing, the young fellow asked, "'Did you enjoy yourself at the ball?' "'Oh, no, it's always the same thing, you know,' answered René. A great deal too many people, a perfect crush. Maxime turned the nightgown, which was now warm on one side. What did Adeline wear? he asked. A mauve dress, rather awkwardly devised, although she is short, she's mad on flounces. They then talked about the other women. Maxime was now burning his fingers with the gown. But you will scorch it, said René, whose voice was maternally caressing. Celeste took the gown from the young fellow's hands. He rose up and went to look at the large pink and gray bed, fixing his eyes upon one of the bouquets embroidered on the curtains so as to be able to turn his head and not see René's bare bosom. It was instinctive. He no longer considered himself her lover, so he no longer had the right to look. Then he drew a cigar from his pocket and lighted it. René had given him permission to smoke in her apartments. At last Celeste retired, leaving the young woman by the fireside, quite white in her night attire. Maxime walked about for a few moments longer, silent, and looking out of the corner of his eye at René, who seemed to be again seized with a shudder. Then stationing himself in front of the mantelpiece with his cigar between his teeth, he asked in a curt voice, Why didn't you tell me that it was my father who was with you last night? She raised her head, 
her eyes dilated with supreme anguish. Then a rush of blood crimsoned her face, and overwhelmed with shame, she hid it with her hands and stammered, You know that? You know that? Regaining her self-possession, she tried to lie. It's not true. Who told it you? Maxime shrugged his shoulders. Why, my father himself, who considers you nicely formed and talked to me about your hips. He had allowed a little vexation to show itself while saying this. But he now began walking about again, continuing in a chiding but friendly voice between two puffs of smoke. Really now, I don't understand you. You are a singular woman. It was your fault if I was rude yesterday. If you had told me that it was my father, I should have gone off quietly, you understand? I have no right. But you go in name Monsieur de Safre to me. She was sobbing with her hands over her face. He drew near, knelt down before her, and forcibly drew her hands aside. Come, tell me why you named Monsieur de Safre, he said. Then, still averting her head, she answered in a low tone amid her tears, I thought that you would leave me if you knew that your father... He rose to his feet, took up his cigar which he had laid on a corner of the mantel shelf, and contented himself with muttering, You are very funny, really. She no longer cried. The flames of the grate and the fire of her cheeks were drying her tears. Her astonishment at seeing Maxime so calm in presence of a revelation which she had thought was bound to crush him made her forget her shame. She looked at him as he walked about. She listened to him speaking as if she had been in a dream. Without abandoning his cigar, he repeated to her that she was unreasonable, that it was quite natural she'd have connection with her husband and that he really could not think of resenting it but to go and confess that she had a lover when it was not true. And he constantly returned to that point, which he could not understand and which seemed really monstrous to him. He talked about women's mad imaginations. You are a little bit cracked, my dear, he said. You must take care. Then he ended by asking inquisitively, But why Monsieur de Safre rather than anyone else? He courts me, said René. Maxime restrained an impertinent remark. He'd been on the point of saying that she had fancied herself a month older on owning that Monsieur de Safre was her lover. However, he merely gave expression to the evil smile which this spiteful idea prompted, and throwing his cigar into the fire, he went and sat down on the other side of the mantel shelf. There he talked reason and gave René to understand that they ought to remain good friends. The young woman's fixed gaze certainly embarrassed him somewhat. He did not dare to announce his marriage to her. She contemplated him for a long time, her eyes still swollen by her tears. She found him petty, narrow-minded, despicable. But she still loved him with the same tenderness that she felt for her lace. He looked pretty in the light of the candelabra placed on the corner of the mantel shelf beside him. As he threw his head back, the light of the candles gilded his hair and glided over his face amid the soft down of his cheeks, with a charming, orient effect. All the same, I must be off, said he several times. He had quite decided not to stop. Besides, René would not have allowed it. They both thought it and said it. They were now nothing more than two friends. When Maxime had at last pressed the young woman's hand and was on the point of leaving the room, she detained him for another moment by speaking to him about his father, upon whom she bestowed great praise. You see, I felt too much remorse, she said. I prefer that this should have happened. You don't know your father. I was astonished to find him so kind, so disinterested. The poor fellow had such great worries just now. Maxime looked at the tips of his boots without replying, and with an embarrassed air. She dwelt on the subject. 
As long as he did not come into this room, it was all the same to me. But afterwards, when I saw him here so affectionate, bringing me money which he must have picked up in all the corners of Paris, ruining himself for me without a murmur, I felt ill. If you knew how carefully he has watched over my interests. The young fellow returned softly to the mantelpiece and leant against it. He remained embarrassed, with bowed head and a smile gradually rising to his lips. Yes, muttered he, my father is very skillful in watching over people's interests. His tone of voice astonished René. She looked at him, and he, as if to defend himself, added, Oh, I know nothing. I only say that my father is a skillful man. You would do wrong to speak ill of him, she rejoined. You must judge him rather superficially. If I acquainted you with all his worries, if I repeated to you what he confided to me again this evening, you would see how mistaken people are when they think he cares for money. Maxime could not restrain a shrug of the shoulders. He interrupted his stepmother with an ironical laugh. Ah, I know him. I know him well, he said. He must have told you some very pretty things. Relate them to me. This tone of raillery wounded her. She then enlarged upon her praises. She considered her husband quite a great man. She talked about the Charon affair that piece of jobbery of which he'd understood nothing, as about a catastrophe in which Saccar's intelligence and kindness had been revealed to her. She added that she should sign the deed of session on the morrow, and that if this affair were really a disaster, she accepted it in punishment for her sins. Maxime let her go on, sneering, and looking at her slyly. Then he said in an undertone, That's it. That's just it. And raising his voice and settling his hand on René's shoulder. Thanks, my dear, but I already know the story. You are of nice composition. He again seemed to be on the point of leaving, but he felt a furious itching to tell René everything. She had exasperated him with her praises of her husband and he forgot that he promised himself not to speak so as to avoid anything disagreeable. What? What do you mean? she asked. Why, that my father has done you in the prettiest way in the world. I really pity you. You are too much of a simpleton. And he then, cowardly, craftily related to her what he'd heard at Laura's tasting its secret delight in descending into these infamies. It seemed to him that he was taking his revenge for a vague insult which someone had just addressed to him. With his harlot's temperament, he lingered beatifically over this denunciation, over this cruel chatter of what he'd overheard behind a door. He spared René nothing, neither the money which her husband had lent her usuriously, nor that which he meant to steal from her with the help of ridiculous stories fit to send children to sleep. The young woman listened to him, very pale and with clenched teeth. Standing in front of a chimney piece, she slightly lowered her head and looked at the fire. Her nightdress, the gown of which Maxime had warmed, spread out, revealing the motionless statue-like whiteness of her limbs. I tell you all this, continued the young man, so that you may not seem to be a fool. But you would do wrong to get angry with my father. He isn't wicked. He has his failings like everyone. Till tomorrow, eh? He still advanced towards the door. But René stopped him with a sudden gesture. Stay, she cried imperiously. And taking hold of him, Drawing him to her, almost seating him on her knees in front of the fire, she kissed him on the lips, saying, Ah, well, it would be too stupid to put ourselves to inconvenience now. Don't you know that my head has no longer seemed to belong to me since yesterday, since you wanted to break off? I am like an idiot. At the ball tonight I had a fog before my eyes. 
It is because I cannot now live quite without you. When you leave me, I shall be done for. Don't laugh. I tell you what I feel. She looked at him with infinite tenderness, as if she'd not seen him for a long time. You found the word, she continued. I was a simpleton. Your father would have made me see stars in broad daylight. Did I know anything about it? While he was telling me his story, I only heard a loud buzzing, and I was so crushed that, if he had chosen, he could have made me go down on my knees to sign his papers. And I fancied to myself that I felt remorseful. I was really as stupid as that. She burst out laughing, and gleams of folly shone in her eyes. Pressing her lover still more tightly, she went on. Do we sin, we two? We love each other. We amuse ourselves as it pleases us. Everyone has come to that, eh? You see your father doesn't put himself out. He likes money, and he takes it wherever he finds it. He's right. It sets me at my ease. In the first place, I shan't sign anything, and then you will come here every evening. I was afraid that you wouldn't, you know, on account of what I told you. But as you don't mind it. Besides, I shall close my door to him now, you understand? She rose up and lighted the nightlight. Maxime hesitated in despair. He realized what a piece of folly he had perpetrated, and he harshly reproached himself for having said too much. How could he announce his marriage now? It was his fault. The rupture had been accomplished. There had been no need for him to go up into that room again, or especially to prove to the young woman that her husband deceived her. Maxime's anger with himself was increased, as he no longer knew what feeling he had first obeyed. But if for a moment he thought of being brutal a second time, of going away, the sight of Renée, who was letting her slippers fall, lent him invincible cowardice. He felt frightened. He remained. On the morrow, when Saccard came to his wife's apartment to make her sign the deed of session, she quietly answered him that she should not do so, that she had reflected. She did not, however, allow herself even an allusion to the truth. She had sworn that she would be discreet, for she did not want to create worries for herself, but rather wished to taste the renewal of her amours in peace. The Sharon affair would finish as it could. Her refusal to sign was merely an act of vengeance. She did not care a fig for the rest. Saccard was on the point of flying into a passion. All his dream crumbled. His other affairs were going from bad to worse. He found himself at the end of his resources and merely sustained himself by performing miraculous feats of equilibrity. That very morning he'd been unable to pay his baker's bill. This did not prevent him, however, from preparing a splendid entertainment for the mid-Lent Thursday. In presence of René's refusal, he experienced the white rage of a vigorous man impeded in his work by a child's whim. With the deed of session once in his pocket, he had relied upon raising funds pending the award of the indemnity. When he had slightly calmed down and his intelligence had become clear again, his wife's sudden change astonished him. She must undoubtedly have been advised. He scented a lover. This was so clear a presentiment that he hastened to his sister to question her to ask her if she did not know anything about René's private life. Sidonie showed herself very bitter. She had not forgotten her sister-in-law for the affront she'd given her by refusing to see Monsieur de Saffre. So when, by her brother's question, she understood that the latter accused his wife of having a lover, she cried out that she was certain of it. And of her own accord she offered to spy upon the turtle doves. In that way, the haughty thing would see who it was she had to deal with. Saccard did not habitually seek after disagreeable truths. His interest alone compelled him to open his eyes, which, as a rule, he wisely kept closed. He accepted his sister's offer. 
Oh, be easy. I shall learn everything, she said to him in a voice full of compassion. Ah, my poor brother, Angel would never have betrayed you. So good, so generous a husband. These Parisian dolls have no hearts. And to think that I never cease giving her good advice. This ends section 11. Section 12 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola Translated by Henry Vizitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder Section 12 There was a fancy dress ball at the Saccards on the Midland Thursday. The great curiosity, however, was the poem of the Amours of Handsome Narcissus and the Nymph Echo in three tableaux, which the ladies were to perform. For more than a month, the author of this poem, Monsieur Huppel de la Noue, had been traveling from his prefecture to the mansion of the Parc Monceau, so as to superintend the rehearsals and give his opinion on the costumes. He had at first thought of writing his work in verse, but later on he had decided in favor of tableau vivant. It was more noble, he said, nearer to antique beauty. The ladies no longer slept. Some of them changed their costumes no fewer than three times. There were some interminable conferences over which the prefect presided. The personage of Narcissus was at first discussed at length. Should a man or a woman personate him? At last, at the instance of Verne, it was decided that the part should be confided to Maxime, but he was to be the only man in the tableau. And indeed, Madame de Laurence declared that she would never have consented to it if little Maxime had not been so like a real girl. Verne was to be the nymph Echo. The question of the costumes was far more complicated. Maxime gave a good lift up to the prefect, who was quite tired out amid nine women, whose mad imaginations threatened to grievously impair his conception's purity of lines. If he had listened to them, his Olympus would have worn powder. Madame d'Espanay absolutely wished to dress with a long skirt to hide her somewhat large feet, while Madame Hoffner dreamt of dressing herself in a wild beast's skin. Monsieur Huppel de la Noue was energetic, and he even turned angry on one occasion. He was convinced, and he said that if he had renounced versification, it was to write his poem in cleverly combined stuffs and attitudes selected among the best. The harmony, ladies, repeated he at each fresh exigency, you forget the harmony. I can't, however, sacrifice the entire work to the flounces you ask me for. The conferences took place in the buttercup drawing room. Entire afternoons were spent there, deciding on the cut of a skirt. Worms were summoned several times. At last, everything was settled. The costumes decided on, the positions learnt and Monsieur Huppel de la Noue declared himself satisfied. The election of Monsieur de Marais had given him less trouble. The performance of The Amours of Handsome Narcissus and the Nymph Echo was to begin at eleven o'clock. The large drawing-room was already full at half-past ten, and as there was to be a ball afterwards, the ladies were there in costumes, seated in armchairs, ranged in a semicircle in front of the improvised stage. A platform, hidden by two broad curtains of red velvet with golden fringe, running on iron rods. The gentlemen stood behind, or moved to and fro. At ten o'clock the upholsterers had struck the last nails home. The platform rose up at the end of a drawing room, occupying a portion of this long gallery. Access to the stage was obtained by the smoking room, converted into a green room for the artistes. In addition, the ladies had at their disposal several apartments on the first floor, 
where an army of maids prepared the costumes of a different tableau. It was half past eleven, and the curtains were not yet drawn aside. A loud buzz filled the drawing room. The rows of armchairs were occupied by a most astonishing crowd of marchionesses, noble dames, milkmaids, Spanish beauties, shepherdesses, and sultanas, while the compact mass of dress coats set a large dark stain beside the glistening of light stuffs and bare shoulders, glowing with the bright sparkle of jewelry. The women alone were in costume. It was already warm. The three chandeliers lit up the golden sheen of a drawing room. At last, Monsieur Upel de la Noue was seen to emerge from an opening on the left-hand side of the platform. He had been assisting the lady since eight o'clock in the evening. His dress coat bore on the left sleeve the mark of three white fingers, a woman's little hand which had rested there after dabbling in a box of rice powder. But the prefect had something else than the mishaps of his attire to think about. He had huge eyes and a swollen and somewhat pale face. He did not seem to see anyone. And advancing towards Sekhar, whom he recognized among a group of grave-looking men, he said to him in an undertone, "'Dash it all, your wife has lost her girdle of foliage. We are in a pretty pickle.' He swore and felt inclined to beat the people around him. Then, without waiting for a reply, without looking at anything, he turned his back, plunged under the draperies again, and disappeared. The singular apparition of this gentleman made the ladies smile. The group amid which Sakhar found himself had gathered behind the last row of seats. One armchair had even been drawn out of the row for Baron Gouraud, whose legs had for some time begun to swell. Monsieur Toutain Laroche, whom the Emperor had just raised to the Senate, was there with Monsieur de Mareuil, whose second election the Chamber had deigned to accept, and Monsieur Michelin, decorated the day before, and a little in the rear were Mignon and Charrier, one of whom had a large diamond on his cravat, while the other displayed a still larger one on his finger. The gentlemen chatted together. Sakar left them for a moment to go and exchange a few words with his sister, who had just come in and seated herself between Louise de Mareuil and Madame Michelin. Madame Sidonie was dressed as a sorceress. Louise jauntily wore a page's costume, which gave the air of an urchin, Little Michelin, made up as an alm, smiled in a lovesick manner amid her veils embroidered with golden threads. "'Do you know anything?' Sackard softly asked his sister. "'No, nothing as yet,' she replied. "'But the swain must be here. I'll catch them tonight, you may be sure. Inform me at once, eh?' And then Sackard, turning to the right and to the left, complimented Louise and Madame Michelin. He compared the latter to one of Mohammed's Uris, and the former to Mignon of Henri Trois. His Provençal accent seemed to make the whole of his spare strident figure sing with delight. When he returned to the group of grave-looking men, Monsieur de Marais drew him on one side and spoke to him about the marriage of their children. Nothing was altered. The contract was still to be signed on the following Sunday. Quite so, said Sakard. I even mean to announce the marriage to our friends this evening, if you see no impediment. I am only waiting for my brother, the minister, who's promised to come. The new deputy was delighted. However, Monsieur Toutain Laroche was raising his voice as if he were a prey to lively indignation. Yes, gentlemen, he was saying to Monsieur Michelin and the two contractors who drew nearer. I was simple enough to let my name be mixed up in such an affair. And as Sakar and de Marais joined the group, he added, I was telling the gentlemen about the deplorable adventure of the Société Générale of the ports of Morocco. You know, Sakar. The latter did not flinch. The company in question had just collapsed amid a frightful scandal. Over-inquisitive shareholders had wished to know what progress had been made with the establishment of the famous commercial stations on the shores of the Mediterranean, 
and a judicial inquiry had demonstrated that the ports of Morocco only existed on the plans of the engineers, very handsome plans, hung on the walls of the company's offices. Since then, Monsieur Toutain Laroche cried out even louder than the shareholders, growing indignant and demanding that his name should be restored to him spotless. And he made so much noise that the government, to calm and rehabilitate this useful man in the eye of public opinion, had decided to send him to the Senate. It was thus that he fished up the much-coveted seat in an affair which had almost brought him to the police court. "'You are really too good to occupy yourself about that,' said Sicard. "'You can show your great work, the Crédit Viticole, an establishment which has come victorious out of every crisis.' Yes, murmured de Marais, that is an answer to everything. Indeed, the Crédit Viticole had just emerged from great and skillfully concealed embarrassments. A minister who was very kindly disposed towards this financial institution, which held the city of Paris by the throat, had brought about a rise on change, which Monsieur Toutain Laroche had turned to advantage marvelously well. Nothing titillated him more than the praise bestowed on the prosperity of the Crédit Viticole. He usually provoked it. He thanked Monsieur de Marais with a glance, and, leaning towards Baron Gouraud, on whose armchair he was familiarly leaning, he asked him, "'You are all right? You are not too warm?' The Baron gave a slight grunt. He is breaking up. He breaks up more every day, added Monsieur Toutain Laroche, turning towards the other gentleman. Monsieur Michelin smiled, and from time to time gently lowered his eyelids to look at his red ribbon. Mignon and Charrier, firmly planted on their large feet, seemed much more at ease in their dress coats since they wore diamonds. However, it was nearly midnight, and the assemblage was growing impatient. It did not venture to murmur, but the fans fluttered more nervously, and the noise of conversation increased. At length, Monsieur Huppel de la Noue reappeared. He had just passed one shoulder through the narrow opening when he perceived Madame d'Espanay at length mounting onto the stage. The other ladies already in position for the first tableau had only been waiting for her. The prefect turned round, showing the spectators his back, and he could be seen talking with the marchioness whom the curtains concealed. He lowered his voice, and making complimentary gestures with the tips of his fingers, said, "'My congratulations, marchioness. Your costume is delicious.' "'I have a much prettier one underneath,' cavalierly rejoined the young woman, who laughed in his face." So funny did she find him buried in this manner among the draperies. The audacity of his witticism momentarily astonished the gallant Monsieur Huppel de la Noue, but he recovered himself and enjoying the repartee more and more as he gradually fathomed its depths. Ah, charming, charming, he murmured with a delighted air. He let the corner of the curtain fall and went to join the group of grave-looking men, wishing to enjoy his work. He was no longer the scared man running after the nymph Echo's girdle of foliage. He was radiant and panting, wiping his forehead. He still had the little white hand marked on the sleeve of his coat, and in addition the glove of his right hand was stained with red at the tip of the thumb. He had no doubt dipped his thumb into one of a lady's pots of color. He smiled, fanned himself with his handkerchief, and stammered, "'She is adorable, lavishing, stupefying.' "'Who?' asked Sicard. "'The marchioness. Fancy, she just said to me.' And he repeated the witticism. It was considered extremely smart. The gentlemen repeated it to one another. Even worthy Monsieur Hoffner, who had approached, could not prevent himself from applauding. However, a piano which few people had seen began to play a waltz. There was then deep silence. The waltz had a capricious, interminable roll, and a very soft phrase ever ascended the keyboard, finishing in a nightingale's trill. Then deeper notes resounded more slowly. It was a very voluptuous, 
The lady smiled with her head slightly inclined. The piano had, however, suddenly put a stop to Monsieur Huppel de la Noue's gaiety. He looked at the red velvet curtains with an anxious air. He said to himself that he ought to have placed Madame d'Espanay in position as he'd placed the others. The curtains slowly opened. The piano again began the sensual waltz in a minor key. A murmur sped through the drawing room. The ladies leaned forward. The gentlemen stretched out their necks, whilst admiration displayed itself here and there by a remark, made in too loud a voice, by a spontaneous sigh or a stifled laugh. This lasted for five long minutes beneath the blaze of the three chandeliers. Monsieur Huppel de la Noue, now reassured, smiled beatifically at his poem. He could not resist the temptation of repeating to the people around him what he had already been saying for a month past. I thought of doing it in verse, but the lines are more noble, eh? Then, while the waltz came and went in an endless lullaby, he gave some explanations. Mignon and Charrier had drawn near and were listening attentively. You know the subject, of course. Handsome Narcissus, son of the river Cephis and the nymph Lyriope, scorns the love of the nymph Echo, Echo belonging to the suite of Juno, whom she amused with her speeches while Jupiter visited the world. Echo, daughter of the air and the earth, as you know. And he went into transports over the poetry of mythology. And in a more confidential tone, I thought I might give rein to my imagination. The nymph Echo leads handsome Narcissus before Venus in a marine grotto so that the goddess may inflame him with her fire. But the goddess remains powerless. The young man indicates by his attitude that he is not touched. The explanation was not out of place, for few of the spectators in the drawing room understood the real meaning of the groups. When the prefect had named the personages in an undertone, the admiration increased. Mignon and Charrier continued staring with wide open eyes. They had not understood. A grotto was shown on the platform between the red velvet curtains. The scenery was formed of silk with large irregular plates imitating rocky and fractuosities on which shells, fish, and large sea plants were painted. The broken ground rose up like a hillock, covered with the same silk on which the scene painter had depicted fine sand constellated with pearls and silver spangles. It was a fitting retreat for a goddess. On the summit of the hillock stood Madame de Laurens figuring, Venus, somewhat stout, wearing her pink tights with the dignity of a Duchess of Olympus. She depicted the sovereign of love with large, severe, all-devouring eyes. Behind her, showing merely her malicious face, her wings and quiver, little Madame d'Aste lent her smile to that amiable personage, Cupid. Then, on one side of the hillock, the three graces, Madame de Gwynne, Tessier, and de Meinhold, all in muslin, smiled and entwined each other as in Pradier's group while on the other side the Marchioness d'Espanay and Madame Hoffner, enveloped in the same flow of lace, their arms round each other's waists and their hair mingled, lent something suggestive to the tableau, a souvenir of Lesbos, which Monsieur Huppel de la Noue explained in a lower voice, and for the gentleman only, saying that he had wished by this to show the full extent of the power of Venus. Below the mound, the Countess Vanska, personated voluptuousness. She stretched herself out, twisted by a last spasm, with her eyes half closed and languishing, as if weary. Very dark, she had unloosened her black hair, and her tunic, spotted with tawny flames, was cut so as to allow glimpses of her glowing skin. The scale of color which the costumes furnished, from the snowy whiteness of Venus's veil to the dark red of voluptuousness's tunic, was soft generally pink and of a fleshy tinge. And under the electric ray, ingeniously cast upon the stage from one of the garden windows, the gauze, the lace, 
All the light transparent stuffs mingled so well with the shoulders and the lights that these pinky whitenesses seemed alive, and one no longer knew whether the ladies had not carried plastic accuracy to the point of stripping themselves naked. This was but the apotheosis. The drama was enacted in the foreground. On the left side, Renée, the nymph Echo, stretched out her arms towards the great goddess, her head half turned in supplicating fashion in the direction of Narcissus, as if to invite him to look at Venus, the mere sight of whom kindles terrible fires. But Narcissus, on the right, made a gesture of refusal, hid his eyes with his hand and remained icily cold. The costumes of these two personages, especially it cost M. Huppel de Noinu's imagination infinite trouble. Narcissus, as a wandering demigod of the forests, wore the attire of an ideal huntsman. Greenish tights, a short, close-fitting jacket, and a branch of oak in his hair. The dress of the nymph Echo was a complete allegory in itself alone. It partook of the high trees and lofty mountains, of the resounding spots where the voices of the earth and air applied to each other. It was a rock by the white satin of the skirt, a thicket by the foliage of the girdle, a pure sky by the cloud of blue gauze forming the body. And the groups retained the stillness of statues. The carnal note of Olympus resounded in the blaze of the broad ray, while the piano continued its complaint of acute love. It was generally considered that Maxime was admirably formed. In making his gesture of refusal, he developed his left hip, which was much remarked. But all the praises were for René's expression of face. As M. Huppel de la Noue remarked, it typified the pangs of unsatisfied desire. Her face wore an acute smile which tried to become humble. She begged her prey with the supplication of a hungry she-wolf who half hides her teeth. The first tableau went off very well, save that the madcap of an Adeline moved, and only with difficulty restrained an intense desire to laugh. At last the curtains closed again, and the piano became silent. Then the audience applauded discreetly, and the conversation was resumed. A great breath of love, of restrained desire, had come from the nudities of the platform and darted about the drawing-room where the women leaned more languidly on their seats, while the men spoke in low voices in each other's ears and smiled. There was a whispering as in an alcove, a semi-silence as suited to good society, a longing for voluptuousness barely expressed by a quiver of lips and in the mute looks exchanged amid this well-mannered delight, there was the brutal boldness of love offered and accepted with a glance. There was no end to the judgments passed on the perfections of the ladies. Their costumes acquired almost as great importance as their shoulders. When Mignon and Charrier wished to question Monsieur Huppel de Lanou, they were greatly surprised to see him no longer beside them. He had already plunged behind the platform again. "'I was telling you then, my beauty,' said Madame Sidonie, resuming a conversation which the first tableau had interrupted, "'that I had received a letter from London, you know, about the affair of the three milliards. The person whom I had charged to make inquiries writes to me that she thinks she has discovered the banker's receipt. England must have paid in that case.' It has made me feel ill all day. She was indeed more yellow than usual in her sorceress's robe dotted with stars. And as Madame Michelin did not listen to her, she continued in a lower voice, muttering that it was impossible that England could have paid, and that she should decidedly go to London herself. Narcissa's costume is very pretty, isn't it? said Louise to Madame Michelin. The latter smiled. She looked at Baron Gouraud, who seemed quite cheerful again in his armchair. Madame Sidonie, perceiving the direction of her glance, leant forward and whispered in her ear, so that the child might not hear. "'Has he kept his engagement?' 
Yes, replied the young woman, languishing, playing the part of an almay delightfully. I have chosen the house at Louvre-Sienne, and I have received the title deeds of it from his man of business. But we have broken off. I no longer see him. Louise had particularly sharp ears to catch what one wanted to hide from her. She looked at Baron Gouraud with a page's boldness and said quietly to Madame Michelin, Don't you think that the Baron is frightful? Then, bursting out laughing, she added, I say, he ought to have been entrusted with a part of Narcissus. He would be delicious in apple-green tights. The sight of Venus, of this voluptuous corner of Olympus, had indeed revived the old senator. He rolled his eyes with delight and turned half round to compliment Saccard. Amid the buzz which filled the drawing-room, the group of grave-looking men continued talking business and politics. Monsieur Hoffner said that he had just been named president of a jury charged with settling questions of indemnities. Then the conversation turned upon the works of Paris, on the Boulevard du Prince Eugène, of which the public was beginning to talk seriously. Saccard seized the opportunity and spoke of a person he knew, a proprietor who would no doubt be expropriated. The baron softly wagged his head. Monsieur Toutain Laroche went so far as to declare that there was nothing so disagreeable as to be expropriated. Monsieur Michelin assented and squinted still more in looking at his decoration. The indemnities can never be too high, sententiously concluded Monsieur de Mareuil, who wished to please Saccard. They had understood each other, but Minon and Charrier now brought their private affairs forward. They meant to retire soon, no doubt to Langres, they said, keeping an occasional lodging in Paris. They made the gentlemen smile when they related that after completing the building of their magnificent mansion on the boulevard Malzerbe, they had found it so handsome that they not been able to resist the desire to sell it. Their diamonds must have been a consolation which they'd offered themselves. Saccard laughed with a bad grace. His old partners had just realized enormous profits from an affair in which he had played the part of a dupe. And as the interval between the tableau grew longer, phrases of praise about Venus's bosom and the nymph Echo's dress were heard amid the conversation of the grave-looking men. At the end of a long half-hour, M. Upel de la Noue reappeared. He was on the high road of success, and the disorder of his attire increased. As he regained his seat, he met M. de Mussy. He shook hands with him in passing, and then he retraced his steps to ask him, "'You don't know the Marchioness's remark?' And he related it to him, without waiting for his reply. It penetrated him more and more. He criticized it. He ended by finding that it was of exquisite naivete. I have a much prettier one underneath. It was a cry from the heart. But Monsieur de Mussy was not of this opinion. He considered the remark indecent. He had just been attached to the embassy in England where, so the minister had told him, the greatest propriety was necessary. He refused to lead the cotillon any more made himself old and no longer spoke of his love for René, to whom he bowed gravely when he met her. Monsieur Huppel de la Noue was again joining the group, formed behind the baron's armchair, when the piano struck up a triumphal march. A loud burst of harmony, produced by bold strokes on the keys, preluded a melody of great amplitude, amid which a metallic clang resounded at intervals. Each phrase, as soon as finished, was repeated in a louder strain, accentuating the rhythm. It was at once brutal and joyous. "'You will see,' muttered Monsieur Huppel de la Noue. "'I have perhaps carried poetical license rather far, but I think that my audacity has answered. The nymph Echo, seeing that Venus is powerless over the handsome Narcissus, conducts him to Plutus, the god of wealth and precious metals. After the temptation of the flesh, the temptation of gold. That's classical, 
replied the lean Monsieur Toutain Laroche with an amiable smile. You are well acquainted with your period, my dear prefect. The curtains parted, the piano played louder. The effect was dazzling. The electric ray fell upon a flaming splendor which the spectators at first thought was a brazier in which bars of gold and precious stones seemingly melted. A new grotto was presented, but this one was not the cool retreat of Venus, bathed by the waters which eddied on fine pearl besprinkled sand. It must have been situated in the bowels of the earth, in some deep fiery stratum. It seemed a fissure of the ancient Hades, a crevice amid a mine of liquescent metals inhabited by Plutus. The silk simulating the rock displayed broad metallic loads, layers which looked like the veins of the old world, teeming with incalculable wealth and the eternal life of the soil. On the ground, by a bold anachronism, which M. Huppel de la Noue had decided on, there was an avalanche of twenty-franc pieces. Louis spread out, Louis piled up, a pollulation of ascending Louis. On the summit of this heap of gold sat Madame de Gwende as Plutus, a female Plutus, a Plutus showing her bosom amid the broad streaks of her dress imitating all the metals. Around the god, erect or reclining, united in bunches or blooming apart, were grouped the fairy-like efflorescences of this grotto into which the caliphs of the Arabian Nights had seemingly emptied their treasure. There was Madame Hoffner as gold, with a stiff skirt as resplendent as the robes of a bishop, Madame d'Espanay as silver, shining like moonlight, Madame de Laurence in warm blue as a sapphire, having beside her little Madame d'Aste, a smiling turquoise, of a tender shade of blue. Then there were spread out the emerald, Madame de Meinhold, and the topaz, Madame Tessier, and lower down, Countess Svanska, lending her dark ardor to coral, was stretched out with her arms raised and loaded with red drops, similar to some monstrous and adorable polyp, which displayed a woman's flesh amid the pink and pearly openings of her shell. These ladies wore necklaces, braces, complete sets of jewels formed of the precious stone they represented. The audience particularly noticed the original jewelry of Mesdames Hoffner and Despanet, exclusively composed of little gold and little silver coins, fresh from the mint. In the foreground, the drama remained the same. The nymph Echo tempted handsome Narcissus, who again refused with a gesture. And the eyes of the spectators grew accustomed with delight to this yawning cavity opening amid the inflamed entrails of the earth, to this pile of gold on which the wealth of a world was wallowing. This second tableau met with still more success than the first. The idea appeared particularly ingenious. The boldness of the twenty-franc pieces, this stream from some modern safe which had fallen into a corner of Grecian mythology, delighted the minds of the ladies and the financiers who were present. The words, what a number of coins, what a quantity of gold, sped by amid smiles and long quivers of satisfaction, and assuredly, each of the ladies, each of the gentlemen dreamt of having all this money to her or himself in a cellar. England has paid. Those are your milliards, maliciously murmured Louise in Madame Sidonie's ear. And Madame Michelin, her mouth slightly parted by delighted desire, drew back her Almay's veil and fondled the gold with a sparkling glance, while the group of grave-looking men went into transports. Monsieur Toutain Laroche, beaming, murmured a few words in the ear of the baron, whose face was becoming spotted with yellow stains. But Mignon and Charrier, less discreet, said with brutal simplicity, Dash it all! There would be enough there to demolish all Paris and rebuild it! The remark seemed a profound one to Saccard, who was beginning to think that Mignon and Charrier trifled with people in passing themselves off as fools. When the curtains closed again, and the piano finished a triumphal march with a loud noise of notes thrown one upon the other, like final shovelfuls of crowns. The applause burst forth louder 
and more prolonged. However, in the middle of a tableau, the minister, accompanied by his secretary, Monsieur de Saffre, had appeared at the door of a drawing room. Saccard, who was impatiently watching for his brother, wished to dart to meet him, but the latter requested him by a gesture not to stir, and he softly approached the group of grave-looking men. When the curtains had closed again and people had perceived him, a long whisper traveled through the drawing room and all heads were turned round. The minister counterbalanced the success of the amours of handsome Narcissus and the nymph Echo. "'You are a poet, my dear prefect,' he said, smiling to Monsieur Upel de la Noue. "'You once published a volume of verse, the Convolvuli, I believe. I see that the cares of office have not exhausted your imagination.' The prefect detected the point of an epigram in this compliment. The sudden advent of his superior put him out of countenance, the more as on giving himself a glance to see if his attire were correct. He perceived on his coat sleeve a little white hand, which he did not dare to rub off. He bowed and stammered. Really, continued the minister, addressing himself to Monsieur Dutin Laroche, Baron Gouraud, and the other personages who were there, all that gold was a marvellous spectacle. We should do great things if Monsieur Upel de la Noue coined money for us. In ministerial language, this was the same remark as Mignon's and Charrier's. Thereupon, Monsieur Toutain Laroche and the others paid their court and played on the minister's last phrase. The empire had already accomplished marvels. There was no lack of gold, thanks to the great experience of those in power. France had never occupied such a splendid position in the eyes of Europe, and the gentleman ended by becoming so servile that the minister himself changed the conversation. He listened to them with his head erect and the corners of his mouth slightly raised, whereby an expression of doubt and smiling disdain was imparted to his fat, carefully shaven white face. Saccard, who wished to bring about the announcement of the marriage of Maxime and Louise, maneuvered so as to find a skillful transition. He affected great familiarity, and his brother played the good-natured and consented to do him the service of seeming to be very fond of him. He was really a superior man, with his clear look, his evident contempt of petty rascalities, his broad shoulders which could have overturned all these folks with a mere shrug. When the marriage at last came into question, he showed himself charming. He let it be understood that he had his wedding gift ready. He spoke of Maxime's appointment as an auditor of the Council of State. He went so far as to repeat twice to his brother, in a tone of good fellowship, "'Tell your son that I wish to be his witness.' Monsieur de Marais blushed with delight. Saccard was congratulated." M. Toutain Laroche offered himself as a second witness. Then the group abruptly began talking about divorce. A member of the opposition had just had the sad courage, said M. Hoffner, to defend this social shame. And everyone protested. Their sense of propriety furnished them with profound remarks. M. Michelin smiled delicately at the minister, while Mignon and Chary observed with astonishment, that the collar of his dressing coat was worn. In the meantime, Monsieur Upel de la Noue remained embarrassed, leaning on the armchair of Baron Gouraud, who had contented himself with exchanging a silent handshake with the minister. The poet did not dare to leave the spot. An indefinable feeling, the fear of, of appearing ridiculous, the fear of losing the goodwill of his superior, detained him despite his furious desire to go and set the ladies in position on the stage for the last tableau. He waited for some happy remark to occur to him and reestate him in favor. But he could think of nothing, and he was feeling more and more ill at ease when he perceived Monsieur de Saffre. He took his arm and clung to him as to a saving plank. The young man had just arrived. He was quite a fresh victim. You don't know the marchioness's remark? 
the prefect asked him. Monsieur Upel de la Noue was so disturbed, however, that he no longer knew how to present the anecdote in a spicy manner. He floundered. I said to her, You have a charming costume. And, and she answered, I have a much prettier one underneath, quietly added Monsieur de Saffray. It's old, my dear fellow, very old. Monsieur Pelle de la Noue looked at him in consternation. The remark was old, and he had meant to sift his commentary on the naivete of this cry from the heart. Old as old as the world, repeated the secretary. Madame d'Espanay has said it twice already at the Tuileries. This was the last blow. After that, the prefect no longer cared a fig for the minister or the whole drawing room. He was proceeding towards the platform when the piano began a prelude in a saddened tone, with trembling notes which seemed to weep. Then the complaint expanded, dragged on at length, and the curtains parted. Monsieur Upel de la Noue, who had already half disappeared, returned into the drawing room on hearing the slight grating of the rings. He was pale, exasperated. He made a violent effort to restrain himself from apostrophizing the ladies. What? They'd taken up their positions unassisted? It must be that little Despanet who'd fomented a plot to hasten the change of costume and dispense with him. That wasn't it. That was worth nothing at all. He returned, mumbling indistinct words. He looked on to the platform, shrugging his shoulders and murmuring, The nymph echo is too near the edge, and that leg of handsome Narcissus, nothing noble in its attitude, nothing noble at all. Mignon and Charrier, who had approached him to hear the explanation, ventured to ask, what the young man and the young woman were doing there lying on the ground. But he did not answer. He refused to explain any more of his poem, and as the contractors insisted, Why, he said, it no longer concerns me, since the ladies set themselves in position without me. The piano softly sobbed. On the platform, a clearing on which the electric ray set a stretch of sunlight revealed a vista of leaves. It was an ideal glade with blue trees and large red and yellow flowers which rose as high as the oaks. Venus and Plutus stood on a grassy mound side by side, and surrounded by nymphs who had hastened from the neighboring thickets to serve as their escort. There were the daughters of the trees, the daughters of the springs, the daughters of the heights, all the laughing naked divinities of the forest. And the god and the goddess triumphed and punished the apathy of the proud young fellow who'd scorned them, while the group of nymphs looked inquisitively and with religious fright at the vengeance of Olympus displayed in the foreground. The drama was their being unraveled. Handsome Narcissus, lying on the margin of a brook which came down from the back of the stage, was looking at himself in the clear mirror. An exactitude had been carried to the point of placing a strip of looking-glass at the bottom of the brook. But he was no longer the free young fellow, the forest wanderer. Death surprised him amid his delighted admiration of his own figure. Death enervated him, and Venus with her outstretched finger like a fairy in a transformation scene consigned him to his deadly fate. He was becoming a flower. His limbs became verdant and longer in his tight-fitting costume of green satin. The flexible stalk, figured by his slightly bent legs, sank into the ground to take root there, while his bust, decked with broad lappets of white satin, expanded into a marvelous corolla. Maxime's fair hair completed the illusion, and set with its long curls yellow pistols amid the whiteness of the petals. And the large nascent flower, still human, inclined its head towards the spring with its eyes bedimmed and smiling with voluptuous ecstasy, as if handsome Narcissus had at length satisfied in death the passion which he'd felt for himself. 
A few paces off, the nymph Echo was dying also, dying of unquenched desires. She found herself gradually caught in the rigidity of the soil. She felt her burning limbs congeal and harden. She was not a vulgar rock, soiled by moss, but white marble by her shoulders and arms, by her long snowy robe from which the girdle of foliage and the blue drapery had glided. Sunk down amid the satin of her skirt, which formed large plates, similar to a block of paros, she threw herself back with naught alive, in her statue-like congealed body, save her woman's eyes, eyes which glistened as they remained fixed on the flower of the waters, languidly leaning above the mirror of the spring. And it already seemed as if all the love sounds of the forest the prolonged noises of the thickets, the mysterious quivers of the leaves, the deep sighs of the old oaks, came and beat upon the marble flesh of the nymph Echo, whose heart, still bleeding amid the block, resounded protractedly, repeating afar the slightest complaints of the earth and of the air. "'Oh, how they have muffled up poor Maxime!' murmured Louise. And Madame Saccard, you would say a dead woman. She's covered with rice powder, said Madame Michelin. Other scarcely complimentary remarks circulated. This third tableau did not meet with the same unqualified success as the two others. And yet it was this tragical ending which made Monsieur Huppel de la Noue enthusiastic about his own talent. He admired himself in it as his Narcissus did in his strip of looking-glass. He had said a number of poetical and philosophical allusions in it. When the curtains had closed again for the last time, and the spectators had applauded like people of good breeding, he experienced mental regret at having given way to anger, and not having explained the last page of his poem. He then wished to give the people around him the key to the charming, grand or simply suggestive things which handsome Narcissus and the nymph Echo represented, and he even tried to say what Venus and Plutus were doing in the depths of the clearing. But the gentlemen and ladies whose clear practical minds had understood the grotto of flesh and the grotto of gold had no inclination to descend into the prefect's mythological complications. Only Mignon and Charrier, who absolutely wished to inform themselves, were good-natured enough to question him. He took possession of them and kept them during nearly two hours, standing in the embrasure of a window, relating to them the metamorphoses of Ovid. The minister now withdrew. He apologized for not being able to wait for the beautiful Madame Saccard to compliment her on the perfect gracefulness of the nymph Echo. He'd just been three or four times round the drawing-room on the arm of his brother, giving a few shakes of the hand and bowing to the ladies. He'd never before compromised himself so much for Saccard. He left him radiant when, on the threshold, he said to him in a loud voice, "'I shall expect you tomorrow morning. Come and breakfast with me.' The ball was about to begin. The servants had ranged the ladies' armchairs along the walls. The large drawing-room now displayed from the little yellow room to the platform. Its bare carpet, the large purple flowers of which opened under the dripping light which fell from the crystal of the chandeliers. The heat was increasing. The reflection of the red hangings brightened the gilding of the furniture and the ceiling. To open the ball, one waited until the ladies, the nymph Echo, Venus, Plutus and the others had changed their costumes. Madame d'Espanay and Madame Hoffner appeared the first. They had reassumed their costumes of a second tableau, the first of gold and the other is silver. They were surrounded and congratulated, and they recounted their emotions. As for me, I nearly burst out, said the Marchioness, when I saw Monsieur Toutain Laroche's big nose looking at me in the distance. I think that I have a stiff neck, languidly remarked the fair-haired Suzanne. No, really, if it had lasted a minute longer, I should have replaced my head in a natural position. My neck hurt me so much. 
From the embrasure into which M. Huppel de la Noue had pushed Mignon and Charrier, he cast nervous glances at the group formed around the two young women. He was afraid that people were poking fun at him. The other nymphs arrived one after the other. They had all resumed their costumes as precious stones. The Countess Vanska, as Karl, met with prodigious successes when one was able to closely examine the ingenious details of her dress. Then Maxime entered, correct in his dress coat and with a smiling air, and a flow of women enveloped him. He was placed in the center of a circle. He was joked about his part as a flower and his passion for looking-glasses. Without any embarrassment, as if delighted with his part, he continued smiling, answered the jokes, confessed that he adored himself and that he was sufficiently cured of women to prefer himself to them. People laughed the louder at this. The group grew larger and took possession of the whole center of a drawing room, while the young man, drowned amid this people of shoulders, this medley of bright costumes, retained his perfume of monstrous love, his vicious fair flower's gentleness. When Rene, however, at last came down, there was semi-silence. She had attired herself in a new costume, of such original grace and such audacity that the gentlemen and the ladies, although accustomed to the young woman's eccentricities, at first gave a movement of surprise. She was dressed as an Otahitian. This costume, it appeared, is most primitive, as she wore it, it comprised soft tinted tights which rose from her feet to her bosom, leaving her shoulders and arms bare, and over these tights a simple muslin blouse, short and trimmed with two flounces so as to slightly hide the hips. In her hair a wreath of wild flowers and gold rings round her ankles and her wrists. Nothing more. She was naked. The tights had the suppleness of flesh under the paleness of the blouse. The pure line of her nudity could be detected from her knees to her armpits, vaguely bedimmed by the flounces, but reappearing at the slightest movement and becoming more distinct between the threads of the lace. She was an adorable savage, a barbarous, voluptuous girl scarcely hidden by a white vapor, a patch of sea fog amid which her whole body could be divined. With rosy cheeks, René advanced at a rapid step. Celeste had made the first tights burst, but the young woman had fortunately foreseen the eventuality and taken her precautions. These torn tights had delayed her. She seemed to care little about her triumph. She smiled, however, and briefly answered the men who stopped and complimented her on the purity of her attitudes in the tableau vivant. Behind her she left a trail of dress coats astonished and charmed by the transparency of her muslin blouse. When she'd reached the group of women who surrounded Maxime, she gave rise to curt exclamations, and the marchioness began to look at her from head to foot, with a tender air and murmuring, She's admirably formed. Madame Michelin, whose Almay's costume became horribly heavy beside this simple veil, pursed her lips, while Madame Sidonie, shriveled up in her black sorceress's dress, murmured in her ear, "'It's the height of indecency, isn't it, my beauty?' "'Ah, yes, indeed,' said the pretty brunette at last. "'Monsieur Michelin would be angry if I undressed myself like that.' "'And he would be quite right,' concluded the agent. The band of serious men were not of this opinion. It went into ecstasies at a distance." Monsieur Michelin, whom his wife so inappropriately brought into question, showed himself transported so as to please Monsieur Toutain Laroche and Baron Gouraud, whom the sight of René enraptured. Saccard was greatly complimented on the perfection of his wife's figure. He bowed and professed to be very touched. The evening was a good one for him, and but for a preoccupation which darted from his eyes at moments when he cast a rapid glance at his sister, he would have been supremely happy. I say she's never shown us so much, jokingly said Louise in Maxime's ear, and indicating René by a glance. She paused, and then with an undefinable smile. At least, to me. 
The young fellow looked at her with a nervous air. But she continued smiling, strangely, like a schoolboy, delighted with some bit of fun rather too strong. The ball began. The platform of a tableau vivant had been utilized to accommodate a little orchestra in which brass instruments predominated, and the bugles and the cornet à piston launched forth their clear notes amid the ideal forest with blue trees. First came a quadrille, Ah, he has boots, he has boots, Bastien, which then constituted the delight of public balls. The ladies danced. Polkas, waltzes, mazurkas alternated with quadrilles. The swinging couples came and went, filled the long gallery, leaping under the lash of the brass instruments, swaying amid the lullaby of the violins. The costumes, this flood of women of all countries and all periods, displayed a swarming medley of bright stuffs. After mingling the colors and carrying them off in cadenced confusion, the rhythm at certain touches of the bows abruptly brought back the same tunic of pink satin, the same dress body of blue velvet beside the same black coat. Then another touch of the bows, a blast of the cornets, pushed the couples on, made them travel in files around the drawing room, with the swinging motion of a bark floating away under a gust of wind which had severed the fast that moored it. And so on, always, endlessly, for hours together. At times, between two dances, a lady approached a window, stifling, inhaling a little icy air. A couple rested on a couch in the little buttercup drawing room, or descended into the conservatory, going slowly round the paths. Skirts, only the edges of which could be seen, seemed to laugh languidly under the arbors of tropical creepers, in the depths of a tepid shade, where the loud notes of the cornets were wafted during the quadrilles of Hello, the Little Lambs, and I've a foot on the move. When the servants opened the door of the dining room, transformed into a refectory with sideboards against the walls, and a long table laden with cold meats in the center, there was a shove, a crush. A tall, handsome man, who had timidly kept his hat in his hand, was so violently flattened against the wall that the unfortunate hat burst with a dull moan. This made people laugh. The guests rushed upon the pastry and the truffled poultry, brutally digging their elbows into one another's ribs. It was a pillage. Hands met amid the viands, and the lackeys did not know whom to answer in the midst of this band of well-bred men, whose extended arms expressed the sole fear of arriving too late and finding the dishes empty. An old gentleman became angry because there was no Bordeaux wine, and champagne, so we affirmed, prevented him from sleeping. This ends section 12. Section 13 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola Translated by Henry Bizzatelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder Section 13 Softly, gentlemen, said Baptiste in his grave voice, there will be enough for everyone. But he was not listened to. The dining room was already full, and yet more anxious dress coats rose up at the door. In front of a sideboard stood groups eating quickly and pressing closely together. A good many swallowed without drinking, not having been able to set their hands on a glass. Others, on the contrary, drank after fruitlessly running about for a morsel of bread. Listen, said Monsieur Huppel de la Noue whom Mignon and Charrier, weary of mythology, had led to the buffet. We shan't get anything if we don't help each other. It's much worse at the Tuileries, and I have acquired some experience there. You look after the wine, and I'll see to the meat. The prefect was watching a leg of mutton. He stretched out his hand at the right moment through a break in the surrounding shoulders and quietly carried it off after filling his pockets with little rolls. The contractors returned from their side, Mignon with one bottle and Charrier with two bottles of champagne. 
but they'd only been able to secure two glasses. They said, however, that it did not matter, but they would drink out of the same. And the party supped on the corner of a flower stand at the end of the room. They did not even take off their gloves, but put the slices of mutton already cut between their bread and kept the bottles under their arms. And standing up, they talked with their mouths full, stretching out their chins in advance of their waistcoats so that the gravy might fall on to the carpet. Charrier, having finished his wine before his bread, asked a servant if he could not have a glass of champagne. "'You must wait, sir,' angrily replied the scared servant, losing his head and forgetting he was no longer in the kitchen. Three hundred bottles have already been drunk!' However, one could hear the notes of the orchestra swelling with sudden gusts. Couples were footing the polka called the Kisses, famous at public balls, and the rhythm of which each dancer had to mark by kissing his partner. Madame d'Espanay appeared at the door of the dining room, flushed, her hair slightly disordered, and trailing her silver robe with charming lassitude. People barely drew aside, and she had to shove with her elbows to obtain a passage. She made the round of the table, hesitating, a pout on her lips. Then she went straight to Monsieur Huppel de la Noue, who had finished, and who was wiping his mouth with his pocket handkerchief. "'You would be very amiable, sir,' she said to him with an adorable smile, "'if you'd find me a chair. I've been round the table fruitlessly.' The prefect had a spite against the marchioness, but his gallantry did not hesitate. He hastened, found a chair, installed Madame d'Espanay, and remained behind her, serving her. She would only take a few shrimps with a little butter and two thimbles full of champagne. She ate in a delicate manner amid the gluttony of the men. The table and the chairs were exclusively reserved for the ladies. However, an exception was always made in favor of Baron Gouraud. He was there, seated at ease, in front of a bit of pastry, the crust of which he crunched with his jaws. The marchioness reconquered the prefect by telling him that she should never forget her emotions as an artiste in the amours of handsome Narcissus and the nymph Echo. She even explained to him why they had not waited for him at the last tableau in a manner which completely consoled him. The ladies, on learning that the minister was there, had thought that it would hardly be proper to prolong the interval. She ended by begging him to go in search of Madame Hoffner, who was dancing with Monsieur Simpson, a brute of a man who displeased her, she said. And when Suzanne was there, she no longer looked at Monsieur Huppel de Nanou. Saccard, followed by Monsieur Toutain La Roche, de Mareuil, and Hoffner, had taken possession of a sideboard. As there was no room at the table, and Monsieur de Saffre passed by with Madame Michelin on his arm, he detained them, and insisted that the pretty brunette should share with his party. She nibbled some pastry, smiling, raising her clear eyes on the five men who surrounded her. They leaned towards her, touched her Almay's veil, embroidered with threads of gold, brought her to bay between themselves and the sideboard, against which she ended by leaning, taking cakes from every hand, very gentle and very caressing, and showing the lovely docility of a slave amid her masters. All by himself, at the other end of the room, Monsieur Michelin was finishing a tureen of Goose's liver, which he had succeeded in capturing. Madame Sidonie, who had been prowling about the ball since the first bow strokes, now entered the dining room and summoned Saccard with a glance. She isn't dancing, she said to him in a low voice. She seems anxious. I think she is meditating some bit of folly. But I have not yet been able to discover the swain. I am going to eat something and then return to the watch. And standing like a man... She ate a chicken's wing, which she procured, thanks to Monsieur Michelin, who had finished his tureen. She poured herself out some malaga in a large champagne glass. Then, after wiping her mouth with the tips of her fingers, she returned to the drawing-room. 
The train of her sorceress's robe already seemed to have gathered up all the dust of the carpets. The ball was languishing, and the orchestra gave signs of being blown, when a murmur sped about. The cotillon! The cotillon! And revived the dancers and the brass instruments alike. Couples came from all the clumps of plants in the conservatory. The large drawing room grew as full as when the first quadrille was danced, and there was a discussion among the awakened crowd. It was the last flash of the ball. The men who did not dance looked with sluggish good nature out of the depths of the embrasures at the talkative group swelling in the middle of the room, while the supper-eaters at the sideboard stretched out their necks to see, but without letting go of their bread. "'Monsieur de Moussy won't,' said one lady. "'He swears that he no longer leads it. "'Come, once more, Monsieur de Moussy, only this once. "'Do it for us.' But the young embassy attaché remained stiff in his high collar turned down at the points. It was really impossible. He had sworn. There was a disappointment. Maxime also refused, saying that he couldn't, that he was tired out. Monsieur Huppel de la Noue did not dare to offer himself. He only descended as far as poetry. On a lady speaking of Monsieur Simpson, she was silenced. Monsieur Simpson was the strangest cotillon leader one ever saw. He gave himself up to fantastic and malicious devices. It was related that in one drawing room where the guests had been so imprudent as to choose him, he had compelled the ladies to jump over the chairs and one of his favorite figures was to make everyone go round the room on all fours. "'Has Monsieur de Saffre left?' asked a childish voice. He was leaving. He was saying goodbye to the beautiful Madame Saccard, with whom he was on the best possible terms, since she would not have him. This amiable skeptic admired other people's caprices. He was triumphantly brought back from the hall." He tried to escape and said with a smile that he was being compromised, that he was a serious man. Then, in presence of all the white hands that were stretched out towards him, Well, said he, take your places, but I warn you that I'm classical. I haven't a copper's worth of imagination. The couple sat down round the drawing room on all the seats that could be gathered together. Some young fellows even went to fetch the iron chairs of the conservatory. It was a monster cotillon. Monsieur de Saffre, who had the solemn air of an officiating priest, chose as his partner the Countess Vanska, whose costume as Karl preoccupied him. When everyone was in position, he cast a long glance at the circular row of skirts, each flanked by a dress coat. And he made a sign to the orchestra, the brass instruments of which resounded. Heads leaned forward along the smiling band of faces. René had refused to take part in the cotillon. She'd been nervously gay since the beginning of the ball, scarcely dancing, but mingling with the groups, unable to remain still. Her friends found her strange. During the evening she talked of making a balloon journey with a celebrated aeronaut with whom all Paris was occupied. When the cotillon began, she was vexed not to be able to walk about at her ease, so she stationed herself at the hall door, shaking hands with the gentleman who left and talking with her husband's intimate friends. Baron Gouraud, whom a lackey carried off in his fur coat, paid a final eulogium to her Otahitian's costume. Meanwhile, Monsieur Toutain Laroche shook hands with Saccard. Maxime relies on you, said the latter. Quite so, replied the new senator. And turning towards René, I haven't congratulated you, madame, so the dear boy is now settled. And as she gave an astonished smile, My wife doesn't yet know, observed Saccard. We have decided this evening on Mademoiselle de Marais' marriage with Maxime. She continued smiling bowing to Monsieur Toutain Laroche, who went off saying, You signed the contract on Sunday, eh? I'm going to Nevers about a mining affair, but I shall be back in time. René remained for a moment alone in the middle of the hall. 
she no longer smiled. And as she gradually dived into what she had just learned, she was seized with a great shudder. She looked at the red velvet hangings, the rare plants, the pots of majolica with a fixed stare. Then she said aloud, I must speak to him. And she returned to the drawing room. But she had to remain near the entry. A figure of the cotillon barred the way. The orchestra was playing a waltz air in a low key. The ladies, holding each other's hands, formed a circle, one of those circles that are formed by little girls singing Girofle, Girofla. And they spun round as quickly as possible, pulling one another's arms, laughing and sliding. In the center, a gentleman, it was the malicious Monsieur Simpson, held a long pink scarf in his hand. He raised it with the gesture of a fisherman who's about to cast a net. But he did not hurry. He no doubt thought it funny to let these ladies turn round and tire themselves. They breathed hard and asked for mercy. Then he threw the scarf, and he threw it with such skill that it went and wound around the shoulders of Madame Despanet and Madame Hoffner, who were turning side by side. It was one of the Yankees' bits of fun. He then wished to waltz with both ladies at once, and he'd already taken them both by the waist, one with his left arm and the other with his right, when Monsieur de Saffre, in the severe tone of the king of the Cotillon, said, You can't dance with two ladies. But Monsieur Simpson would not let go of the two waists. Adeline and Suzanne threw themselves back in his arms, laughing. The point was argued. The ladies grew angry. The hubbub was prolonged, and the dress coats in the embrasures of the windows asked themselves how Seffre would extricate himself from this delicate dilemma to his glory. He indeed seemed perplexed for a moment, seeing by what refinement of gracefulness he might win the laughers over to his side. Then he smiled. He took Madame d'Espanay and Madame Hoffner by the hand, whispered a question in their ears, received their replies, and afterwards addressing himself to Monsieur Simpson, "'Do you pluck the verbena, or do you pluck the periwinkle?' he asked. Monsieur Simpson, looking rather foolish, said that he plucked the verbena, whereupon Monsieur de Saffray gave him the marchioness, saying, "'Here is the verbena.' There was discreet applause. It was found very pretty. Monsieur de Saffre was a cotillon leader who never remained embarrassed, such was the lady's remark. In the meanwhile, the orchestra had resumed the waltz air with all its instruments, and Monsieur Simpson, after making the round of the room, waltzing with Madame d'Espanay, reconducted her to her seat. René was able to pass. She bit her lips till they bled at sight of all this foolishness. She considered these women and men stupid to throw scarfs and take the names of flowers. Her ears rung. A furious impatience lent her a brusque desire to throw herself forward head first and open a passage. She crossed the drawing room with a rapid step, jostling the belated couples who were regaining their seats. She went straight to the conservatory. She'd not seen either Louise or Maxime among the dancers, and she said to herself that they must be there, in some nook formed by the foliage, united by that partiality for drollery and impropriety which made them seek out little corners as soon as they found themselves anywhere together. But she fruitlessly explored the dimness of the conservatory. She only perceived, in the depths of an arbor, a tall young fellow who was devoutly kissing the hands of little Madame d'Aste and murmuring, Madame de Laurence told me right. You are an angel. This declaration in her house, in her conservatory, shocked René. Madame de Laurence ought really to have taken her traffic elsewhere. And René would have felt relieved could she have chased all these people who bawled so loud out of her apartments. Standing in front of the basin, she looked at the water and asked herself where Louise and Maxime could well have hidden themselves. The orchestra still played that waltz, 
the slow undulation of which made her feel sick. It was insupportable. One could no longer reflect in one's own abode. She became confused. She forgot that the young folks were not yet married, and she said to herself that it was simple enough that they'd gone to bed. Then she thought of the dining room and quickly reascended the conservatory staircase. By that the door of the drawing room, she was stopped for the second time by a figure of the cotillon. These are the black specks, ladies, gallantly said Monsieur de Saffre. This is an invention of mine, and I inaugurate it for you. There was a great deal of laughter. The gentleman explained the allusion to the young women. The emperor had just delivered a speech which recorded the presence of certain black specks on the political horizon. These black specks had met with great success. No one knew why. Parisian wits had appropriated the expression, and to such a point that for a week past the black specks had been introduced into everything. Monsieur de Saffre placed the masculine dancers at one end of the drawing room, making them turn their backs to the ladies, who were left at the other end. Then he ordered the men to turn up their coats in such a way as to hide the backs of their heads. This operation was accomplished amid tremendous merriment. Humpbacked, with their shoulders hidden by the tails of their coats, which now only fell to their waists, the gentlemen looked really frightful. "'Don't laugh, ladies,' cried Monsieur de Saffray with most comical gravity, "'or I shall make you put your lace flounces on your heads.' The merriment increased, and the leader energetically availed himself of his sovereignty over some of the gentlemen who would not hide the napes of their necks. "'You are the black specks,' said he. "'Hide your heads. Only show your backs. "'It is necessary that the lady should only see so much black. "'Now walk, mingle together, so that you may not be recognized.' "'The hilarity was at its height. "'The black specks went to and fro on their skinny legs "'with the undulatory motion of headless ravens. "'One gentleman's shirt was seen with a bit of braces.' Then the ladies begged for mercy. They were stifling, and Monsieur de Saffray was pleased to order them to go and fetch the black specks. They went off like a covey of young partridges amid a loud rustle of skirts. Then each of them, at the end of her trip, seized hold of a gentleman who came within her grasp. It was an indescribable medley, and the improvised couples disengaged themselves in a file and made the round of a drawing-room waltzing amid the louder strains of the orchestra. René had leant against the wall. Pale and with compressed lips, she looked on. An old gentleman came and asked her gallantly why she was not dancing. She had to smile and give some answer. Escaping at last, she entered the dining room. It looked empty, but amid the pillaged sideboards and the trailing bottles and plates, Maxime and Louise, seated side by side, were quietly supping at one end of the table, on a napkin which they had spread out. They seemed to be at their ease. They laughed amid the disorder, the dirty glasses, the dishes soiled with grease. The remnants which testify to the gluttony of the supper eaters with white gloves. They had contented themselves with brushing off the crumbs around them. Baptiste gravely walked round the table without a glance for the room through which a band of wolves seemed to have passed. He was waiting for the other servants to come and set the sideboards in a little order. Maxime had still been able to gather a very fair supper together. Louise adored hard bake with pistachio nuts, a plateful of which had remained on the top of a sideboard. They had three partially emptied bottles of champagne before them. "'Papa has perhaps gone off,' said the young girl. "'So much the better,' replied Maxime. "'I will see you home.' And as she laughed, "'You know that they really want me to marry you,' he added. "'It's no longer a joke. It's serious.' But what shall we do with ourselves when we are married? Why, we'll do what others do, of course. This repartee escaped her rather quickly. 
and as if to withdraw, she hastily added, We will go to Italy. It will do my chest good. I'm very ill. Ah, oh, my poor Maxime, what a sorry wife you will have. I am not bigger than two sous of butter. She smiled with a shade of sadness in her page's costume. A dry cough brought red gleams to her cheeks. It's the hard bake, said she. At home I'm forbidden to eat it. Pass me the plate. I'll put the rest in my pocket. And she was emptying the plate when Renée entered the room. She went straight to Maxime, making unheard of efforts not to swear, not to beat the punchback whom she found there at table with her lover. I wish to speak to you, she stammered in a husky voice. He hesitated, frightened, dreading to be with her. To you alone, at once, repeated René. Go then, Maxime, said Louise, with her undefinable look. At the same time, you might try to find my father. I lose him at every party. He rose up. He tried to stop the young woman in the middle of the dining room by asking her what she could have of so urgent a nature to say to him. But she resumed between her teeth, Follow me, or I shall speak out before everyone. He turned very pale and followed her with the docility of a beaten animal. She thought that Baptiste was looking at her, but at this moment she cared naught for the valet's clear gaze. At the door, the cotillon detained her for the third time. Wait, she murmured. These fools will never have done. Monsieur de Saffre was placing the Duc de Rosan with his back against the wall in one corner of a drawing room beside the dining room door. He stationed a lady in front of him, then a gentleman back to back with the lady, then another lady in front of a gentleman, and this in a line, couple by couple, forming as it were a long serpent. As the dancers talked together and tarried behind, Come, ladies, he cried, to your places for the columns. They came, and the columns were formed. The indecency of finding oneself thus caught, pressed between two men, leaning against the back of one of them, with the chest of the other in front of one, made the ladies very gay. The tips of the women's bosoms touched the facings of the men's dress coats. The gentlemen's legs disappeared amid the ladies' skirts, and whenever any sudden merriment made a woman's head lean forward, the moustaches in front were obliged to draw back so as not to carry matters as far as kissing. At one moment a joker must have given a slight push, for the line closed up, the dress coats plunged deeper into the skirts. There were little cries and laughs, coughs which did not end. The Baroness de Meinhold was heard saying, but you are stifling me, sir. Don't squeeze me so hard. This seemed so funny and gave the whole line such an attack of hilarity that the shaken columns staggered, clashed together, and leaned upon one another to avoid falling. Monsieur de Saffre waited with his hands raised, ready to clap. Then he clapped. At this signal, everyone abruptly turned round. The couples who were face to face took each other by the waist and the file dispersed waltzing round the room. The only one left was the poor Duc de Rosan, who on turning round found his nose against the wall. He was derided by everybody. Come, said René to Maxime. The orchestra was still playing the waltz. This soft music, the monotonous rhythm of which at last became insipid, increased the young woman's exasperation. She gained the little drawing-room, holding Maxime by the hand, and pushing him to the staircase which led to the dressing-room. Go up, she ordered. She followed him. At this moment, Madame Sidonie, who throughout the evening had been prowling round about her sister-in-law, astonished by her continual promenades through the rooms, just reached the conservatory steps. She saw a man's leg disappear amid the darkness of a little staircase. A pale smile lit up her waxen face, 
and catching up her sorceress's skirt to walk the quicker, she sought her brother, upsetting a figure of the cotillon and questioning all the servants she met. She at last found Saccard with Monsieur de Marais in an apartment which adjoined the dining room, and which had been turned provisionally into a smoking room. The two fathers were talking about the dowry and the contract, but when Saccard's sister had said a word in his ear, he rose up, apologized, and disappeared. Upstairs, the dressing room was in complete disorder. Over the chairs trailed the costume of a nymph echo, the torn tights, bits of crumpled lace, undergarments thrown aside in a bundle, everything that a woman, expected elsewhere, leaves in her haste behind her. The little ivory and silver tools lay about a little bit everywhere. There were brushes and files fallen on the carpet, and the towel still damp, the soap forgotten on the marble slab, the scent bottles left open, emitted a strong, penetrating perfume in the flesh-tinted tent. To take the white off her arms and shoulders, the young woman had dipped herself in the pink marble bath after the tableau vivant. Iridescent scales expanded on the sheet of water, now grown cold. Maxime stepped on some stays, narrowly missed falling, and tried to laugh. But he shivered at sight of Renée's stern face. She approached him, pushing him and saying in a low voice, So, you're going to marry the hunchback? Not a bit of it, he murmured. Who told you so? Oh, don't lie. It's useless. He was prompted to rebel. She alarmed him. He wished to finish matters with her. Well, yes, I am to marry her. What of it? Am I not the master? She came towards him with her head somewhat lowered and with an evil laugh and taking hold of his wrists. The master? You, the master? You know very well it isn't so. It is I who am the master. I could break your arms if I were cruel. You have no more strength than a girl. And as he struggled, she twisted his arms with all the nervous violence that anger imparted to her. He uttered a slight cry, and she then let go of him, resuming, Don't let us fight. I should prove the stronger. He remained pale, with the shame of the pain which he felt at his wrists. He watched her coming and going about the room. She pushed back the furniture, reflecting, deciding on the plan which had been revolving in her head since her husband had apprised her of the marriage. I'm going to shut you up here, she said at last, and when it's daylight we will start for Havre. He grew still paler with alarm and stupor. But this is madness, he cried. We can't go off together. You're going crazy. Perhaps so. At all events, it's you and your father who are making me so. I need you and I take you. So much the worse for fools. Red gleam shone in her eyes. Again approaching Maxime and scorching his face with her breath, she continued, What would become of me if you married the hunchback? You would deride me, and I should perhaps be forced to take back that big simpleton de Mussy who would not even warm my feet. When people have done what we have done, they remain together. Besides, it's clear enough, I feel bored when you are not there, and as I'm going off, I take you with me. You can tell Celeste what you want her to go and fetch at your place. The unfortunate fellow held out his hands and supplicated. Come, my little René, don't commit such folly. Become yourself again. Think a little of the scandal. I don't care a fig for the scandal. If you refuse, I shall go down into the drawing room and cry out that I have slept with you and that you are now cowardly enough to want to marry the hunchback. He bowed his head and listened to her, already giving way and accepting this will so roughly imposed upon him. We will go to Havre, she replied in a lower tone, caressing her dream. And from there we can reach England. No one will bother us any more. If we're not far enough off, we'll start for America. I, who always feel cold, I shall be comfortable there. I have often envied Creoles. 
But while she enlarged the scope of her project, Terra again seized hold of Maxime. To leave Paris, to go so far away with this woman who was certainly mad, to leave behind him a story the shameful character of which would exile him forever. It was like some atrocious nightmare stifling him. He sought in despair for a means of escaping from this dressing room, this pink retreat where the bell of the lunatic asylum of Charenton seemed to toll. At last he thought he'd found an expedient. But I have no money, he said gently, so as not to exasperate her. If you shut me up, I cannot procure any. I have some money, though, she replied with an air of triumph. I have a hundred thousand francs. Everything tallies perfectly well. She took out of the wardrobe a deed of session which her husband had left with her in the vague hope that she might change her mind. She laid it on the toilet table, compelled Maxime to give her a pen and an inkstand which were in the bedroom, and pushing back the soap and signing the act. There, she said, the folly's done. If I'm robbed, it is because I choose to be. We will call on Lausano before going to the station. Now, my little Maxime, I'm going to shut you up, and we will escape by way of the garden when I've turned all these people out of the house. We don't even need to take any luggage. She became gay again. This wild freak delighted her. It was a piece of supreme eccentricity, a finish which, amid her fever, seemed to her mind altogether original. It surpassed her desire to make a balloon journey by a great deal. She went and took Maxime in her arms, murmuring, I hurt you a little while ago, my poor darling. But then you refused. You'll see how nice it will be. Would your hunchback ever love you as I do? That little blackamoor isn't a woman. She was laughing. She was drawing him to her and kissing him on the lips when a sound made them both turn their heads. Sakar was standing on the threshold of the room. Terrible silence followed. Renée slowly withdrew her arm from Maxime's neck, but she did not lower her brow. She continued gazing at her husband with her big eyes, which stared fixedly like those of a corpse, while the young fellow, overwhelmed and terrified, staggered with bowed head, now that he was no longer sustained by her embrace. Sakar, stunned by the supreme blow, which at last made the husband and the father cry out within him, did not advance, but livid. He scorched them from afar with the fire of his glances. In the moist, odoriferous atmosphere of the room, the three tapers flared very high, their flames erect, with the stillness of fiery tears. And alone breaking the silence, the terrible silence, a breath of music ascended the narrow staircase. The waltz, with its snake-like undulations, glided, coiled, and died away on the snowy carpet, amid the split tights and the fallen skirts. Then the husband advanced. The impulse which he felt to resort to brutality brought blotches to his face. He clinched his fists to knock down the guilty pair. Anger in this restless little man burst forth like the report of firearms. He gave a strangled titter, and still advancing, You were announcing your marriage to her, eh? Maxime retreated and leant against the wall. Listen, he stammered, it was she. He was about to accuse her like a coward, to cast the odium of the crime upon her, to say that she wanted to carry him off, to defend himself with the humility and the shudders of a child detected in the fault. But he did not have the strength. The words expired in his throat. Renée retained her statue-like rigidity, her air of mute defiance. Then Sakar, no doubt in view of finding a weapon, gave a rapid glance around him. And on the corner of a toilet table, among the combs and nail brushes, he perceived the deed of session the stamped paper of which set a yellow stain on the marble. He looked at the deed. He looked at the guilty pair. Then, on leaning forward, he saw that the deed was signed. His eyes went from the open inkstand to the pen still wet, which had been left on the foot of the candelabrum. 
He remained erect in front of the signature, reflecting. The silence seemed to increase. The flames of the candle shot up higher. The waltz resounded in a softer lullaby along the hangings. Sakar gave an imperceptible shrug of the shoulders. He again looked at his wife and his son with a profound air, as if to wring from their faces an explanation which he could not divine. Then he slowly folded up the deed and placed it in the pocket of his dress coat. His cheeks had become extremely pale. "'You have done well to sign, my dear,' he said gently to his wife. "'You gain a hundred thousand francs by doing so. I will give you the money this evening.' He almost smiled, and his hands alone retained a trembling. He took a few steps, adding, "'It's stifling in here. What an idea to come and plot one of your jokes in this vapor bath.' And then addressing himself to Maxime, who had raised his head, surprised by his father's appeased voice. "'Here, come with me,' he resumed. "'I saw you go up, and I came to fetch you, "'so that you might wish Monsieur de Marais and his daughter good night.' "'The two men went down, talking together. "'René remained alone, standing in the middle of a dressing-room, "'looking at the yawning cavity of the little staircase, "'in which she had just seen the shoulders of the father and the son disappear. "'She could not take her eyes off this cavity.' What? They'd gone off. Quietly, amicably. These two men had not murdered each other. She lent an ear. She listened to ascertain if some atrocious struggle did not make their bodies roll down the stairs. Nothing. In the tepid darkness, nothing but a noise of dancing, a long lullaby. She thought she could hear in the distance the Marchioness's laughter and Monsieur de Saffray's clear voice. Then the drama was ended. Her crime, the kisses in the large grey and pink bed, the wild nights in the conservatory, all the accursed love that had consumed her during months had led to this mean, ignoble ending. Her husband knew all and did not even beat her. And the silence around her this silence through which trailed the endless waltz terrified her even more than the sound of murder. She felt afraid of this peacefulness, afraid of this soft-tinted, discreet dressing room full of the scent of love. She perceived herself in the high glass door of the wardrobe. She approached, astonished to see herself, forgetting her husband, forgetting Maxime, and altogether preoccupied by the strange woman whom she beheld before her. Madness was rising to her brain. Her yellow hair, caught up off the temples and the neck, seemed to her a nudity, an obscenity. The wrinkle of her forehead deepened to such a degree that it set a dark bar above her eyes, the thin, bluish scar of a lash with a whip. Who'd marked her like that? Her husband had certainly not raised his hand. And her lips astonished her by their pallor. Her myop's eyes seemed dead to her. How old she looked. She inclined her brow, and when she beheld herself in her tights, in her slight gauze blouse, she gazed at herself with lowered eyelashes and sudden blushes. Who had stripped her naked? What was she doing there? bare-breasted like a harlot who uncovers herself down to the belly. She no longer knew. She looked at her thighs, which the tight surrounded, at her hips, the supple lines of which she discerned under the gauze, at her bust broadly displayed, and she was ashamed of herself, and contempt for her flesh filled her with inflexible anger against those who had left her thus, with simple circlets of gold round her ankles and wrists to hide her skin. Then trying, with the fixed idea of drowning intelligence, to remember what she was doing there, quite naked in front of that glass, she went back by a sudden leap to her childhood. She again saw herself, as she'd been when seven years old, in the solemn gloom of the Béraud mansion. 
She remembered a day when Aunt Elizabeth had dressed them, herself and Christine, in woolen dresses, with a little red check pattern on a gray ground. It was Christmas time. How pleased they were with those two dresses exactly alike. Their aunt spoiled them, and she carried matters so far as to give each of them a bracelet and a necklace of coral. The leaves... The sleeves were long, the dress bodies rose up to their chins, the jewelry displayed itself on the stuff, and this seemed very pretty to them. Renée also remembered that her father was there, and that he smiled with his sad air. That day, instead of playing, her sister and herself had walked about the nursery like grown-up persons, for fear of soiling themselves. Then, at the convent of a visitation, her schoolfellows had joked her about her clown's dress, which came down to her fingertips and rose up over her ears. She'd begun to cry during lessons, and when playtime came, she turned up her sleeves and tucked in her neckband so that she might not be derided any longer. And the coral necklace and bracelet seemed to her much prettier on the skin of her neck and arm. Was it on that day that she'd begun to strip herself? Her life unrolled itself before her. She recalled her long bewilderment, the hubbub of gold and flesh which had risen within her, which had mounted first to her knees, then to her stomach, then to her lips, and the flood of which she now felt sweeping over her head, striking her skull with swiftly repeated blows. It was like a bad sap. It had wearied her limbs, set excrescences of shameful affection in her heart, and made whims fit for a sick person or an animal sprout in her brain. This sap had impregnated the soles of her feet while they rested on her carriage rug and on other carpets too, on all the silk and all the velvet over which she'd walked since her marriage. The footsteps of others must have left these seeds of poison, now yielding fruit in her blood, and circulating in her veins. She well remembered her childhood. She had merely been inquisitive when she was little. Later on, even, after that rape which had cast evil into her, she had not wished for so much shame. She would certainly have become better had she remained knitting beside Aunt Elizabeth. And while she gazed fixedly into the looking-glass to read therein the peaceful future she'd missed, she could hear the regular tick-tick of her aunt's needles. But she only saw her own pink thighs, her pink hips, the strange woman of pink silk whom she had before her, and whose skin of fine stuff, of close texture, seemed made for the amours of puppets and dolls. She'd come to that, to be a big doll from whose torn bosom but a thread of sound escaped, then, at thought of the enormities of her life, the blood of her father, that middle-class blood which tormented her during hours of crisis, cried out within her and revolted. She who had always trembled at the thought of hell, she ought to have lived in the depths of the black severity of the Barreau mansion. Who was it then that had stripped her naked? And in the bluish shade of the glass, she thought she could see the figures of Saccard and Maxime rise up. Saccard, black and sneering, with the hue of iron and pincer-like laughter, standing on his skinny legs. That man was a will. For ten years she'd seen him at the forge, amid the shivers of the reddened metal, with his flesh burnt, breathless, but still striking, raising hammers twenty times too heavy for his arms, at the risk of crushing himself. She understood him now. He seemed to her to have been made taller by this superhuman effort, this huge rascality, this fixed idea of an immense, immediate fortune. She remembered him springing over obstacles, rolling in the mud and not taking the time to wipe himself, so bent was he upon arriving early at the goal, not even tarrying to enjoy himself on the road, but munching his gold pieces while he ran. Then Maxime's fair, pretty head appeared behind his father's rough shoulders. He had his clear, harlot smile, his empty strumpet's eyes which were never lowered, his parting in the middle of his hair showing the whiteness of his skull. He derided Saccard. 
He considered him vulgar to give himself so much trouble to earn money, which he, Maxime, expended with such adorable laziness. He was kept. His long, soft hands testified to his vices. His hairless body had the wearied attitude of a satisfied woman. Not even a flash of curiosity as to sin shone in all his cowardly, sluggish being, through which vice gently coursed like so much warm water. He did not initiate, he underwent. And René, looking at the two apparitions emerge from the slight shade of the mirror, retreated a step, and saw that Saccard had thrown her like a stake, like an investment, and that Maxime had chanced to be there to pick up this louis fallen from the speculator's pocket. She had been an asset in her husband's pocketbook. He had urged her on to the toilets of a night, to the lovers of a season. He twisted her in the flames of his forge, imploring her, as though she'd been a precious metal, to gild the iron of his hands. Little by little the father had thus rendered her mad enough, depraved enough for the kisses of the son. If Maxime were Saccard's impoverished blood, she felt that she herself was the product, the worm-eaten fruit of these two men, the pit of infamy which they dug together, and into which they both rolled. She knew it now, it was these men who had stripped her naked. Saccard had unhooked her dress body, and Maxime had loosened her skirt. Then between them, they had just torn off her chemise. And present she was without a rag, merely with golden rings, like a slave. They'd looked at her a little while before, but they'd not said to her, You are naked. The son had trembled like a coward, had shuddered at the thought of carrying his crime to the end, had refused to follow her in her passion. The father, instead of killing her, had robbed her. This man punished people by emptying their pockets. A signature fell like a sunray amid the brutality of his anger. And by way of vengeance, he carried the signature off. Then she'd seen their shoulders retreat into the darkness. No blood upon the carpet. Not a cry, not a moan. They were cowards. They had stripped her naked. And she said to herself that on one sole occasion she'd read the future. On the day when, in sight of the murmuring shadows of the Parc Monceau, the thought that her husband would soil her and bring her one day to madness had come and frightened her growing desires. Ah, how her poor head suffered, how she realized now the fallacy of the idea which had made her believe that she lived in a happy sphere of divine enjoyment and impunity. She'd lived in the land of shame, and she was chastened by the abandonment of her whole body, by the death of her agonizing being. She wept that she'd not listened to the loud voices of the trees. Her nudity irritated her. She turned her head. She looked round her. The dressing room retained its musky heaviness, its warm silence, whither still came the phrases of the waltz, like the last expiring circles on a sheet of water. This low laughter of distant voluptuousness passed over her with intolerable raillery. She stopped up her ears so as to hear it no longer. Then she beheld the luxury in the room. She raised her eyes to the pink tent, even to the silver crown, within which one perceived a Cupid preparing his arrows. She dwelt on the furniture, on the marble slab of a toilet table, encumbered with pots and tools which she no longer recognized. She went to the bath, still full of slumbering water. She pushed back with her foot the stuffs trailing over the white satin of the armchairs, the costume of the nymph Echo, the petticoats, the forgotten towels. And from all these things, voices of shame arose. The robe of the nymph Echo spoke to her of the pastime she'd shared because she had thought it original to offer herself to Maxime in public. The furniture, with its bed-like roundnesses, reminded her brutally of her flesh, her amours, all the filth that she wished to forget. She returned into the middle of the room, her face purple, not knowing where to fly from this alcove perfume, this luxury which bared itself with a harlot's immodesty, which displayed all this pink. The room was naked like herself, 
the pink bath, the rosy skin of the hangings, the pink marble of the two tables became animated, stretched themselves, coiled themselves up, and surrounded her with such a display of living voluptuousness that she closed her eyes, lowering her head, overwhelmed amid the lace of the ceiling and the walls which crushed her. But in the blackness she again saw that flesh-tinted spot, the dressing room, and she also beheld the gray softness of the bedroom, the soft aureolent luster of the little drawing room, the crude greenness of the conservatory, all the wealth that had been her accomplice. It was there that her feet had become impregnated with the evil sap. She would not have slept with Maxime on a pallet in the depth of a garret. It would have been too ignoble. The silk around her had made her crime coquettish and she dreamt of tearing down this lace, of spitting upon this silk, of breaking her large bed to pieces with kicks, of dragging her luxury into some gutter whence it would emerge worn out and dirty like herself. When she reopened her eyes, she approached the mirror, looked at herself again, and examined herself closely. She was done for. She saw herself dead. Her whole face told her that the cerebral cracking was being completed. Maxime, that last perversion of her senses, had finished his work, exhausted her flesh, and unhinged her intelligence. She had no more joys to taste, no hope of an awakening. At this thought, a savage rage was rekindled within her, and in a last crisis of desire, she dreamt of retaking possession of her prey of agonizing in Maxime's arms and carrying him off with her. Louise could not marry him. Louise knew very well that he did not belong to her, since she'd seen them kissing each other on the lips. Then she threw a fur mantle over her shoulder so as not to pass naked through the hall, and she went downstairs. In the little drawing room, she came face to face with Madame Sidonie. The latter, in view of enjoying the drama, had again stationed herself on the steps of the conservatory. But she no longer knew what to think when Saccard reappeared with Maxime, and brutally replied to her whispered questions that she was dreaming, that there was nothing whatever. Then she scented the truth. Her yellow face grew pale. She considered this really too strong. And she softly went and placed her ear against the staircase door, hoping that she'd be able to hear Renée crying upstairs. When the young woman opened the door, it almost smacked her sister-in-law in the face. "'You're playing the spy on me,' Renée angrily said. But Madame Sidonie replied with fine disdain, "'Do I occupy myself with your filth?' And catching up her sorceress's dress and retiring with a majestic look, it isn't my fault, little one, if accidents befall you. But I have no spite, do you hear? And understand that you would have found, and would still find, a second mother in me. I shall expect you at my place whenever you please. Renée did not listen to her. She entered the large drawing room and passed through a very complicated figure of the cotillon, without even remarking the surprise which her fur mantle occasioned. In the middle of the room, there were groups of ladies and gentlemen who mingled waving banderoles, and Monsieur de Saffray's fluty voice called out, Come, ladies, the Mexican War! The ladies who figure the bushes must spread their skirts out around them and remain on the ground. Now the gentlemen must turn round the bushes. Then, when I clap my hands... Each of them must waltz with his bush. He clapped his hands. The brass instruments resounded. The waltz once more sent the couples revolving round the room. The figure had not been very successful. Two ladies had remained on the carpet entangled in their dresses. Madame Daste declared that the only thing that amused her in the Mexican War was making a cheese of her dress, as she'd done at school. René, on reaching the hall, found Louise and her father, whom Saccard and Maxime were accompanying. Baron Gouraud had left. Madame Sidonie withdrew with Magnon and Charrier, 
while Monsieur Huppel de Lanou escorted Madame Michelin, whom her husband followed discreetly. The prefect had spent the rest of the evening courting the pretty brunette. He had just persuaded her to spend a month of the fine weather in the chief town of his department, where some really curious antiquities were to be seen. Louise, who was nibbling on the sly the hardbake which he had in her pocket, was seized with a fit of coughing at the moment of leaving the house. "'Cover yourself up well,' said her father. And Maxime hastened to tighten the strings of the hood of her opera cloak. She raised her chin and let herself be swaddled. But when Madame Saccard appeared, Monsieur de Marais retraced his steps and bid her good-bye. For a moment they all remained there together, talking. Rene, wishing to explain her pallor and her shudders, said that she had felt cold and had gone upstairs to throw the fur over her shoulders. And she watched for the moment when she might speak in a low voice to Louise, who was looking at her with inquisitive tranquility. While the gentleman again shook hands, she leant forward and murmured, "'You won't marry him, will you? It isn't possible, you know very well.' But the child interrupted her, rising on tiptoe and speaking in her ear, "'Oh, be easy. I shall take him off. It is of no consequence, since we are going to Italy.' and she smiled with the vague smile of a vicious sphinx. Renée remained stammering. She did not understand. She fancied that the hunchback was deriding her. Then, when the Marais had gone off, repeating several times, Till Sunday! She looked at her husband and at Maxime with her frightened eyes, and on beholding them with quiet flesh and satisfied attitudes, she hid her face in her hands, fled, and sought a refuge in the depths of the conservatory. The pathways were deserted. The large leaves were asleep, and on the heavy sheet of water of the basin two budding nymphae slowly unfolded. Rene would have liked to cry, but the damp warmth, the strong perfume which she recognized, caught her at the throat and strangled her despair. She looked at her feet, at the edge of the basin, at the spot of yellow sand where she'd stretched the bearskin the winter before. And when she raised her eyes, she again saw between the two open doors a figure of the cotillon being danced right away in the background. There was a deafening noise, a confused mass in which she at first only distinguished flying skirts and black legs, footing and turning. Monsieur de Saffray's voice cried out, "'Change your ladies! Change your ladies!' And the couples passed by amid a fine yellow dust. Each gentleman, after three or four turns in the waltz, threw his partner into the arms of his neighbor, who in turn threw him his. Baroness de Meinhold, in her costume as the Emerald, fell from the hands of the Comte de Chibray into the hands of Monsieur Simpson. He caught her as he could by a shoulder, while the tip of his gloves glided under her dress body. Countess Vanska, very red and making her coral drops jingle, went with a bound from the chest of Monsieur de Saffre on to the chest of the Duc de Rosanne, whom she entwined and compelled to pirouette for five turns, when she hung herself on the hips of Monsieur Simpson, who had just thrown the emerald to the leader of the cotillon. And Madame Tessier, Madame d'Aste, Madame de Laurens, shining like large living jewels, with the failed pallor of a topaz, the soft blue of a turquoise, the fiery blue of the sapphire, abandoned themselves for a minute, vaulted under the extended wrist of a waltzer, then started off again, came frontwards or backwards into a fresh embrace, visiting one after the other all the masculine embraces of the drawing-room. However, Madame d'Espanay had, in full view of the orchestra, succeeded in catching hold of Madame Hoffner as she passed by, and now waltzed with her, refusing to let go her hold. Gold and silver danced lovingly together. René then understood this whirling of skirts, this stamping of legs. Standing on a lower surface, she could see the fury of the feet, the patent leather boots and white ankles mingling pell-mell. At intervals it seemed to her as if a gust of wind were about to blow off the dresses. 
the bare shoulders, the bare arms, the bare heads which flew past and revolved, now seized hold of, now thrown off, and again caught at the end of the gallery, where the waltz of the orchestra grew madder, where the red hangings seemed thrown into a transport amid the final fever of the ball, appeared to her like the tumultuous image of her own life, of her nudities and abandonments. And she experienced such a pang at the thought that Maxime, but take the hunchback in his arms, had just cast her there, on the spot where they'd loved each other, that she dreamt of plucking a stalk of the tanginia which grazed her cheek, and of chewing it till the sap was exhausted. But she was cowardly, and she remained in front of the plant, shivering under the fur which her hands drew over her with a tight clutch, and a great gesture of terrified shame. This ends section 13. Section 14 of The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola Translated by Henry Visitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder Section 14 Three months later, on one of those gloomy spring mornings which bring back into Paris the dimness and dirty dampness of winter, Aristide Saccard alighted from his carriage at the Place du Chateau d'Eau and turned with four other gentlemen into the gorge of demolitions opened by the future Boulevard de Prince Rougen. The party formed a committee of inquiry which the expropriation jury had dispatched to the spot to estimate the value of certain property, the owners of which had not come to an amicable arrangement with the city of Paris. Saccard was renewing his Rue de la Pépinière stroke of fortune. So that his wife's name might completely disappear from the affair, he had at first devised a mock sale of the ground in the music hall. L'Arsonneur relinquished the whole to a supposed creditor. The deed of sale enunciated the colossal figure of three millions of francs. The sum was so exorbitant that when the expropriation agent, in the name of the imaginary owner, claimed the amount of the purchase money as an indemnity, the commission of the Hôtel de Ville would not grant more than two millions five hundred thousand francs, despite the underhand endeavors of Monsieur Michelin and the speeches of Monsieur Toutain Laroche and Baron Gouraud. Saccard had expected this repulse. He refused the offer and let the case go before the expropriation jury, of which he happened to be a member, together with Monsieur de Mareuil, by a chance he had no doubt assisted. And it was thus that, with four of his colleagues, he found himself deputed to make an inquiry respecting his own ground. Monsieur de Mareuil accompanied him. Of the three remaining jurors... One was a doctor who smoked a cigar without caring the least in the world for the stones and mortar he climbed over, and the others, two commercial men, one of whom a manufacturer of surgical instruments, had once turned a grindstone in the streets. The path which the gentleman took was in a frightful state. It had rained all night. The soaked ground was becoming a river of mud between the fallen houses, beside this road traced out over loose soil, wherein the transport carts sank up to the naves of their wheels. On either side, fragments of the walls, shattered with pickaxes, remained standing, lofty, eviscerated buildings, displaying their pallid entrails, opened in midair their empty staircase frames, their suspended, gaping rooms, which appeared like the broken drawers of some great ugly piece of furniture. Nothing could look more lamentable than the wallpapers of these rooms, blue or yellow squares, falling in tatters, and indicating, at the height of a fifth or sixth floor, just under the roofs, the place occupied by some poor little garrets, narrow holes, in which perhaps a man's whole life had been confined. The ribbons of the chimney flues rose side by side on the bare walls, lugubriously black and with abrupt bends. A forgotten weathercock grated at the edge of a roof, whilst some half-detached water-spouts hung down like rags. 
and the gap still deepened amid these ruins, like a breach opened by cannon, under the gray sky. Amid the sinister pallidity of the falling plaster dust, the roadway, barely marked out, covered with refuse, with piles of earth and deep pools of water, stretched away, edged with the black marks of chimney flues, as with a mourning border. The gentlemen, with their well-blackened boots, their frock coats, and their tall silk hats, set a singular note in this muddy landscape of a dirty yellow tint, and across which there only passed some pale workmen, some horses splashed to the chine, and some carts, the woodwork of which disappeared beneath a coat of dust. The jurors followed each other in Indian file, jumping from stone to stone, avoiding the pools of flowing filth, at times sinking in up to their heels, and then shaking their feet and swearing. Sarkard had talked about taking the Rue de Charon, by which they would have avoided this promenade over broken ground, but they unfortunately had several bits of property to visit on the long line of the boulevard, and, impelled by curiosity, they had decided to pass right through the works. Besides, the sight greatly interested them. At times they stopped, balancing themselves on some bit of plaster which had fallen into a rut, raising their noses, and calling each other to point out some perforated floor, some chimney pot which had remained in the air, some joist which had fallen on to a neighboring roof. This bit of a destroyed city, seen on leaving the Rue du Temple, seemed altogether funny to them. It's really curious, said Monsieur de Marais. Look there, Chacar, look at that kitchen up there. An old frying pan has remained hanging over the stove. I can distinguish it perfectly. However, the doctor, with his cigar between his teeth, had set himself in front of a demolished house, of which there only remained the rooms of the ground floor, filled with the remnants of the other stories. A single fragment of all rose up above the pile of materials, and to overthrow it at one effort, it had been girt round with a rope at which several workmen were tugging. "'They won't manage it,' muttered the doctor. "'They're pulling it too much to the left.' The four other jurors had retraced their steps to see the wall tumble, and all five of them, with their eyes stretched out and with bated breath, waited for the fall with a quiver of delight. The workmen, giving way and then suddenly stiffening themselves, cried out, Oh, heave ho! They won't manage it, repeated the doctor. Then, after a few seconds of anxiety, It's moving! It's moving! joyfully cried one of the commercial men. And when the wall gave way at last, and fell with a frightful crash, raising a cloud of plaster, the gentlemen looked at each other with smiles. They were delighted. Their frock coats became covered with a fine dust, which whitened their arms and shoulders. Resuming their prudent march amid the puddles, they now began to talk about the workmen. There were not many good ones. They were all idle fellows, prodigals and withal most obstinate, only dreaming of their master's ruin. Monsieur de Marais, who for a moment had been looking with a shudder at two poor devils perched on the corner of a roof, demolishing a wall with their pickaxes, expressed, however, the opinion that, all the same, these men really possessed great courage. The other jurors again paused and raised their eyes to the workmen who balanced themselves, leaning and striking with all their strength. They pushed the stones down with their feet and quietly looked at them shattering below. If the pickaxes had missed striking, the mere impulsion of the men's arms would have precipitated them into space. Bah, it's habit, said the doctor, setting his cigar in his mouth again. They are brutes. The jurors had now reached one of the houses which they had to visit. They finished their work in a quarter of an hour and then resumed their walk. By degrees they no longer felt so much disgust for the mud. They walked in the middle of the pools, abandoning the hope of keeping their boots clean. When they passed the Rue Menilmontant, 
One of the commercial men, the ex-knife grinder, became nervous. He examined the ruins about him and no longer recognized the neighborhood. He said that he'd lived in that part on his arrival in Paris more than 30 years previously and that he should be very pleased to find the house again. He continued searching with his eyes when suddenly the sight of a house which the workman's picks had already cut in twain made him stop short in the middle of the road. He studied the door and the windows. Then, pointing upward with his finger to a corner of the partially demolished building, "'There it is!' he cried. "'I recognize it!' "'What, pray?' asked the doctor. "'My room, of course. That's it!' It was a little room, situated on the fifth floor, and it must have formerly overlooked a courtyard. A breach in the wall showed it, quite bare, already demolished on one side, with a broad, torn band of its wallpaper, of a large yellow flowery pattern, trembling in the wind. On the left hand, one could still see the recess of a cupboard, lined with blue paper, and beside it was an aperture for a stovepipe with a bit of piping in it. The ex-workman was seized with emotion. I spent five years in there, muttered he. My means were small in those times, but no matter, I was young. You see the cupboard? It was there that I put by three hundred francs, copper by copper, and the hole for the stovepipe, I can still remember the day when I made it. The room had no fireplace, and it was bitter cold, all the more so as we were not often two together. Come, come, interrupted the doctor, joking. We don't ask you for your secrets. You played your games like everyone else. That's true, naively resumed the worthy man. I still remember an ironing girl who lived over the way. You see, the bed was over there on the right-hand side near the window. Ah, my poor room, how they've knocked it about. He was really very sad. Come, said Saccard, no harm's done by throwing those old cabins down. Handsome houses in freestone will be built in place of them. Would you still live in such a den while you might very well lodge yourself on the new boulevard? That's true, again replied the manufacturer, who seemed quite consoled. The commission of inquiry halted again at the two other houses. The doctor remained at the door, smoking and looking at the sky. When they reached the Rue des Amandiers, the houses became fewer. They now passed through large enclosures and over uncultivated land, where some half-fallen buildings straggled. Saccard seemed delighted with this promenade through ruins. He had just remembered the dinner he had once shared with his first wife on the heights of Montmartre, and he well recollected having indicated with his hand the cut across Paris from the Place du Château d'Eau to the Barrière du Trône. The realization of this far-distant prediction delighted him. He followed the cut with the secret joys of authorship, as if he himself had with his iron fingers struck the first blows with a pickaxe. And he jumped over the puddles, reflecting that three millions awaited him under building materials at the end of this river of greasy filth. Meanwhile, the gentlemen fancied themselves in the country. The road passed through some gardens, the walls of which had been felled. There were large clumps of budding lilac, with foliage of a very delicate light green. Each of these gardens, looking like a retreat hung with the leaves of the shrubs, displayed a narrow basin of a miniature cascade, with bits of wall on which to deceive the eye. Arbors in perspective and bluish landscapes, backgrounds had been painted. The buildings, scattered and discreetly hidden, resembled Italian pavilions in Grecian temples, and moss was wearing away the feet of the plaster columns, whilst weeds had loosened the mortar of the pediments. "'Those are petit maisons,' said the doctor, with a wink. But as he saw that the gentleman did not understand what he meant, he explained that under Louis Quinze the nobility had retreats of this kind for their pleasure parties. It was then the fashion." And he added, 
They were called Petit Maison, little houses. This neighborhood was full of them. Some stiff things took place in them, and no mistake. The commission of inquiry had become very attentive. The two commercial men's eyes were shining, and they smiled and looked with great interest at these gardens and pavilions on which they had not bestowed a glance prior to their colleagues' explanations. A grotto detained them for a long time. But when the doctor, seeing a house already attacked by the pick, said that he recognized it as the Count de Savigny's petit maison, well known on account of that nobleman's orgies, the whole commission left the boulevard to go and visit the ruins. They climbed on to the fallen materials, entered the ground floor rooms by the windows, and as the workmen were away at their midday meal, they were able to linger there quite at their ease. They indeed remained there for a good half hour, examining the rosettes of the ceilings, the paintings above the doors, the strained moldings of the plaster grown yellow with age. The doctor reconstructed the building. Do you see, said he, this room must be the banqueting hall. There was certainly an immense divan at that recess of the wall. And indeed, I'm sure that a looking-glass surmounted the divan. See, there are the holdfasts of the glass. Oh, those fellows were scamps who knew deucedly well how to enjoy themselves. The jurors would never have left these old stones which tickled their curiosity if Aristide Saccard, growing impatient, had not said to them, laughing, You may look as much as you like, for ladies are no longer here. Let's get to our business. Before leaving, however, the doctor climbed on to a mantel shelf to delicately detach with one blow of a pick a little painted head of Cupid, which he slipped into the pocket of his frock coat. They at length reached the end of their journey. The land which had formerly belonged to Madame Auberto was very vast. The music hall and the garden occupied barely more than half of the surface. A few unimportant houses were scattered about the rest of it. The new boulevard cut obliquely across this large parallelogram, and this circumstance had quieted one of Saccard's fears. He had long imagined that only a corner of the music hall would be removed by the new thoroughfare. L'Arsonneau, therefore, had received orders to open his mouth, as the bordering plots ought to at least quintuple in value. He was already threatening the city of Paris to avail himself of a recent decree authorizing landowners to deliver up only the ground necessary for works of public utility. It was the expropriation agent who received the jurors. He took them over the garden, made them visit the music hall, and showed them a huge pile of papers. But the two commercial men had gone down again accompanied by the doctor, whom they were still questioning about Countess Savigny's Petit Maison, of which their minds were full. They listened to him with gaping mouths, standing all three beside a jeu de tonneau. And he talked to them about La Pompadour and related the amours of Louis XV, while Monsieur de Marais and Saccard continued the inquiry alone. It's all finished, said the latter on returning into the garden. If you will allow me, gentlemen, I will myself draw up the report. The surgical instrument maker did not even hear. He was deep in the regency. What funny times, all the same, he muttered. Then they found the cab in the Rue de Charon, and they went off, muddy to the knees, but as satisfied with their promenade as with a pleasure trip in the country. In the cab, the conversation changed. They talked politics. They said that the emperor did great things. The like of what they had just seen had never been witnessed before. This long, perfectly straight street would be superb when the houses were erected. It was Saccard who drew up the report, and the jury granted the three millions. The speculator was at the end of his tether. He could not have waited a month longer. This money saved him from ruin, and even a little from the assize court. 
he gave 500,000 francs on the million which he owed to his upholsterer and his contractor for the mansion in the Parc Monceau. He stopped up other holes, rushed into new companies, and deafened Paris with the noise of the real crowns which he flung by the shovelful onto the shelves of his iron safe. The Golden River had a source at last. But this was not yet a solid, entrenched fortune flowing with a regular, continuous gush. Saccard, saved from a crisis, thought himself pitiful with the crumbs of his three millions, and naively said that he was still too poor and could not stop there. And soon the ground again cracked beneath his feet. L'Arsenault had behaved so admirably in the Charon affair that Saccard, after a slight hesitation, carried honesty to the point of giving him his ten per cent and his bonus of thirty thousand francs. The expropriation agent thereupon opened a banking house. When his accomplice accused him in a snappish tone of being richer than himself, the coxcomb with yellow gloves replied, laughing, You see, dear master, you are very clever in making money rain down, but you don't know how to pick it up. Madame Sidonie profited by her brother's stroke of fortune to borrow ten thousand francs from him, with which she went to spend a couple of months in England. She returned without a copper, and it was never known what had become of the ten thousand francs. Well, it costs, she replied when she was questioned. I ransacked all the libraries. I had three secretaries to assist me in my researches. And when she was asked if she at length had any positive information about her three milliards, she at first smiled with a mysterious air and then ended by muttering, You are all incredulous. I have found nothing, but no matter. You will see. You will see some day. She had not, however, lost all the time she spent in England. Her brother, the minister, profited by her journey to entrust her with a delicate commission. When she returned, she obtained large orders from the ministry. It was a fresh incarnation. She made contracts with the government and charged herself with supplying it every imaginable thing. She sold it provisions and arms for the troops, furniture for the prefectures and public departments, firewood for the offices and the museums. The money she made did not induce her to set aside her eternal black dresses, and she retained her yellow, doleful face. Saccard then reflected that it was really she whom he had seen once long ago furtively leaving their brother Eugène's house. She must at all times have kept up a secret connection with him, for matters with which no one was acquainted. René was agonizing amid these interests, these ardent thirsts which could not satisfy themselves. Aunt Elizabeth was dead. Christine had married and left the Berreau mansion, where her father alone remained, erect in the gloomy shade of the large rooms. Renée exhausted what she inherited from her aunt in one season. She gambled now. She'd found a drawing room where ladies sat at table till three o'clock in the morning, losing hundreds of thousands of francs in a night. She tried to drink, but she could not. She experienced invincible qualms of disgust. Since she'd found herself alone again, abandoned to the worldly flood which carried her off, she surrendered herself all the more, not knowing how to kill time. She ended by tasting of everything, and nothing touched her amid the immense boredom which was crushing her. She grew older. Blue circles appeared round her eyes. Her nose became thinner. Her pouting lips parted in sudden and causeless laughter. It was the end of a woman. When Maxime had married Louise, and the young folks had started for Italy, she no longer troubled herself about her lover. She even seemed to forget him completely. And when Maxime returned home six months later, having 
buried the hunchback in the cemetery of a little town in Lombardy. It was hatred that she displayed towards him. She remembered Phaedre. She no doubt recollected that poisoned love to which he'd heard Ristori lend her sobs. Then, so as never more to meet the young fellow in her home, to dig an abyss of shame between the father and the son forever. She compelled her husband to take cognizance of the incest. She told him that on the day when he had surprised her with Maxime, the latter, who had long pursued her, was seeking to assault her. Saccard was horribly worried by the insistence she evinced in wishing to open his eyes. He was obliged to quarrel with his son and cease to see him. The young widower, rich with his wife's dowry, went to live a bachelor's life in a little house of the Avenue de l'Imperatrice. He had renounced the Council of State and kept a racing stable. René derived one of her last satisfactions from this rupture. She revenged herself. She flung the infamy which these two men had set on her back in their own faces and she said to herself that now she would never more see them making game of her, arm in arm, like a couple of comrades. Amid the crumbling of Renée's affections, there came a moment when she had no one left to love her but her maid. She had by degrees been taken with a maternal affection for Celeste. Perhaps this girl, who was all that remained near her of Maxime's love, reminded her of the hours of enjoyment forever dead. Perhaps René was simply touched by the fidelity of this servant, of this brave heart, the quiet solicitude of which nothing seemed to shake. From the depth of her remorse, she thanked Celeste for having witnessed her shame without leaving her in disgust, and she pictured all kinds of abnegation, a whole life of renunciation to arrive at understanding the calmness of the chambermaid in the presence of incest. Her icy hands, her respectful, quiet attentions. And the girl's devotion made René all the happier as she knew her to be honest and economical, without a lover, without a vice. At times, in her sad moments, she would say to her, Ah, my girl, it is you who will close my eyes. Celeste never answered, but she gave a singular smile. One morning she quietly informed her mistress that she was going to leave, that she meant to return to the country. Renée remained trembling all over on hearing this, as if some great misfortune had befallen her. She cried out and plied Celeste with questions. Why would she leave her when they got on so well together? And she offered to double her wages. But the maid, in answer to all her kind words, made a gesture meaning no, in a quiet, obstinate manner. You see, madame, she ended by replying, you might offer me all the gold of Peru, but I could not remain a week longer. Ah, oh, you don't know me. I've been with you for eight years, haven't I? Well, on the very first day I said to myself, as soon as I have collected five thousand francs together, I will return to my village. I will buy Lagash's house, and I shall live very happily. It's a promise I made to myself, you understand. And the five thousand francs were completed yesterday when you paid me my wages. Renée felt a chill at her heart. She saw Celeste passing behind her and Maxime while they were kissing each other, and she saw her with her indifference, in a perfect state of abstraction, dreaming of her five thousand francs. However, she still tried to retain her, frightened by the void in which she would have to live, longing despite everything to keep near her this obstinate animal whom she had thought devoted and who was merely egotistical. The girl smiled, still shaking her head and muttering, No, no, it isn't possible. Even if it were my mother, I should refuse. I shall buy two cows. I shall perhaps start a little haberdasher's business. It's very pretty down our way. Oh, for the matter of that, I'm willing you should come and see me. It is near Cayenne. I will leave you the address. Renée then no longer insisted. 
she shed hot tears when she was alone. On the morrow, with a sick person's whimsicality, she decided to accompany Celeste to the Western Railway Station in her own brougham. She gave her one of her traveling rugs and made her a present in money, and showed her the attentions of a mother whose daughter is about to start upon some long, difficult journey. In the brougham she looked at her with moist eyes. Celeste chatted and said how pleased she was to go away. Then, emboldened, she spoke out and gave some advice to her mistress. I shouldn't have understood life like you, madame. I've often said to myself when I found you with Monsieur Maxime, is it possible one can be so foolish for men? It always ends badly. Ah, for my part, I always mistrusted them. She laughed and threw herself back in the corner of the brougham. My money would have danced, she continued, and nowadays I should be destroying my eyes with crying. So whenever I saw a man, I took up a broomstick. I never dared to tell you all that. Besides, it didn't concern me. You were free to do as you liked, and I only had to earn my money honestly. At the railway station, Renée insisted upon paying her fare and took her a first-class ticket. As they arrived before the time, she detained her, pressing her hands and repeating, And take good care of yourself. Don't neglect your health, my good Celeste. The latter allowed herself to be caressed. She stood looking happy with a fresh, smiling face before her mistress's tearful eyes. Renée again spoke of the past, and the maid abruptly exclaimed, I was forgetting. I didn't tell you the story of Baptiste, master's valet. Probably no one is like to tell you. The young woman owned that she indeed knew nothing. Well, you remember his grand, dignified airs, his disdainful glances. You yourself spoke to me about them. It was all so much acting. He didn't care for women. He never came down to the servants' hall when we were there. I can repeat it now. He even pretended that it was disgusting in the drawing-room, on account of all the low-neck dresses. I well believe that he didn't care for women. And she leant towards Renée's ear and made her blush, though she herself retained all her honest placidity. When the new stable boy, she continued, told everything to Master, Master preferred to dismiss Baptiste rather than send him to jail. It seems that these disgusting things had been going on for years in the stables. And to think that the big scamp pretended he was fond of horses. It was the grooms that he liked. The bell interrupted her. She hastily took up the eight or ten packages which she had not wished to part with. She let herself be kissed, and then she went off without looking round. Renée remained in the station until the engine whistled. And when the train had gone off, she was overcome with despair. She no longer knew what to do. Her days seemed to stretch before her as empty as the vast waiting hall where she'd been left alone. She again entered her brougham and told the coachman to drive her home. But on the way, she changed her mind. She was afraid of her room, of the boredom awaiting her there. She no longer felt the necessary courage to return home and change her dress for her usual drive round the lake. She felt a longing for sunlight, a longing to mingle with the crowd. She ordered the coachman to drive to the Bois. It was four o'clock. The Bois was awakening from the drowsiness of a warm afternoon. Clouds of dust flew along the Avenue de l'Imperatrice, and one could see, spread out afar, the expanse of verdure which the slopes of Saint-Cloud and Surenne, crowned by the grey walls of Mont Valérien, limited. High above the horizon the sun shed its rays, filling the recesses of the foliage with golden dust, lighting up the tall branches, and changing the ocean of leaves into an ocean of light. Past the fortifications, in the avenue of the Bois leading to the lake, the ground had just been watered, 
and the vehicles rolled over the brown soil as over a carpet, amid a rising freshness and an odor of damp earth. Mingled with the low bushes on either side, the little trees of the copses reared their crowd of young trunks, growing indistinct in the greenish dimness which flashes of light pierced here and there with yellow glades. And by degrees, as one approached the lake, the chairs on the sidewalks became more numerous. Families sat, gazing with quiet, silent faces at the interminable procession of wheels. Then, on reaching the open space in front of a lake, there was a dazzlement. The oblique sun transformed the round expanse of water into a huge mirror of polished silver, reflecting the brilliant disk of the planet. All eyes blinked. One could only distinguish the dark form of the pleasure boat on the left-hand side near the bank. The parasols in the vehicles were inclined with a gentle and uniform movement towards the splendor, and only rose erect again on reaching the roadway skirting the sheet of water, which, from the summit of the bank, now assumed a metallic blackness, streaked with golden burnishings. On the right-hand side, the clumps of fir trees lined the road with their colonnades of straight, slender stems, the soft violet tinge of which was reddened by the flames of the sky. On the left of the lawns, bathed in light and similar to fields of emeralds, stretched away as far as the distant lace-like ironwork of the gate of La Mouette. And on approaching the cascade, while the dimness of the copses again presented itself on one side, the islands at the end of the lake rose up into the blue air, with the sunshine playing over their banks and bold shadows darting from their pines, at the feet of which the chalet looked like some child's plaything, lost in a corner of a virgin forest. The whole wood laughed and quivered in the sunshine. The weather was so magnificent that Renée felt ashamed of her closed brougham and her costume of flea-tinted silk. She drew back a little, and with the windows open, looked at this flow of light stretching over the water and the verdure. At the bends of the avenue she perceived the line of wheels revolving like golden stars amid a long train of blinding gleams. The varnished panels, the flashing steel and brass mountings, the bright colors of the dresses passed on at the even trot of the horses and set against the background of the wood a long moving bar, a ray fallen from the sky, stretching out and following the bends of the roadway. And in this ray, as the young woman blinked her eyes, she saw every now and then the light chignon of a woman the black back of a footman, the white mane of a horse, stand out. The arched parasols of watered silk shone like moons of metal. Then, in presence of this broad daylight, this expanse of sunshine, Renée thought of the fine dust of twilight which she'd seen one evening falling on the tawny foliage. Maxime had been with her. It was at the period when her desires for that child were dawning in her. And she again saw the lawns dampened by the evening air, the darkened underwood, the deserted pathways. The line of vehicles had gone by with a sad sound past the unoccupied chairs, whilst now the rumble of the wheels, the trot of the horses, resounded with the joyfulness of a flourish of trumpets. Then the recollection of all her drives in the Bois returned to her. She had lived there. Maxime had grown up there, at her side, on the cushion of her carriage. It had been their garden. Rain had surprised them there. Sunshine had brought them back. The fall of night had not always driven them away. They had been there in every kind of weather. They had there tasted the worries and the joy of their life. Amid the emptiness of her being, the melancholy imparted by Celeste's departure, these memories gave Renée bitter joy. Her heart said, never again, never again. And she was like frozen when she evoked the image of the winter landscape, the congealed, dull-tinted lake on which they'd skated. The sky then was of a sooty color. The snow had set white lace on the trees. 
The wind had thrown fine sand in their eyes and on their lips. However, on the left-hand side, on the side reserved to equestrians, she had already recognized the Duc de Rosan, Monsieur de Mussy, and Monsieur de Saffre. Larsonneau had killed the Duke's mother by presenting her the hundred and fifty thousand francs worth of bills accepted by her son, and the Duke was devouring his second half million with Blanche Muller, after leaving the first five hundred thousand francs in the hands of Lord d'Origny. Monsieur de Mussy, who'd left the embassy in England for the embassy in Italy, had become gallant again, and he led cotillons with newly acquired gracefulness. As for Monsieur de Saffre, he remained the most amiable skeptic and fast liver in the world. René saw him urging his horse towards the carriage of the Countess Vanska, with whom he was said to be madly in love since the evening when he'd seen her as Carl at the Sechards. All the ladies were there, moreover. The Duchess de Sternich, in her sempiternal eight-spring carriage, Madame de Lawrence in a landau, with the Baroness de Meinholt and little Madame d'Aste seated in front of her, Madame de Tessier and Madame de Guende in a Victoria. Amid these ladies, Sylvia and Lord d'Origny displayed themselves on the cushions of a magnificent calash, Madame Michelin even passed by in the depths of a brougham. The pretty brunette had been to visit the chief town of Monsieur Huppel de Nanou's department, and on her return she'd made her appearance in the bois in this brougham, to which she hoped to soon add an open carriage. René also perceived the Marchioness d'Espagne and Madame Hoffner, the inseparables hidden under their parasols, stretched out side by side laughing tenderly and gazing into each other's eyes. Then the gentleman passed by, Monsieur de Chibray driving a mail coach, Monsieur Simpson in a dog cart, Monsieur Mignon and Charrier more eager than ever for work, despite their dream of approaching retirement, in a brougham which they left at the corner of an avenue to go a bit of the way on foot. Monsieur de Marais, still in mourning for his daughter, seeking bows for his first interruption, launched forth the day before at the corps législatif, and airing his political importance in the carriage of Monsieur Toutain Laroche, who had once more saved the Cradi Viticole, after placing it within two fingers' length of ruin, and whom the Senate made thinner and more influential than ever. And to close the procession, like a final majesty, Baron Gouraud showed his inert heaviness in the sunlight, on the pillows with which his carriage was provided. René felt surprised and disgusted on recognizing Baptiste seated, with a white face and solemn air, beside the coachman. The tall flunky had entered the Baron's service. The copses continued to stretch away. The water of the lake grew iridescent under the sun rays, now become more oblique. The line of carriages spread out its dancing gleams. And the young woman, herself seized and carried away by this enjoyment, vaguely divined all the appetites rolling along in the midst of the sunlight. She did not feel indignant with these sharers of the spoil, but she hated them for their joy, for this triumphal march, which showed them to her full in the golden dust from the sky, they were superb and smiling. The women displayed themselves white and plump. The men had the rapid glances, the delighted deportment of favored lovers. And she, in the depth of her empty heart, found nothing more than lassitude and covert envy. Was she better than the others, then, that she thus bent under the weight of pleasure? Or was it the others who were praiseworthy for having stronger loins than her own. She did not know. She was just longing for new desires with which to begin life anew, when, on turning her head, she perceived beside her, on the footway bordering the underwood, a sight which rendered her heart like a supreme blow. Saccard and Maxime were walking along slowly, arm in arm, 
The father must have paid a visit to the son, and they had both come down from the Avenue de la Imperatrice to the lake, chatting. Listen to me, repeated Sakar. You are a simpleton. When a man has money like you have, he doesn't let it slumber at the bottom of a drawer. There's a hundred percent to be gained in the affair I mention. It's a safe investment. You know very well I wouldn't let you in. However, the young fellow seemed bored by his father's insistence. He smiled with his pretty air and looked at the carriages. Do you see that little woman over there? The one in mauve, he suddenly said. She's a washerwoman whom that beast de Musy has brought out. They looked at the woman in mauve, after which Sakar drew a cigar from his pocket, and addressing himself to Maxime, who was smoking, Give me a light, he said. Then they stopped for a moment in front of each other, drawing their faces near together. When the cigar was lighted, You see, continued the father, again taking his son's arm, and pressing it tightly under his own, You would be a fool if you didn't listen to me. Is it agreed, eh? Will you bring me the hundred thousand francs tomorrow? You know very well that I no longer go to your house, replied Maxime, compressing his lips. Pooh, a lot of bosh. It's time there was an end to all that. And while they took a few steps in silence, just at the moment when René, feeling as though she would swoon, hid her head in the padding of the brougham so as not to be seen, a glowing buzz swept along the line of vehicles. The pedestrians on the footways halted and turned round with gaping mouths, watching something that approached. There was a louder rumble of wheels. The equipages respectfully drew aside, and two postillons appeared, clad in green, with round caps, on which golden tassels jolted with their cords spread out. Leaning slightly forward, they hastened on at the trot of their tall bay horses. Behind them they left an empty space. And then, in this empty space, the emperor appeared. He occupied alone the back seat of a landau. Dressed in black, with his frock coat buttoned up to his chin, he wore, slightly on one side, a very tall hat, the silk of which glistened, in front of him, on the other seat, two gentlemen, dressed with that correct elegance which was favorably looked upon at the Tuileries, remained grave, with their hands on their knees, and the silent air of two wedding guests promenaded amid the curiosity of a crowd. René found the emperor aged. His mouth was parted more languidly under his thick waxed mustaches. His eyelids had grown heavy to the point that they half covered his dim eyes, the yellow grayness of which had become yet more cloudy. And his nose alone still looked like a dry bone set in his vague face. Meantime, while the ladies in the carriages smiled discreetly, the people on foot pointed the sovereign out to one another. A fat man declared that the emperor was the gentleman who turned his back to the coachman on the left side. Some hands were raised to salute. But Saccard, who had taken off his hat, even before the postillon had passed, waited till the imperial carriage was exactly in front of him, and then he cried out in his thick Provençal voice, Long live the emperor! The emperor, surprised, turned, recognized the enthusiast, no doubt, and returned the bow, smiling and everything then disappeared in the sunlight. The equipages closed up, and René could only perceive above the manes of the horses and between the backs of the footmen, the postillons' caps jolting with their golden tassels. She remained for a moment with her eyes wide open, full of this apparition, which reminded her of another hour of her life. It seemed to her as if the emperor by mingling with the line of carriages, had set the last necessary ray therein and given a meaning to this triumphal march. Now it was a glory. All these wheels, all these decorated men, all these women languidly stretched out, disappeared amid the flash and the rumble of the imperial landau. 
The sensation became so acute and so painful that the young woman experienced an imperious need of escaping from this triumph, from Sakad's cry, which was still ringing in her ears, from the sight of the father and the son slowly walking along and chatting with their arms linked. She reflected with her hands on her breast, as if burnt by an internal fire. And it was with a sudden hope of relief and salutary coolness that she leant forward and said to the coachman, To the Berhol mansion. The courtyard retained its cloister-like coldness. Renée went round the arcades, made happy by the dampness which fell upon her shoulders. She approached the fountain, green with moss, and polished by wear at the edges. She looked at the lion's head, now half effaced, which, with parted joys, emitted a gush of water by an iron pipe. How many times had she and Christine taken this head between their girlish arms to lean forward to reach the stream of water, the icy flow of which they liked to feel upon their little hands? Then she mounted the great silent staircase. She perceived her father at the end of the suite of spacious rooms. He drew up his tall figure and silently went deeper into the shade of the old residence, of the haughty solitude in which he had absolutely cloistered himself since his sister's death. And René thought of the men of the Bois, of that other old man, Baron Gouraud, who had his flesh rolled about on pillows in the sunlight. She went up higher. She followed the passages, the servants' stairs. She was bound for the nursery. When she reached the top landing, she found the key hanging on the usual nail, a large rusty key it was, on which spiders had woven webs. The lock gave a plaintive cry. How sad the nursery was. She felt a pang at her heart of finding it so empty, so gray, so silent. She closed the open door of the abandoned aviary with the vague idea that it must have been by that door that the joys of her childhood had flown away. In front of the flower boxes, still full of soil hardened and cracked all over like dry mud, she stopped and broke off a rhododendron stem. This skeleton of a plant, shriveled and white with dust, was all that remained of their living clumps of verdure. And the matting, the matting itself, faded, gnawed by rats, displayed itself with the melancholy aspect of a shroud which has for years awaited a promised corpse. In one corner amid this mute despair, this silent weeping abandonment, Renée found one of her old dolls, all the bran had flowed out of it by a hole, but its porcelain head continued smiling with its enameled lips, above the tabid body which a doll's follies seemed to have exhausted. Renée felt stifled in the tainted atmosphere of the abode of her childhood. She opened the window and gazed on the immense view. Nothing there was soiled. She again found the eternal delights the eternal juvenescence of the open air. The sun must have been sinking behind her, but she only saw the rays of a setting planet as they lent with infinite softness the yellowish tinge to this corner of a city which she knew so well. It was like the last day of daylight, a gay refrain which slowly subsided on all things. There were gleams of tawny fire about the boom below, while the lacework of the iron cables of the Pont de Constantine stood out above the whiteness of the pillars. Then, on the right hand, the umbrage of the Al au Vin and the Jardin des Plantes seemed like a great mare with stagnant, mossy water, the greenish surface of which blended in the distance with the mist of the sky. On the left, the Quai André de Quatre and the Quai de la Rappe were lined with the same rows of houses those houses which, as girls, twenty years before, they'd seen there with the same brown patches of sheds, the same ruddy factory chimneys. And above the trees, the salt roof of the Salpetriere Hospital, made blue by the sun's goodbye, suddenly appeared to her like an old friend. 
but what calmed her and imparted coolness to her bosom were the long gray banks and especially the Seine, the giantess, which she saw coming from the limits of the horizon straight towards her, just as in those happy times when she'd feared to see it well and rise up to the very window. She remembered their affection for the river, their love for its colossal flow, for this quivering of noisy water, spreading out in the sheet at their feet, parting around and behind them in two arms, the ends of which they could not see, though they still felt the great, pure caress. They were then already coquettish, and on the days when the sky was clear, they said that the Seine had put on her beautiful dress of green silk, flecked with white flames, and the eddies where the water curled set frills of satin on the dress, while afar off, beyond the belt of bridges, a play of light spread strips of stuff the color of the sun. And Renée, raising her eyes, looked at the vast expanse of soaring sky of a pale blue, fading little by little in the obliteration of twilight. She thought of the accomplice city, of the blazing nights of the boulevard, of the hot afternoons of the bois, of the pallid, crude day, of the grand new mansions. Then, when she lowered her head, when she again saw at a glance the peaceful horizon of her childhood, this corner of a city inhabited by the middle and working classes, where she dreamt of a life of peace, a final bitterness mounted to her lips. With her hands clasped, she sobbed in the gathering night. The following winter, when René died of acute meningitis, it was her father who paid her debts. Worm's bill amounted to 257,000 francs. This ends section 14. This ends The Rush for the Spoil by Emile Zola. Translated by Henry Vizitelli.